Section 1. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by Himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Editor's Narrative It appears from tradition as well as some parish registers still extant, that the lands of Dahl Castle, or Dahl Chastel, as it is often spelled, were possessed by a family of the name of Colwain, about 150 years ago, and for at least a century previous to that period. That family was supposed to have been a branch of the ancient family of Colquhoun, and that it is certain that from it spring the Coens that spread towards the border. I find that, in the year 1687, George Colwain succeeded his uncle of the same name in the lands of Dahl Castle and Belgrenon. And, this being all I can gather of the family from history, to tradition I must appeal for the remainder of the motley adventures of that house. But, of the matter furnished by the latter of these powerful monitors, I have no reason to complain. It has been handed down to the world in unlimited abundance, and I am certain that, in recording the hideous events which follow, I am only relating to the greater part of the inhabitants of at least four counties of Scotland, matters of which they were before perfectly well informed. This George was a rich man, or supposed to be so, and was married, when considerably advanced in life, to the sole heiress and reputed daughter of a Bailey Ord of Glasgow. This proved a conjunction anything but agreeable to the parties contracting. It is well known that the Reformation principles had long before that time taken a powerful hold of the hearts and affections of the people of Scotland. Although the feeling was by no means general or in equal degrees. And it so happened that this married couple felt completely at variance on the subject. Granting it to have been so, one would have thought that the laird, owing to his retiring situation, would have been the one that inclined to the stern doctrines of the reformers, and that the young and gay dame from the city would have adhered to the free principles cherished by the court party and indulged in rather to extremity, in opposition to their severe and carping contemporaries. The contrary, however, happened to be the case. The laird was what his country neighbors called a droll, careless chap, with a very limited proportion of the fear of God in his heart, and very nearly as little of the fear of man. The laird had not intentionally wronged or offended either of the parties, and perceived not the necessity of deprecating their vengeance. He had hitherto believed that he was living in most cordial terms with the greater part of the inhabitants of the earth, and with the powers above in particular. But woe be unto him if he was not soon convinced of the fallacy of such damning security. For his lady was the most severe and gloomy of all bigots to the principles of the Reformation. Hers were not the tenets of the great reformers, but theirs mightily overstrained and deformed. Theirs was an unguent hard to be swallowed, but hers was that unguent embittered and overheated until nature could no longer bear it. She had imbibed her ideas from the doctrines of one flaming predestinary and divine alone and these were so rigid that they became a stumbling block to many of his brethren, and a mighty handle for the enemies of his party to turn the machine of the state against them. 
The wedding festivities at Doll Castle partook of all the gaiety. Not of that stern age, but of one previous to it. There was feasting, dancing, piping, and singing. The liquors were handed, around in great fullness. The ale in large wooden bickers, and the brandy in capacious horns of oxen. The laird gave full scope to his homely glee. He danced, he snapped his fingers to the music, clapped his hands, and shouted at the turn of the tune. He saluted every girl in the hall whose appearance was anything tolerable, and requested of their sweethearts to take the same freedom with his bride, by way of retaliation. But there she sat at the head of the hall in still and blooming beauty, absolutely refusing to tread a single measure with any gentleman there. The only enjoyment in which she appeared to partake was in now and then stealing a word of a sweet conversation with her favorite pastor about divine things. For he had accompanied her home after marrying her to her husband to see her fairly settled in her new dwelling. He addressed her several times by her new name, Mrs. Colwain, but she turned away her head disgusted and looked with pity and contempt towards the old inadvertent sinner, capering away in the height of his unregenerated mirth. The minister perceived the workings of her pious mind and thenceforward addressed her by the courteous title of Lady Dalcastle, which sounded somewhat better as not coupling her name with one of the wicked. And there is too great reason to believe that. For all the solemn vows she had come under, and these were of no ordinary binding, particularly on the laird's part, she at that time despised, if not abhorred him in her heart. The good parson again blessed her and went away. She took leave of him with tears in her eyes, entreating him often to visit her in that heathen land of the Amorite, the Hittite, and the Girgashite, to which he assented on many solemn and qualifying conditions, and then the comely bride retired to her chamber to pray. It was customary in those days for the bride's man and maiden and a few select friends to visit the new married couple after they had retired to rest and drink a cup to their health, their happiness, and a numerous posterity. But the laird delighted not in this. He wished to have his jewel to himself, and slipping away quietly from his jovial party, he retired to his chamber to his beloved and bolted the door. He found her engaged with the writings of the Evangelists, and terribly demure. The laird went up to caress her, but she turned away her head, and spoke of the follies of aged men, and something of the broad way that leadeth to destruction. The laird did not thoroughly comprehend this allusion, but being considerably flustered by drinking, and disposed to take all in good part, he only remarked, as he took off his shoes and stockings, that, whether the way was broad or narrow, it was time that they were in their bed. Sure, Mr. Colwain, you won't go to bed tonight, at such an important period of your life, without first saying prayers for yourself and me. When she said this, the laird had his head down almost to the ground, loosing his shoe buckle. But when he heard of prayers on such a night, he raised his face suddenly up, which was all over as flushed as red as a rose, and answered, Prayers, mistress? Lord help your crazed head! Is this a night for prayers? He had better have held his peace. There was such a torrent of profound divinity poured out upon him that the laird became ashamed, both of himself and his new maid spouse, and wist not what to say, but the brandy helped him out. 
It strikes me, my dear, that religious devotion would be somewhat out of place tonight, said he, allowing that it is ever so beautiful and ever so beneficial. Were we to ride on the ringing of it at all times, would we not be constantly making a farce of it? It would be like reading the Bible and the jest book, verse about, and would render the life of man a medley of absurdity and confusion. But, against the cant of the bigot or the hypocrite, no reasoning can aught avail. If you would argue until the end of life, the infallible creature must alone be right. So it proved with the laird. One scripture text followed another, not in the least connected, and one sentence of the profound Mr. Ringham's sermons after another, proving the duty of family worship, till the laird lost patience, and tossing himself into bed, said carelessly that he would leave that duty upon her shoulders for one night. The meek mind of Lady Dalcastle was somewhat disarranged by the sudden evolution. She felt that she was left rather in an awkward situation. However, to show her unconscionable spouse that she was resolved to hold fast her integrity, she kneeled down and prayed in terms so potent that she deemed she was sure of making an impression on him. She did so for in a short time the laird began to utter a response so fervent that she was utterly astounded, and fairly driven from the chain of her orisons. He began, in truth, to sound a nasal bugle of no ordinary caliber, the notes being little inferior to those of a military trumpet. The lady tried to proceed, but Every returning note from the bed burst on her ear with a louder twang and a longer peal, till the concord of sweet sounds became so truly pathetic that the meek spirit of the dame was quite overcome. And, after shedding a flood of tears, she arose from her knees and retired to the chimney corner with her Bible in her lap, there to spend the hours in holy meditation till such time as the inebriated trumpeter should awaken to a sense of propriety. The laird did not wake in any reasonable time, for he being overcome with fatigue and wassail, his sleep became sounder, and his morphian measures more intense. These varied a little in their structure, but the general run of the bars sounded something in this way. Hick, hook, hoo. It was most profoundly ludicrous, and could not have missed exciting risibility in anyone save a pious, a disappointed, and humbled bride. The good dame wept bitterly. She could not for her life go and awaken the monster and request him to make room for her. But she retired somewhere, for the laird, on awaking next morning, found that he was still lying alone. His sleep had been of the deepest and most genuine sort, and all the time that it lasted, he had never once thought of either wives, children, or sweethearts, save in the way of dreaming about them. But as his spirit began again by slow degrees to verge toward the boundaries of reason, it became lighter and more buoyant from the effects of deep repose, and his dreams partook of that buoyancy, yea, to a degree hardly expressible. He dreamed of the reel, the jig, the strathspey, and the corrent, and the elasticity of his frame was such that he was bounding over the heads of maidens and making his feet skimmer against the ceiling, enjoying the while the most ecstatic emotions. These grew too fervent for the shackles of the drowsy god to restrain. The nasal bugle ceased its prolonged sounds in one moment, and a sort of hectic laugh took its place. Keep it going! P 
play up, you devils, cried the laird, without changing his position on the pillow. But this exertion to hold the fiddlers at their work fairly awakened the delighted dreamer, and though he could not refrain from continuing his laugh, beat length by tracing out a regular chain of facts, came to be sensible of his real situation. Rabina, where are you? What's become of you, my dear? cried the laird. But there was no voice, nor anyone that answered or regarded. He flung open the curtains, thinking to find her still on her knees, as he had seen her. But she was not there, either sleeping or waking. Rabina! Mrs. Colwain! shouted he, as loud as he could call, and then added in the same breath, God save the king! I have lost my wife. He sprung up and opened the casement. The daylight was beginning to streak the east, for it was spring, and the nights were short, and the mornings very long. The laird half-dressed himself in an instant, and strode through every room in the house, opening the windows as he went, and scrutinizing every bed in every corner. He came into the hall, where the wedding festival had been held, and as he opened the various window boards, loving couples flew off like hares, surprised too late in the morning among the early braird. Hoo-bo! Fee, be frightened! cried the laird. Fee, rin like fools, as if ye were caught in an ill turn! His bride was not among them, so he was obliged to betake himself to further search. She will be praying in some corner, poor woman, said he to himself. It is an unlucky thing, this praying, but for my part, I fear I have behaved very ill, and I must endeavor to make amends. The laird continued his search and at length found his beloved in the same bed with her Glasgow cousin, who had acted as bridesmaid. You sly and malevolent imp, said the laird. You have played me such a trick when I was fast asleep. I have not known a frolic so clever, and at the same time so severe. Come along, you baggage you. Sir, I will let you know that I detest your principles and your person alike, she said. It shall never be said, sir, that my person was at the control of a heathenish man of Belial, a dangler among the daughters of women, a promiscuous dancer, and a player of unlawful games. Forgo your rudeness, sir, I say, and depart away from my presence and that of my kinswoman. Come along, I say, my charming Rab. If you were the pink of all Puritans, and the saint of all saints, you are my wife, and must do as I command you. Sir, I will sooner lay down my life than be subjected to your godless will. Therefore I say, desist and be gone with you. But the laird regarded none of these testy sayings. He rolled her in a blanket and bore her triumphantly away to his chamber, taking care to keep a fold or two of the blanket always rather near to her mouth in case of any outrageous forthcoming of noise. End of Section 1 Section 2 the Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The next day at breakfast, the bride was long in making her appearance. Her maid asked to see her, but George did not choose that anybody should see her but himself. He paid her several visits and always turned the key as he came out. At length, breakfast was served, and during the time of refreshment, 
The laird tried to break several jokes, but it was remarked that they wanted their accustomed brilliancy, and that his nose was particularly red at the top. Matters, without all doubt, had been very bad between the new married couple, for in the course of the day the lady deserted her quarters and returned to her father's house in Glasgow, after having been a night on the road, stage coaches and steamboats having then no existence in that quarter. Though Bailey Ord had acquiesced in his wife's asservation regarding the likeness of their only daughter to her father, he never loved or admired her greatly. Therefore, this behavior nothing astounded him. He questioned her strictly as to the grievous offense committed against her, and could discover nothing that warranted a procedure so fraught with disagreeable consequences. So, after mature deliberation, the Bailey addressed her as follows. Aye, aye, Rabbi, and say I find the doll castle has actually refused to say prayers with you when you ordered him? and has gitted you in a rude, indelicate manner, outstepping the respect due to my daughter. As my daughter! But we regard to what is due to his own wife. Of that he's a better judge nor me. However, since he has behaved in that manner to my daughter, I shall be revenged on him for ain'ts. For I shall return the obligation to ain nearer to him. That is, I shall take pennyworths of his wife, and let him lick at that. W what do you mean, sir? said the astonished damsel. I mean to be revenged on that villain doll castle, said he, for what he has done to my daughter. Come hither, Mrs. Calwain, you shall pay for this. So saying, the bailey began to inflict corporal punishment on the runaway wife. His strokes were not indeed very deadly, but he made a mighty flourish in the infliction, pretending to be in a great rage only at the laird of Dull Castle. Villain that he is! exclaimed he. I shall teach him to behave in such a manner to a child of mine, be she as she may. Since I cannot get at him himself, I shall lound to her that is nearest to him in life. Take you that! And that, Mrs. Colwain, for your husband's impertinence. The poor afflicted woman wept and prayed, but the bailey would not abate aught of his severity. After fuming and beating her with many stripes, far drawn and lightly laid down, he took her up to her chamber five stories high, locked her in, and there he fed her on bread and water all to be revenged on the presumptuous laird of Dull Castle. But ever and anon, as the bailey came down the stair from carrying his daughter's meal, he said to himself, I shall make the sight of the laird the blithest she ever saw in her life. Lady Dull Castle got plenty of time to read and pray and meditate, but she was at a great loss for one to dispute with about religious tenets, for she found that, without this advantage, about which there was a perfect rage at that time, the reading and learning of scripture texts and sentences of intricate doctrine availed her not. So she was often driven to sit at her casement and look out for the approach of the heathenish laird of Dull Castle. That hero after a considerable lapse of time, at length made his appearance. Matters were not hard to adjust, for his lady found that there was no refuge for her in her father's house, and so, after some sighs and tears, she accompanied her husband home. For all that had passed, things went on no better. She would convert the laird in spite of his teeth. The laird would not be converted. She would have the laird to say family prayers, both morning and evening. The laird would neither pray morning nor evening. He would not even sing psalms and kneel beside her while she performed the exercise, 
neither would he converse at all times and in all places about the sacred mysteries of religion. Although his lady took occasion to contradict flatly every assertion that he made, in order that she might spiritualize him by drawing him into argument. The laird kept his temper a long while, but at length his patience wore out. He cut her short in all her futile attempts at spiritualization, and mocked at her wire-drawn degrees of faith, hope, and repentance. He also dared to doubt of the great standard doctrine of absolute predestination, which put the crown on the lady's Christian resentment. She declared her helpmate to be a limb of Antichrist, and one with whom no regenerated person could associate. She therefore bespoke a separate establishment, and before the expiry of the first six months, the arrangements of the separation were amicably adjusted. The upper, or third story of the old mansion house, was awarded to the lady for her residence. She had a separate door, a separate stair, a separate garden, and walks that in no instance intersected the lairds, so that one would have thought the separation complete. They had each their own parties selected from their own sort of people, and though the laird never once chafed himself about the lady's companions, it was not long before she began to intermeddle about some of his. Who is that fat, bouncing dame that visits the laird so often, and always by herself, said she to her maid Martha one day. Oh dear, mem, how can I ken? We're banished fray our acquaintances here, as weel as fray the sweet gospel ordinances. Find me out who that jolly dame is, Martha. You, who hold communion with the household of this ungodly man, can be at no loss to attain this information. I observe that she always casts her eye up toward our windows, both in coming and going and I suspect that she seldom departs from the house empty-handed. That same evening, Martha came with the information that this August visitor was a Miss Logan, an old and intimate acquaintance of the Laird's, and a very worthy, respectable lady of good connections, whose parents had lost their patrimony in the Civil Wars. Ha! Very well, said the lady, very well, Martha, but nevertheless, go thou and watch this respectable lady's motions and behavior the next time she comes to visit the laird, and the next after that you will not, I see, lack opportunities. Martha's information turned out of that nature that prayers were said in the uppermost story of Doll Castle House against the Canaanitish woman. Every night and every morning, and great discontent prevailed there, even to the anathemas and tears. Letter after letter was dispatched to Glasgow, and at length, to the lady's great consolation, the Reverend Mr. Ringham arrived safely and devoutly in her elevated sanctuary. Marvelous was the conversation between these gifted people. Ringham had held in his doctrines that there were eight different kinds of faith, all perfectly distinct in their operations and effects. But the lady, in her secluded state, had discovered another five, making twelve in all. The adjusting of the existence or fallacy of these five faiths served for a most enlightened discussion of nearly seventeen hours, in the course of which the two got warm in their arguments, always in proportion as they receded from nature, utility, and common sense. Ringham at length got into unwanted fervor about some disputed point between one of these faiths and trust. When the lady, 
fearing that zeal was getting beyond its wanton barrier, broke in on his vehement asservations with the following abrupt discomfiture. But, sir, as long as I remember, what is to be done with this case of open and avowed inequity? The minister was struck dumb. He leaned him back on his chair, stroked his beard, hemmed, considered, and hemmed again, and then said in an altered and softened tone, Why? That is a secondary consideration. You mean the case between your husband and Miss Logan? The same, sir. I am scandalized at such intimacies going on under my nose. The sufferance of it is a great and crying evil. Evil, madam, may be either operative or passive. To them it is an evil, but to us none. We have no more to do with the sins of the wicked and unconverted here than with those of an infidel Turk. For all earthly bonds and fellowships are absorbed and swallowed up in the holy community of the Reformed Church. However, if it is your wish, I shall take him to task and reprimand and humble him in such a manner that he shall be ashamed of his doings and renounce such deeds forever, out of mere self-respect, though all unsanctified the heart, as well as the deed may be. To the wicked, all things are wicked, but to the just, all things are just and right. Ah, that is a sweet and comfortable saying, Mr. Ringham. How delightful to think that a justified person can do no wrong. Who would not envy the liberty wherewith we are made free? Go to my husband, that poor unfortunate blindfolded person, and open his eyes to his degenerate and sinful state, for well are you fitted to the task. Yea, I will go in unto him and confound him. I will lay the strongholds of sin and Satan as flat before my face as the dung that is spread out to fatten the land. Master, there's a gentleman at the fore door wants a private ward o' ye. Tell him I'm engaged. I can't see any gentleman tonight, but I shall attend on him tomorrow as soon as he pleases. He's coming straight in, sir. Stop a wee bit, sir. My master is engaged. He cannot see you at present, sir. Stand aside, thou Moabite. My mission admits of no delay. I come to save him from the jaws of destruction. And that be the case, sir, it makes a wide difference. And as the danger may threaten to say, I fancy I may as well let ye yang by as fight ye we. Sim ye see say intent on it. The man says he's coming to save ye and cannot stop. Sir, here he is. The laird was going to break out into a volley of wrath against Waters, his servant. But before he got a word pronounced, the Reverend Mr. Ringham had stepped inside the room, and Waters had retired, shutting the door behind him. No introduction could be more mal a propos. It was impossible, for at that very moment, the laird and Arabella Logan were both sitting on one seat and both looking on one book when the door opened. "'What is it, sir?' said the laird fiercely. "'A message of the greatest importance, sir,' said the divine, striding unceremoniously up to the chimney, turning his back to the fire and his face to the culprits. "'I think you should know me, sir,' continued he, looking displeasedly at the laird with his face half turned round. I think I should, returned the laird. You are Mr. Howes to him of Glasgow, who did me the worst turn ever I got done to me in my life. You gentry are always ready to do a man such a turn. Pray, sir, did you ever do a good job for anyone to counterbalance that? 
for if you have not, you ought to be. Hold, sir, I say, none of your profanity before me. If I do evil to anyone on such occasions, it is because he will have it so. Therefore, the evil is not of my doing. I ask you, sir, before God and this witness, I ask you, have you kept solemnly and inviolate the vows which I laid upon you that day? Answer me! Has the partner whom you bound me to kept hers inviolate? Answer me that, sir. None can better do so than you, Mr. Howes decay you. So then, you confess your backslidings and avow the prolificacy of your life. And this person here is, I suppose, the partner of your inequity. She whose beauty hath cost you to err. Stand up, both of you, till I rebuke you, and show you what you are in the eyes of God and man. In the first place, stand you still there, till I tell you what you are in the eyes of God and man. You are, sir, a presumptuous, self-conceited pedagogue, a stirrer up of strife and commotion in church, in state, in families and communities. You are one, sir, whose righteousness consists in splitting the doctrines of Calvin into thousands of undistinguishable films, and in setting up a system of justifying grace against all breaches of all laws, moral or divine. In short, sir, you are a mildew, a canker worm in the bosom of the Reformed Church, generating a disease of which she will never be purged but by the shedding of blood. Go thou in peace, and do these abominations no more, but humble thyself, lest a worse reproof come upon thee. End of section two. Section three. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. Written by himself by James Hogg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Ringham heard all this without flinching. He now and then twisted his mouth in disdain, treasuring up, meantime, his vengeance against the two aggressors. For he felt that he had him on the hip, and resolved to pour out his vengeance and indignation upon them. Sorry am I that the shackles of modern decorum restrain me from penning that famous rebuke. Fragments of which have been attributed to every divine of old notoriety throughout Scotland. But I have it by heart, and a glorious morsel it is to put into the hands of certain incendiaries. The metaphors are so strong and so appalling that Miss Logan could only stand them a very short time. She was obliged to withdraw in confusion. The laird stood his ground with much ado, though his face was often crimson over with the hues of shame and anger. Several times he was on the point of turning the officious psychophant to the door, but good manners and an inherent respect that he entertained for the clergy as the immediate servants of the Supreme Being restrained him. Ringham, perceiving these symptoms of resentment, took them for marks of shame and contrition, and pushed his reproaches farther than ever divine ventured to do in a similar case. When he had finished, to prevent further discussion, he walked slowly and majestically out of the apartment, making his robes to swing behind him in a most magisterial manner, he being without doubt, elated with his high conquest. He went to the upper story 
and related to his metaphysical associate, his wonderful success. How he had driven the dame from the house in tears and deep confusion, and left the backsliding laird in such a quandary of shame and repentance that he could neither articulate a word nor flip up his countenance. The dame thanked him most cordially, lauding his friendly zeal and powerful eloquence. And then the two again set keenly to the splitting of hairs and making distinctions in religion where none existed. They, being both children of adoption and secured from falling into snares, or anyway under the power of the wicked one, it was their custom on each visit to sit up a night in the same apartment for the sake of sweet spiritual converse. But that time, in the course of the night, they differed so materially on a small point somewhere between justification and final election that the minister, in the heat of his zeal, sprung from his seat, paced the floor, and maintained his point with such a door that Martha was alarmed, and thinking they were going to fight, and that the minister would be a hard match for her mistress, she put on some clothes and twice left her bed and stood listening at the back of the door, ready to burst in should need require it. Should anyone think this picture overstrained, I can assure him that it is taken from nature and from truth. But I will not likewise aver that the theologist was neither crazed nor inebriated. If the listener's words were to be relied on, there was no love, no accommodating principle manifested between the two. But a fiery, burning zeal, relating to points of such minor importance that a true Christian would blush to hear them mentioned, and the infidel and profane make a handle of them to turn our religion to scorn. Great was the dame's exultation at the triumph of her beloved pastor over her sinful neighbors in the lower parts of the house. And she boasted of it to Martha in high-sounding terms. But it was a short duration, for in five weeks after that, Arabella Logan came to reside with the laird as his housekeeper, sitting at his table and carrying the keys as mistress substitute of the mansion. The lady's grief and indignation were now raised to a higher pitch than ever, and she set every agent to work with whom she had any power to effect a separation between these two suspected ones. Remonstrance was of no avail. <laughs> George laughed at them who tried such a course and retained his housekeeper while the lady gave herself up to utter despair. For though she would not consort with her husband herself, she could not endure that any other should do so. But, to countervail this grievous offense, our saintly and afflicted dame, in due time, was safely delivered of a fine boy, whom the laird acknowledged as his son and heir and had him christened by his own name, and nursed in his own premises. He gave the nurse permission to take the boy to his mother's presence if ever she should desire to see him. But, strange as it may appear, she never once desired to see him from the day that he was born. The boy grew up, and was a healthful and happy child, and in the course of another year, the lady presented him with a brother. A brother he certainly was, in the eye of the law, and it is more than probable that he was his brother in reality. But the laird thought otherwise, and though he knew and acknowledged that he was obliged to support and provide for him, he refused to acknowledge him in other respects. He neither would countenance the banquet nor take the baptismal vows on him in the child's name. Of course, 
The poor boy had to live and remain an alien from the visible church for a year and a day, at which time Mr. Ringham, out of pity and kindness, took the lady herself as sponsor for the boy and baptized him by the name of Robert Ringham, that being the noted divine's own name. George was brought up with his father and educated partly at the parish school and partly at home by a tutor hired for the purpose. He was a generous and kind-hearted youth, always ready to oblige and hardly ever dissatisfied with anybody. Robert was brought up with Mr. Ringham, the laird paying a certain allowance for him yearly and there the boy was early inured to all the sternness and severity of the pastor's arbitrary and unyielding creed. He was taught to pray twice every day and seven times on Sabbath days. But he was only to pray for the elect, and, like devil of old, doom all that were aliens from God to destruction. He had never in that family into which he had been as it were adopted, heard aught but evil spoken of his reputed father and brother. Consequently, he held them in utter abhorrence and prayed against them every day, often, that the old, hoary sinner might be cut off in the full flush of his inequity and be carried quick into hell and that the young stem of the corrupt trunk might also be taken from a world that he disgraced, but that his sins might be pardoned because he knew no better. Such were the tenets in which it would appear young Robert was bred. He was an acute boy, an excellent learner, had ardent and ungovernable passions, and withal, a sternness of demeanor from which other boys shrunk. He was the best grammarian, the best reader, writer, and accountant in the various classes that he attended, and was fond of writing essays on controverted points of theology, for which he got prizes, and great praise from his guardian and mother. George was much behind him in scholastic acquirements but greatly his superior in personal prowess, form, feature, and all that constitutes gentility in the deportment and appearance. The laird had often manifested to Miss Logan an earnest wish that the two young men should never meet, or at all events that they should be as little conversant as possible. And Miss Logan, who was as much attached to George as if he had been her own son, took every precaution while he was a boy that he should never meet his brother. But, as they advanced towards manhood, this became impracticable. The lady was removed from her apartments in her husband's house to Glasgow, to her great content, and all to prevent the young laird being tainted with the company of her and her second son for the laird had felt the effects of the principles they professed, and dreaded them more than persecution, fire, and sword. During all the dreadful times that had overpassed, though the laird had been a moderate man, he had still leaned to the side of kingly prerogative, and had escaped confiscation and fines, without ever taking any active hand in suppressing the Coventers. But, after experiencing a specimen of their tenets and manner in his wife, from a secret favorer of them and their doctrines, he grew alarmed at their prevalence of such stern and factious principles, now that there was no check or restraint upon them. And from that time he began to set himself against them, joining with the cavalry party of that day in all their proceedings. It so happened that, under the influence of the Earls of Seafield and Tullibardine, he was returned for a member of Parliament in the famous session that sat at Edinburgh when the Duke of Queensbury was commissioner, and in which party spirit ran to such an extremity. 
the young laird went with his father to the court and remained in town all the time that the session lasted and as all interested people of both factions flocked to the town at that period so the important mr ringham was there among the rest during the greater part of the time blowing the coal of revolutionary principles with all his might in every society to which he could obtain admission he was a great favorite with some of the west country gentlemen of that faction by reason of his unbending impudence no opposition could for a moment cause him either to blush or retract one item that he had advanced therefore the duke of argyle and his friends made such use of him as sportsmen often do of terriers to start the game and make a great yelping noise to let them know whither the chase is proceeding they often did this out of sport in order to tease their opponent for of all pesterers that ever fastened on man he was the most insufferable knowing that his coat protected him from manual chastisement he spared no acrimony and delighted in the chagrin and anger of those with whom he contended but he was sometimes likewise of real use to the heads of the presbyterian faction and therefore was admitted to their tables and of course conceived himself a very great man his ward accompanied him and very shortly after their arrival in edinburgh robert for the first time met with the young laird his brother in a match at tennis the prowess and agility of the young squire drew forth the loudest plaudits of approval from his associates and his own exertion alone carried the game every time on the one side and that so far is all i along to count three for their one the hero's name soon ran round the circle and when his brother robert who was an onlooker learned who it was that was gaining so much applause he came and stood close beside him all the time that the game lasted always now and then putting in a cutting remark by way of mockery george could not help perceiving him not only on account of his impertinent remarks but he moreover stood so near him that he several times impeded him in his rapid evolutions and of course got himself shoved aside in no very ceremonious way instead of making him keep his distance these rude shocks and pushes accompanied sometimes with hasty curses only made him cling the closer to this king of the game he seemed determined to maintain his right to his place as an onlooker as well as any of those engaged in the game and if they had tried him at an argument he would have carried his point or perhaps he wished to quarrel with this spark of his jealousy and aversion and draw the attention of the gay crowd to himself by these means for like his guardian he knew no other pleasure but what consisted in opposition george took him for some impertinent student of divinity rather set upon a joke than anything else he perceived a lad with black clothes and a methodistical face whose countenance and eye he disliked exceedingly several times in his way and that was all the notice he took of him the first time they two met but the next day and every succeeding one the same devilish looking youth attended him as constantly as his shadow was always in his way as with intention to impede him and ever and anon his deep and malignant eye met those of his elder brother with a glance so fierce that it sometimes startled him end of section three section four the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner written by himself 
by James Hogg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The very next time that George was engaged at tennis, he had not struck the ball above twice till this same intrusive being was again in his way. The party played for considerable stakes that day, namely a dinner and wine at the Black Bull Tavern, and George, as the hero and head of his party, was much interested in its honor. Consequently, the sight of this moody and hellish-looking student affected him in no very pleasant manner. Pray, sir, be so good as keep without the range of the ball, said he. Is there any law or enactment that can compel me to do so, said the other, biting his lip with scorn? If there is not, they are here that shall compel you, returned George. So, friend, I read you to be on your guard. As he said this, a flush of anger glowed in his handsome face and flashed from his sparkling blue eye. But it was a stranger to both, and momently took its departure. The black-coated youth set up his cap before, brought his heavy brows over his deep dark eyes, put his hands in the pockets of his black plush breeches, and stepped a little farther into the semicircle, immediately on his brother's right hand than he had ever ventured to do before. There he set himself firm on his legs, and with a face as demure as death, seemed determined to keep his ground. He pretended to be following the ball with his eyes, but every moment they were glancing aside at George. One of the competitors chanced to say rashly, in the moment of exultation, that's a damned fine blow, George, on which the intruder took up the word as characteristic of the competitors and repeated it every stroke that was given, making such a ludicrous use of it that several of the onlookers were compelled to laugh immoderately. But the players were terribly nettled at it, as he really contrived, by dint of sliding in some canical terms, to render the competitors and their game ridiculous. But matters at length came to a crisis that put them beyond sport. George, in flying backward to gain the point at which the ball was going to light, came inadvertently so rudely in contact with this obstreperous interloper that he not only overthrew him, but also got a grievous fall over his legs. And, as he arose, the other made a spurn at him with his foot, which, if it had hit to its aim, would undoubtedly have finished the course of the young laird of Dahl Castle and Belgrenin. George, being irritated beyond measure, as may well be conceived, especially at the deadly stroke aimed at him, struck the assailant with his racket, rather slightly, but so that his mouth and nose gushed out blood, and at the same time he said, turning to his cronies, Does any of you know who this infernal puppy is? Do you know, sir, said one of the onlookers, a stranger? The gentleman is your own brother, sir, Mr. Robert Ringham Colwain. No. Not Colwain, sir, said Robert, putting his hands in his pockets and setting himself still farther forward than before. Not a Colwain, sir. Henceforth, I disclaim the name. No, certainly not, repeated George. My mother's son you may be, but not a Colwain. There you are right. Then, turning around to his informer, he said, Mercy be about us, sir. Is this the crazy minister's son from Glasgow? This question, 
was put in the irritation of the moment, but it was too rude and far too out of place, and no one deigned any answer to it. He felt the reproof and felt it deeply. Seeming anxious for some opportunity to make an acknowledgement or some reparation. In the meantime, young Ringham was an object to all of the uttermost disgust. The blood flowing from his mouth and nose he took no pains to stem, neither did he so much as wipe it away, so that it spread over all his cheeks and breast, even off at his toes. In that state did he take up his station in the middle of the competitors, and he did not now keep his place, but ran about, impeding everyone who attempted to make it the ball. They loaded him with execrations, but it availed nothing. He seemed courting persecution and buffetings, keeping steadfastly to his old joke of damnation and marring the game so completely that, in spite of every effort on the part of the players, he forced them to stop their game and give it up. He was such a rueful-looking object, covered with blood, that none of them had the heart to kick him, although it appeared the only thing he wanted. And, as for George, he said not another word to him, either in anger or reproof. When the game was fairly given up, and the party were washing their hands in the stone fount, some of them besought Robert Ringham to wash himself. But he mocked at them, and said he was much better as he was. George, at length, came forward abashedly towards him, and said, I have been greatly to blame, Robert, and I am very sorry for what I have done. But, in the first instance, I erred through ignorance, not knowing you were my brother, which you certainly are. And, in the second, through a momentary irritation, for which I am ashamed, I pray you, therefore, to pardon me and give me your hand. As he said this, he held out his hand towards his polluted brother. But the fro-war pedestinarian took not his from his breeches pocket, but lifted his foot. He gave his brother's hand a kick. I'll give you what will suit such a hand better than mine, said he, with a sneer. And then, turning lightly about, he added, Are there to be no more of these damned fine blows, gentlemen? for shame to give up such a profitable and edifying game. This is too bad, said George, but since it is thus, I have the less to regret. And having made this general remark, he took no more note of the uncouth aggressor. But the persecution of the latter terminated not on the playground. He ranked up among them, bloody and disgusting as he was, and keeping close by his brother's side, he marched along with the party all the way to the Black Bull. Before they got there, a great number of boys and idle people had surrounded them, hooting and incommoding them exceedingly, so that they were glad to get into the inn. And the unaccountable monster actually tried to get in alongst with them, to make one of the party at dinner. But the innkeeper and his men, getting the hint, by force prevented him from entering, although he attempted it again and again, both by telling lies and offering a bribe. Finding he could not prevail, he set to exciting the mob at the door to acts of violence, in which he had liked to have succeeded. The landlord had no other shift at last but to send privately for two officers and have him carried to the guardhouse, and the hilarity and joy of the party of young gentlemen for the evening was quite spoiled by the inauspicious termination of their game. The Reverend Robert Ringham was now to send for, 
to release his beloved ward. The messenger found him at table with a number of the leaders of the Whig faction, the Marquis of Annandale being in the chair, and the prisoner's note being produced. Ringham read it aloud, accompanying it with some explanatory remarks. The circumstances of the case being thus magnified and distorted, it excited the utmost abhorrence, both of the deed and the perpetrators, among the assembled faction. They declaimed against the act as an unnatural attempt on the character and even the life of an unfortunate brother who had been expelled from his father's house. And, as party spirit was the order of the day, an attempt was made to lay the burden of it to that account. In short, the young culprit got some of the best blood of the land to enter as his securities, and was set at liberty. But, when Ringham perceived the plight that he was in, he took him, as he was, and presented him to his honorable patrons. This raised the indignation against the young laird and his associates a thousandfold, which actually roused the party to temporary madness. They were, perhaps, a little excited by the wine and spirits they had swallowed, else a casual quarrel between two young men at tennis could not have driven them to such extremes. But certain it is that, from one at first arising to address the party on the atrocity of the offense, both in a moral and political point of view, on a sudden there were six on their feet at the same time, expatiating on it, and in a very short time thereafter, everyone in the room was up talking with the utmost vociferation, all on the same subject, and all taking the same side in the debate. In the midst of this confusion, someone or other issued from the house, which was at the back of the cannon gate, calling out, A plot! A plot! Treason! Treason! Down with the bloody incendiaries at the Black Bull! The concourse of people that were assembled in Edinburgh at that time were prodigious, and as they were all actuated by political motives, they wanted only a ready-blown coal to set the mountain on fire. The evening being fine, and the streets thronged, the cry ran from mouth to mouth through the whole city. More than that, the mob that had of late been gathered to the door of the Black Bull had, by degrees, dispersed. But they being young men, and idle vagrants, they had only spread themselves over the rest of the street to lounge in search of further amusement. Consequently, a word was sufficient to send them back to their late rendezvous, where they had previously witnessed something they did not much approve of. The master of the tavern was astonished at seeing the mob again assembling, and that with such hurry and noise. But his inmates, being all of the highest respectability, he judged himself sure of protection, or at least of indemnity. He had two large parties in his house at the time, the largest of which was of the revolutionist faction. The other consisted of our young tennis players and their associates, who were all of the Jacobite order, or, at all events, leaned to the Episcopal side. The largest party were in a front room, and the attack of the mob fell first on their windows, though rather with fear and caution. Jingle went one pane, then a loud hurrah, and that again was followed by a number of voices, endeavoring to restrain the indignation from venting itself in destroying the windows, and to turn it on the inmates. The Whigs, calling the landlord, inquired what the assault meant. He cunningly answered that he suspected it was some of the use of the Cavalier, or High Church Party, exciting the mob against them. 
The party consisted mostly of young gentlemen, by that time in a key to engage in any row, and at all events to suffer nothing from the other party, against whom their passions were mightily inflamed. The landlord, therefore, had no sooner given them the spirit-rousing intelligence than everyone, as by instinct, swore his own natural oath and grasped his own natural weapon. A few of those of the highest rank were armed with swords, which they boldly drew. Those of the subordinate orders immediately flew to such weapons as the room, kitchen, and scullery afforded, such as tongs, pokers, spits, racks, and shovels. And breathing vengeance on the prelatic party, the children of Antichrist and the heirs of damnation. The barterers of the liberties of their country and betrayers of the most sacred trust. Thus elevated and thus armed in the cause of right, justice, and liberty. Our heroes rushed to the street and attacked the mob with such violence that they broke the mass in a moment and dispersed their thousands like chaff before the wind. The other party of young Jacobites, who sat in a room farther from the front, and were those against whom the fury of the mob was meant to have been directed, knew nothing of this second uproar, till the noise of the sally made by the Whigs assailed their ears. Being then informed that the mob had attacked the house on account of the treatment they themselves had given to a young gentleman of the adverse faction, and that another jovial party had issued from the house in their defense, and was now engaged in an unequal combat, the sparks likewise flew to the field to back their defenders with all their prowess, without troubling their heads about who they were. A mob is like a spring tide in an eastern storm that retires only to return with more overwhelming fury. The crowd was taken by surprise when such a strong and well-armed party issued from the house with so great fury, laying all prostate that came in their way. Those who were next to the door and were, of course, the first whom the imminent danger assailed rushed backwards among the crowd with their whole force. The black bull, standing in a small square, halfway between the high street and the cow gate, and the entrance to it being by two closes, into these the pressure outwards was simultaneous, and thousands were moved to an involuntary flight. They knew not why. But the high street of Edinburgh, which they soon reached, is a dangerous place in which to make an open attack upon a mob. And it appears that the entrances to the tavern had been somewhere near to the cross, on the south side of the street, for the crowd fled with great expedition, both to the east and west, and the conquerors, separating themselves as chance directed, pursued impetuously wounding and maiming as they flew. But it so chanced that, before either of the wings had followed the flying squadrons of their enemies for the space of a hundred yards each way, the devil and enemy they had to pursue. The multitude had vanished like so many thousands of phantoms. What could our heroes do? Why, they faced about to return towards their citadel, the Black Bull. But that feat was not so easily nor so readily accomplished as they divined. The unnumbered alleys on each side of the street had swallowed up the multitude in a few seconds. But from these they were busy reconnoitering and perceiving the deficiency in the number of their assailants. The rush from both sides of the street was as rapid and as wonderful as the disappearance of the crowd had been a few minutes before. Each close vomited out its levies, and these better armed with missiles 
than when they sought it for a temporary retreat. Woe, then, to our two columns of victorious Whigs! The mob actually closed around them as they would have swallowed them up, and in the meanwhile, shower after shower of the most abominable weapons of offense were rained in upon them. If the gentlemen were irritated before, this inflamed them still further. But their danger was now so apparent they could not shut their eyes on it. Therefore, both parties, as if actuated by the same spirit, made a desperate effort to join, and the greater part affected it. But some were knocked down, and others were separated from their friends, and blithe to become silent members of the mob. End of Section 4 Section 5 The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by Himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The battle now raged immediately in front of the closes leading to the Black Bull. The small body of Whig gentlemen was hardly bested, and it is likely would have been overcome and trampled down every man, had they not been then and there joined by the young cavaliers. Who, fresh to arms, broke the wind, opened the head of the passage, laid about them manfully, and thus kept up the spirits of the exasperated Whigs, who were the men, in fact, that wrought the most deray among the populace. The town guard was now on the alert, and two companies of the Cameronian Regiment, with the Honorable Captain Douglas, rushed down from the castle to the scene of action. But for all the noise and hubbub that these caused in the street, the combat had become so close and inveterate that numbers of both sides were taken prisoners fighting hand to hand, and could scarcely be separated when the guardsmen and soldiers had them by their necks. Great was the alarm and confusion that night in Edinburgh, for everyone concluded that it was a party scuffle, and the two parties being so equal in power the most serious consequences were anticipated. The agitation was so prevailing that every party in town, great and small, was broken up, and the Lord Commissioner thought proper to go to the council chamber himself, even at that late hour, accompanied by the sheriffs of Edinburgh and Linlithgow, with sundry noblemen besides, in order to learn something of the origin of the affray. For a long time, the court was completely puzzled. Every gentleman brought in exclaimed against the treatment he had received, in most bitter terms, blaming a mob set on him and his friends by the adverse party, and matters looked extremely ill until at length they began to perceive that they were examining gentlemen of both parties, and that they had been doing so from the beginning almost alternately, so equally had the prisoners been taken from both parties. Finally, it turned out that a few gentlemen, two-thirds of whom were strenuous Whigs themselves, had joined in mauling the whole Whig population of Edinburgh. The investigation disclosed nothing the effect of which was not ludicrous, and the Duke of Queensberry, whose aim was at that time to conciliate the two factions, tried all that he could to turn the whole fracas into a joke, an unlucky frolic, where no ill was meant on either side, and which yet had been productive of a great deal. The greater part of the people went home satisfied, but not so the Reverend Robert Ringham. 
He did all that he could to inflame both judges and populace against the young cavaliers, especially against the young laird of Dal Castle, whom he represented as an incendiary, set on by an unnatural parent to slander his mother and make away with a hapless and only brother. And in truth, that declaimer against all human merit had that sort of powerful, homely, and bitter eloquence which seldom missed affecting his hearers. The consequence at that time was that he made the unfortunate affair between the two brothers appear in extremely bad colors, and the populace retired to their homes, impressed with no very favorable opinion of either the Laird of Dal Castle or his son George, neither of whom were there present to speak for themselves. As for Ringham himself, he went home to his lodgings, filled with gall and with spite against the young laird, whom he was made to believe the aggressor, and that intentionally. But most of all he was filled with indignation against the father, whom he held in abhorrence at all times, and blamed solely for this unmannerly attack made on his favorite ward, namesake, and adopted son, and for the public imputation of a crime to his own reverence in calling the lad his son, and thus charging him with a sin against which he was well known to have leveled all the arrows of church censure with unsparing might. But, filled as his heart was with some portion of these bad feelings, to which all flesh is subject, he kept, nevertheless, the fear of the Lord always before his eyes, so far as never to omit any of the external duties of religion. And farther than that man hath no power to pry. He lodged with the family of a Mr. Miller, whose lady was originally from Glasgow, and had been a hearer and, of course, a great admirer of Mr. Ringham. In that family he made public worship every evening, and that night, in his petitions at a throne of grace, he prayed for so many vials of wrath to be poured on the head of some particular sinner that the hearers trembled and stopped their ears. But that he might not proceed with so violent a measure, amounting to excommunication without due scripture warrant, he began the exercise of the evening by singing the following verses, which it is a pity should ever have been admitted into a Christian psalmody, being so adverse to all its mild and benevolent principles. Set thou the wicked over him, and upon his right hand give thou his greatest enemy, even Satan leave to stand. And when by thee he shall be judged, let him remembered be, and let his prayers be turned to sin when he shall call on thee. Few be his days, and in his room his charge another take, his children let be fatherless, his wife a widow make. Let God his father's wickedness still to remembrance call, and never let his mother's sin be blotted out at all. As he in cursing pleasure took, so let it to him fall. As he delighted not to bless, so bless him not at all. As cursing he likes clothes put on, into his bowel so, like water, and into his bones, like oil, down let it go. Young Ringham only knew the full purport of this spiritual song and went to his bed better satisfied than ever that his father and brother were castaways, reprobates, aliens from the church and the true faith, and cursed in time and eternity. The next day, George and his companions met as usual, all who were not seriously wounded of them. But as they strolled about the city, the rancorous eye and the finger of scorn was pointed against them. None of them was at first aware of the reason, 
but it threw a damp over their spirits and enjoyments, which they could not master. They went to take a forenoon game at their old play of tennis, not on a match, but by way of improving themselves. But they had not well taken their places till young Ringham appeared in his old station at his brother's right hand, with looks more demure and determined than ever. His lips were primed so close that his mouth was hardly discernible, and his dark, deep eye flashed gleams of holy indignation on the godless set, but particularly on his brother. His presence acted as a mildew on all social intercourse or enjoyment. The game was marred and ended ere ever it was well begun. There were whisperings apart, the party separated, and in order to shake off the blighting influence of this dogged persecutor, they entered sundry houses of their acquaintances, with an understanding that they were to meet on the links for a game at cricket. They did so, and stripping off part of their clothes, they began that violent and spirited game. They had not played five minutes till Ringham was stalking in the midst of them and totally impeding the play. A cry arose from all corners of, Ah, oh, this will never do. Kick him out of the playground. Knock down the scoundrel or bind him and let him lie in peace. By no means, cried George. It is evident he wants nothing else. Pray do not humor him so much as to touch him with either foot or finger. Then, turning to a friend, he said in a whisper, Speak to him, Gordon. He surely will not refuse to let us have the ground to ourselves if you request it of him. Gordon went up to him and requested of him, civility, but ardently, to retire to a certain distance else none of them could or would be answerable, however sore he might be hurt. He turned disdainfully on his heel, uttered a kind and pulpit hem, and then added, I will take my chance of that. Hurt me, any of you, at your peril. The young gentleman smiled, through spite and disdain of the dogged animal. Gordon followed him up and tried to remonstrate with him but he let him know that it was his pleasure to be there at that time, and unless he could demonstrate to him what superior right he and his party had to that ground, in preference to him and to the exclusion of all others, he was determined to assert his right and the rights of his fellow citizens by keeping possession of whatsoever part of that common field he chose. You are no gentleman, sir, said Gordon. Are you one, sir, said the other. Yes, sir. I will let you know that I am by God. Then thanks be to him whose name you have profaned. I am none. If one of the party be a gentleman, I do hope in God I am not. It was now apparent to them all that he was courting obloquy and manual chastisement from their hands if by any means he could provoke them to the deed, and apprehensive that he had some sinister and deep-laid design in hunting after such a singular favor, they wisely restrained one another from inflicting the punishment that each of them yearned to bestow, personally, and which he so well deserved. But the unpopularity of the younger George Calwain could no longer be concealed from his associates. It was manifested wherever the populace were assembled, and his young and intimate friend, Adam Gordon, was obliged to warn him of the circumstance that he might not be surprised at the gentlemen of their acquaintance withdrawing themselves from his society, as they could not be seen with him without being insulted. George thanked him, and it was agreed between them that the former should keep himself retired during the daytime while he remained in Edinburgh, and that at night they should meet together, along with such of their companions as were disengaged. 
George found it every day more and more necessary to adhere to the system of seclusion. For it was not alone the hisses of the boys and populace that pursued him. A fiend of more malignant aspect was ever at his elbow, in the form of his brother. To whatever place of amusement he betook himself, and however well he concealed his intentions of going there from all flesh living, there was his brother Ringham also, and always within a few yards of him, generally about the same distance, and ever and anon darting looks at him that chilled his very soul. They were looks that cannot be described, but they were felt piercing to the bosom's deepest core. They affected even the onlookers in a very particular manner, for all whose eyes caught a glimpse of these hideous glances followed them to the object towards which they were darted. The gentlemanly and mild demeanor of that object generally calmed their startled apprehensions, for no one ever yet noted the glances of the young man's eye in the black coat at the face of his brother who did not at first manifest strong symptoms of alarm. George became utterly confounded, not only at the import of this persecution, but how in the world it came to pass that this unaccountable being knew all his motions, and every intention of his heart, as it were intuitively. On consulting his own previous feelings and resolutions, he found that the circumstances of his going to such and such a place were often the most casual incidents in nature. The caprice of a moment had carried him there, and yet he had never sat or stood many minutes till there was the self-same being, always in the same position with regard to himself, as regularly as the shadow is cast from the substance, or the ray of light from the opposing denser medium. For instance, he remembered one day of setting out with the intention of going to attend divine worship in the high church, and when, within a short space of its door, he was overtaken by young Kilpatrick of Clossburn, who was bound to the Grey Friars to see a sweetheart, as he said, And if you will go with me, Colwain, said he, I will let you see her too, and then you will be just as forward as I am. George assented at once and went, and, after taking his seat, he leaned his head forwards on the pew to repeat over to himself a short ejaculatory prayer, as had always been his custom on entering the house of God. When he had done, he lifted his eye naturally towards that point on his right hand, where the fierce apparition of his brother had been wont to meet his view. There he was in the same habit, form, demeanor, and precise point of distance as usual. George again laid down his head, and his mind was so astounded that he had nearly fallen into a swoon. He tried shortly after to muster up courage to look at the speaker, at the congregation, and at Captain Kilpatrick's sweetheart in particular. But the fiendish glances of the young man in the black clothes were too appalling to be withstood. His eye caught them whether he was looking that way or not. At length his courage was fairly mastered, and he was obliged to look down during the remainder of the service. By night or by day it was the same. In the gallery of the Parliament House, in the boxes of the playhouse, in the church, in the assembly, in the streets, suburbs, and the fields, and every day and every hour, from the first recounter of the two, the attendance became more and more constant, more inexplicable, and altogether more alarming and insufferable, until at last George was fairly driven from society and forced to spend his days in his and his father's lodgings with closed doors. Even there, he was constantly harassed with the idea that, the next time he lifted his eyes, he would to a certainty see that face, 
the most repulsive to all his feelings of aught the earth contained. The attendance of that brother was now become like the attendance of a demon on some devoted being that had sold himself to destruction. His approaches as undiscerned, and his looks as fraught with hideous malignity. It was seldom that he saw him either following him in the streets or entering any house or church after him. He only appeared in his place. George wist not how or whence, and having sped so ill in his first friendly approaches, he had never spoken to his equivocal attendant a second time. It came at length into George's head, as he was pondering by himself on the circumstances of this extraordinary attendance, that perhaps his brother had relented, and though of so sullen and unaccommodating a temper that he would not acknowledge it or beg a reconciliation, it might be for that very purpose that he followed his steps night and day in that extraordinary manner. I cannot for my life see for what other purpose it can be, thought he. He never offers to attempt my life, nor dares he, if he had the inclination. Therefore, although his manner is peculiarly repulsive to me, I shall not have my mind burdened with the reflection that my own mother's son yearned for a reconciliation with me and was repulsed by my haughty and insolent behavior. The next time he comes to my hand, I am resolved that I will accost him as one brother ought to address another, whatever it may cost me, and if I am still flouted with disdain, then shall the blame rest with him. After this generous resolution, it was a good while before his gratuitous attendant appeared at his side again, and George began to think that his visits were discontinued. The hope was a relief that could not be calculated. But still George had a feeling that it was too supreme to last. His enemy had been too pertinacious to abandon his design, whatever it was. He, however, began to indulge in a little more liberty, and for several days he enjoyed it with impunity. End of Section 5 Section 6 The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by Himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. George was, from infancy, of a stirring, active disposition, and could not endure confinement. And having been of late much restrained in his youthful exercises by this singular persecutor, he grew uneasy under such restraint, and one morning, chancing to awaken very early, he arose to make an excursion to the top of Arthur's seat, to breathe the breeze of the dawning and see the sun arise out of the eastern ocean. The morning was calm and serene, and as he walked down the south back of the cannon gate, towards the palace, the haze was so close around him that he could not see the houses on the opposite side of the way. As he passed the Lord Commissioner's house, the guards were in attendance, who cautioned him not to go by the palace, as all the gates would be shut and guarded for an hour to come. On which he went by the back of St. Anthony's Gardens, and found his way into that little romantic glade adjoining to the saint's chapel and well. He was still involved in a blue haze, like a dense smoke, but yet in the midst of it the respiration was the most refreshing and delicious. The grass and the flowers were loaded with dew, and on taking off his hat to wipe his forehead, he perceived that the black glossy fur of which his chaperon was wrought was all covered with a tissue of the most delicate silver, 
a fairy web, composed of little spheres, so minute that no eye could discern any of them, yet there they were shining in lovely millions. Afraid of defacing so beautiful and so delicate a garnish, he replaced his hat with the greatest caution and went on his way light of heart. As he approached the squire at the head of the dell, that little delightful verge from which in one moment the eastern limits and shores of Lothian arise on the view. As he approached it, I say, in a little space from the height, he beheld, to his astonishment, a bright halo in the cloud of haze that rose in a semicircle over his head like a pale rainbow. He was struck motionless at the view of the lovely vision, for it so chanced that he had never seen the same appearance before, though common at early morn. But he soon perceived the cause of the phenomenon, and that it proceeded from the rays of the sun from a pure unclouded morning sky, striking upon this dense vapor which refracted them. But the better all the works of nature are understood, the more they will be ever admired. That was a scene that would have entranced the man of science with delight, but which the uninitiated and sordid man would have regarded less than the mole rearing up his hill in silence and in darkness. George did admire this halo of glory, which still grew wider and less defined as he approached the surface of the cloud. But to his utter amazement and supreme delight, he found on reaching the top of Arthur's seat that this sublunary rainbow, this terrestrial glory, was spread in its most vivid hues beneath his feet. Still he could not perceive the body of the sun, although the light behind him was dazzling. But the cloud of haze lying dense in that deep dell that separates the hill from the rocks of Salisbury, and the dull shadow of the hill mingling with that cloud made the dell a pit of darkness. On that shadowy cloud was the lovely rainbow formed, spreading itself on a horizontal plane and having a slight and brilliant shade of all the colors of the heavenly bow, but all of them paler and less defined. But this terrestrial phenomenon of the early morn cannot be better delineated than by the name given of it by the shepherd boys, the little wee ghost of the rainbow. Such was the description of the morning, and the wild shades of the hill, that George gave to his father and Mr. Adam Gordon that same day on which he had witnessed them, and it is necessary that the reader should comprehend something of their nature to understand what follows. He seated himself on the pinnacle of the rocky precipice, a little within the top of the hill to the westward, and with a light and buoyant heart, viewed the beauties of the morning, and inhaled its salubrious breeze. Here, thought he, I can converse with nature without disturbance, and without being intruded on by any appalling or obnoxious visitor. The idea of his brother's dark and malevolent looks coming at that moment across his mind, he turned his eyes instinctively to the right, to the point where that unwelcome guest was wont to make his appearance. Gracious heaven! What an apparition was there presented to his view! He saw, delineated in the cloud, the shoulders, arms, and features of a human being of the most dreadful aspect. The face was the face of his brother, but dilated to twenty times the natural size. Its dark eyes gleamed on him through the mist, while every furrow of its hideous brow frowned deep as the ravines of the brow of the hill. George started, and his hair stood up in bristles as he gazed on this horrible monster. He saw every feature and every line of the face distinctly as it gazed on him with an intensity that was hardly brookable. 
Its eyes were fixed on him, in the same manner as those of some carnivorous animal fixed on its prey. And yet there was fear and trembling in these unearthly features, as plainly depicted as murderous malice. The giant apparition seemed sometimes to be cowering down as in terror so that nothing but his brow and eyes were seen. Still, these never turned one moment from their object. Again, it rose imperceptibly up and began to approach with great caution, and as it neared, the dimensions of its form lessened, still continuing, however, far above the natural size. George conceived it to be a spirit. He could conceive it to be nothing else, and he took it for some horrid demon by which he was haunted, that had assumed the features of his brother in every lineament, but in taking on itself the human form, had miscalculated dreadfully on the size, and presented itself thus to him in a blown-up, dilated frame of embodied air, exhaled from the caverns of death or the regions of devouring fire. He was further confirmed in the belief that it was a malignant spirit on perceiving that it approached him across the front of a precipice where there was not footing for thing of mortal frame. Still, what with terror and astonishment, he continued riveted to the spot till it approached, as he deemed, to within two yards of him. And then, perceiving that it was setting itself to make a violent spring on him, he started to his feet and fled distractedly in the opposite direction. Keeping his eye cast behind him, lest he had been seized in that dangerous place. But the very first bolt that he made in his flight, he came in contact with a real body of flesh and blood, and that with such violence that both went down among some scragged rocks, and George rolled over the other. The being called out, Murder! and rising fled precipitately. George then perceived that it was his brother, and being confounded between the shadow and the substance, he knew not what he was doing or what he had done. And there, being only one natural way of retreat from the brink of the rock, he likewise arose and pursued the affrighted culprit with all his speed towards the top of the hill. Ringham was braying out, Murder! Murder! At which George, being disgusted, and his spirits all in a ferment from some hurried idea of intended harm, the moment he came up with the craven, he seized him rudely by the shoulder and clapped his hand on his mouth. Murder? You beast! said he. What do you mean by roaring out murder in that way? Who the devil is murdering you? or offering to murder you. Ringham forced his mouth from under his brother's hand and roared with redoubled energy, Ah, ah, murder, murder, etc. George had felt resolute to put down this shocking alarm, lest someone might hear it and fly to the spot, or draw inferences widely different from the truth and perceiving the terror of this elect youth to be so great that expostulation was vain. He seized him by the mouth and nose with his left hand so strenuously that he sank his fingers into his cheeks. But, the poltroon still attempting to bray out, George gave him such a stunning blow with his fist on the left temple that he crumbled, as it were, to the ground but more from the effects of terror than those of the blow. His nose, however, again gushed out blood, a system of defense which seemed as natural to him as that resorted to by the race of stinkards. He then raised himself on his knees and hands, and raising up his ghastly face, while the blood streamed over both ears, he besought his life of his brother in the most abject whining manner, gaping, and blubbering most piteously. Tell me then, sir, said George, resolved to make the most of the wretch's terror. 
Tell me for what purpose it is that you haunt my steps. Tell me plainly and instantly, else I will throw you from the verge of that precipice. Uh Oh, I I will never do it again. I I will never do it again. Spare my life, dear good brother. Spare my life. Sure, I I never did you any hurt. Swear to me then, by the God that made you, that you will never henceforth follow after me to torment me with your hellish threatening looks. Swear that you will never again come into my presence without being invited. Will you take an oath to this effect? Uh, Oh yes, I will, I will! But this is not all. You must tell me for what purpose you sought me out here this morning. Uh, Oh brother, for nothing but your good. I I had nothing at heart but your unspeakable profit, and great and endless good. So then... You indeed knew that I was here. I was told so by a friend, but I did not believe him. At least I did not know that it was true till I saw you. Tell me this one thing then, Robert, and all shall be forgotten and forgiven. Who was that friend? You don't know him, sir. How then does he know me? I I cannot tell. Was he here, present with you today? Yes, he was not far distant. He came to this hill with me. Where then is he now? I I cannot tell. Then, wretch, confess that the devil was that friend who told you I was here, and who came here with you. None else could possibly know of my being here. Ah, how little you know of him. Would you argue that there is neither man nor spirit endowed with so much foresight as to deduce natural conclusions from previous actions and incidents but the devil? Alas, brother! But why should I wonder at such abandoned notions and principles? It was foreordained that you should cherish them, and that they should be the ruin of your soul and body, before the world was framed. Be assured of this, however, that I had no aim of seeking you but your good. Well, Robert, I will believe it. I am disposed to be hasty and passionate. It is a fault in my nature. But I never meant or wished you evil, and God is my witness that I would as soon stretch out my hand to my own life or my father's as yours. At these words, Ringham uttered a hollow, exulting laugh, put his hands in his pockets, and withdrew his face to his accustomed distance. George continued, And now, once and for all, I request that we may exchange forgiveness, and that we may part and remain friends. Would such a thing be expedient, think you, or consistent with the glory of God? I doubt it. I can think of nothing that would be more so. Is it not consistent with every precept of the gospel? Come, brother. Say that our reconciliation is complete. Uh, Oh yes, certainly. I tell you, brother, according to the flesh, it is just as complete as the lark's is with the adder, no more so, nor ever can. Reconciled, forsooth, to what would I be reconciled? As he said this, he strode indignantly away. From the moment that he heard his life was safe, he assumed his former insolence and revengeful looks, and never were they more dreadful than on parting with his brother that morning on top of the hill. Well, go thy way, said George. Some would despise, but I pity thee. If thou art not a limb of Satan, I never saw one. The sun had now dispelled the vapors, and the morning being lovely beyond description, George sat himself down on the top of the hill and pondered deeply on the unaccountable incident that had befallen to him that morning. He could in no wise comprehend it, but taking it with other previous circumstances, he could not get quit of a conviction that he was haunted by some evil genius in the shape of his brother. 
as well as by that dark and mysterious wretch himself. In no other way could he account for the apparition he saw that morning on the face of the rock, nor for several sudden appearances of the same being in places where there was no possibility of any foreknowledge that he himself was to be there. And as little that the same being, if he were flesh and blood like other men, could always start up in the same position with regard to him. He determined, therefore, on reaching home, to relate all that had happened, from beginning to end, to his father, asking his counsel and his assistance, although he knew full well that his father was not the fittest man in the world to solve such a problem. He was now involved in party politics, over head and ears, and moreover, he could never hear the names of either of the Ringhams mentioned without getting into a quandary of disgust and anger, and all that he would deign to say of them was to call them by all the opprobrious names he could invent. It turned out as the young man from the first suggested. Old Doll Castle would listen to nothing concerning them with any patience. George complained that his brother harassed him with his presence at all times and in all places. Old Doll asked why he did not kick the dog out of his presence whenever he felt him disagreeable. George said he seemed to have some demon for a familiar. Doll answered that he did not wonder a bit at that, for the young spark was the third in a direct line who had all been children of adultery and it was well known that all such were born half-deals themselves, and nothing was more likely than that they should hold intercourse with their fellows. In the same style did he sympathize with all his son's late sufferings and perplexities. In Mr. Adam Gordon, however, George found a friend who entered into all his feelings and had seen and known everything about the matter. He tried to convince him that at all events there could be nothing supernatural in the circumstances, and that the vision he had seen on the rock among the thick mist was the shadow of his brother approaching behind him. George could not swallow this, for he had seen his own shadow on the cloud, and instead of approaching to aught like his own figure, he perceived nothing but a halo of glory round a point of the cloud that was whiter and purer than the rest. Gordon said, if he would go with him to a mountain of his father's, which he named in Aberdeenshire, he would show him a giant spirit of the same dimensions any morning at the rising of the sun, provided he shone on that spot. This statement excited George's curiosity exceedingly and being disgusted with some things about Edinburgh, and glad to get out of the way, he consented to go with Gordon to the Highlands for a space. The day was accordingly set for their departure, the old laird's assent obtained, and the two young sparks parted in a state of great impatience for their excursion. End of Section 6 Section 7. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner, written by himself, by James Hogg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One of them found out another engagement, however the instant after this last was determined on. Young Ringham went off the hill that morning and home to his upright guardian again without washing the blood from his face and neck. And there he told a most woeful story indeed, how he had gone out to take a morning's walk on the hill, where he had encountered with his reprobate brother among the mist, who had knocked him down and very near murdered him 
threatening dreadfully and with horrid oaths to throw him from the top of the cliff. The wrath of the great divine was kindled beyond measure. He cursed the aggressor in the name of the Most High and bound himself by an oath to cause that wicked one's transgressions return upon his own head sevenfold. But before he engaged further in the business of vengeance, he kneeled with his adopted son and committed the whole cause unto the Lord, whom he addressed as one coming breathing burning coals of juniper and casting his lightnings before him to destroy and root out all who had moved hand or tongue against the children of the promise. Thus did he arise confirmed and go forth to certain conquest. We cannot enter into the detail of the events that now occurred without forestalling a part of the narrative of one who knew all the circumstances, was deeply interested in them, and whose relation is of a higher value than anything that can be retailed out of the stores of tradition and old registers. But his narrative, being different from these, it was judged expedient to give the account as thus publicly handed down to us. Suffice it that, before evening, George was apprehended and lodged in jail on a criminal charge of an assault and battery to the shedding of blood, with the intent of committing fratricide. Then was the old laird in great consternation and blamed himself for treating the thing so lightly which seemed to have been gone about from the beginning so systematically and with an intent which the villains were now going to realize, namely, to get the young laird disposed of, and then his brother, in spite of the old gentleman's teeth, would be laird himself. Old Dahl now set his whole interest to work among the noblemen and lawyers of his party. His son's case looked exceedingly ill, owing to the former assault before witnesses and the unbecoming expressions made use of by him on that occasion, as well as from the present assault, which George did not deny, and for which no moving cause or motive could be made to appear. On his first declaration before the sheriff, matters looked no better. But then the sheriff was a Whig. It is well known how differently the people of the present day in Scotland view the cases of their own party men and those of opposite political principles. But this day is nothing to that in such matters, although, God knows, there are still sometimes bare-faced enough. It appeared, from all the witnesses in the first case, that the complainant was the first aggressor, that he refused to stand out of the way, though apprised of his danger, and when his brother came against him inadvertently, he had aimed a blow at him with his foot, which, if it had taken effect, would have killed him. But as to the story of the apparition in fair daylight, the flying from the face of it, the running foul of his brother pursuing him, and knocking him down, why, the judge smiled at the relation and saying, It was a very extraordinary story. He remanded George to prison, leaving the matter to the high court of justiciary. When the case came before the court, matters took a different turn. The constant and sullen attendance of the one brother upon the other excited suspicions, and these were in some manner confirmed when the guards at Queensbury House deported that the prisoner went by them on his way to the hill that morning, about twenty minutes before the complainant. And, when the latter passed, he asked if such a young man had passed before him, describing the prisoner's appearance to them, and that, on being answered in the affirmative, he mended his pace and fell a-running. The Lord Justice, on hearing this, 
asked the prisoner if he had any suspicions that his brother had a design on his life. He answered that all along, from the time of their first unfortunate meeting, his brother had dogged his steps so constantly and so unaccountably that he was convinced it was with some intent out of the ordinary course of events, and that if, as his lordship supposed, it was indeed his shadow that he had seen approaching him through the mist. Then, from the cowering and cautious manner that it advanced, there was no little doubt that his brother's design had been to push him headlong from the cliff that morning. A conversation then took place between the judge and the Lord Advocate. And, in the meantime, a bustle was seen in the hall on which the doors were ordered to be guarded, and behold, the precious Mr. R. Ringham was taken into custody, trying to make his escape out of court. Finally, it turned out that George was honorably acquitted, and young Ringham bound over to keep the peace, with heavy penalties and securities. That was a day of high exultation to George and his youthful associates, all of whom abhorred Ringham, and the evening being spent in great glee, it was agreed between Mr. Adam Gordon and George that their visit to the Highlands, though thus long delayed, was not to be abandoned. And though they had, through the machinations of an incendiary, lost the season of delight, they would still find plenty of sport in deer shooting. Accordingly, the day was set a second time for their departure, and on the day preceding that, all the party were invited by George to dine with him once more at the sign of the Black Bowl of Norway. Everyone promised to attend, anticipating nothing but festivity and joy. Alas! What short-sighted and provident creatures we are, all of us, and how often does the evening cup of joy lead to sorrow in the morning? The day arrived, the party of young noblemen and gentlemen met, and were as happy and jovial as men could be. George was never seen so brilliant, or so full of spirits and exulting to see so many gallant young chiefs and gentlemen about him, who all gloried in the same principles of loyalty. Perhaps this word should have been written disloyalty. He made speeches, gave toasts, and sung songs, all leaning slyly to the same side until a very late hour. By that time he had pushed the bottle so long and so freely that its fumes had taken possession of every brain to such a degree that they held Dame Reason rather at the staff's end, overbearing all her counsels and expostulations, and it was imprudently proposed by a wild inebriated spark and carried by a majority of voices that the whole party should adjourn to a bagnio for the remainder of the night. They did so and it appears from what follows that the house to which they retired must have been somewhere on the opposite side of the street to the Black Bull Inn, a little farther to the eastward. They had not been an hour in that house till some altercation chanced to arise between George Calwain and a Mr. Drummond, the younger son of a nobleman of distinction. It was perfectly casual, and no one thenceforward to this day, could ever tell what it was about. If it was not about the misunderstanding of some word or term that the one had uttered. However, it was, some high words passed between them. These were followed by threats, and in less than two minutes from the commencement of the quarrel, Drummond left the house in apparent displeasure hinting to the other that they too should settle that in a more convenient place. The company looked at one another, for all was over before any of them knew such a thing was begun. What the devil is the matter? cried one. What ails Drummond? cried another. 
Who has he quarreled with? asked the third. Don't know. Can't tell on my life. He has quarreled with his wine, I suppose, and is going to send it a challenge. Such were the questions, and such the answers that passed in the jovial party, and the matter was no more thought of. But in the course of a very short space, about the length which the ideas of the company were the next day at great variance, a sharp rap came to the door. It was opened by a female, but there, being a chain inside, she only saw one side of the person at the door. He appeared to be a young gentleman, in appearance like him, who had lately left the house, and asked in a low whispering voice if young Doll Castle was still in the house. The woman did not know. If he is, added he, pray tell him to speak with me for a few minutes. The woman delivered the message before all the party, among whom there were then sundry courteous ladies of noble distinction, and George, on receiving it, instantly rose from the side of one of them and said, In the hearing of them all, I will bet a hundred mercs that it is Drummond. Don't go to quarrel with him, George, said one. Bring him in with you, said another. George stepped out. The door was again bolted, the chain drawn across, and the inadvertent party, left within, thought no more of the circumstance till the morning, that the report had spread over the city that a young gentleman had been slain, on a little washing green at the side of the north lock, and at the very bottom of the close where this thoughtless party had been assembled. Several of them, on first hearing the report, basted to the dead room in the guardhouse, where the corpse had been deposited, and soon discovered the body to be that of their friend and late entertainer, George Cowain. Great were the consternation and grief of all concerned, and in particular of his old father and Miss Logan, for George had always been the sole hope and darling of both. And the news of the event paralyzed them so, as to render them incapable of all thought or exertion. The spirit of the old laird was broken by the blow, and he descended at once from a jolly, good-natured and active man to a mere dreveler, weeping over the body of his son, kissing his wound, his lips, and his cold brow alternately, denouncing vengeance on his murderers and lamenting that he himself had not met the cruel doom, so that the hope of his race might have been preserved. In short, finding that all further motive of action and object of concern or of love, here below, were forever removed from him. He abandoned himself to despair, and threatened to go down to the grave with his son. But, although he made no attempt to discover the murderers. The arm of justice was not idle, and it being evident to all that the crime must infallibly be brought home to young Drummond, some of his friends sought him out and compelled him, sorely against his will, to retire into concealment till the issue of the proof that should be led was made known. At the same time, he denied all knowledge of the incident with a resolution that astonished his intimate friends and relations, who to a man suspected him guilty. His father was not in Scotland, for I think it was said to me that this young man was second son to a John, Duke of Melfort, who lived abroad with the royal family of the Stuarts. But this young gentleman lived with the relations of his mother one of whom, an uncle, was a lord of session. These, having thoroughly effected his concealment, went away and listened to the evidence, and the examination of every new witness convinced them that their noble young relative was the slayer of his friend. All the young gentlemen of the party were examined, save Drummond, who, when sent for, could not be found which circumstance sorely confirmed the suspicions against him in the minds of judges and jurors, friends and enemies. 
and there is little doubt that the care of his relations in concealing him injured his character and his cause. The young gentleman of whom the party was composed varied considerably with respect to the quarrel between him and the deceased. Some of them had neither heard nor noted it. Others had, but not one of them could tell how it began. Some of them had heard the threat uttered by Drummond on leaving the house, and only one had noted him lay his hand on his sword. Not one of them could swear that it was Drummond who came to the door and desired to speak with the deceased. But the general impression on the minds of them all was to that effect, and one of the women swore that she heard the voice distinctly at the door, and every word that voice pronounced, and at the same time heard the deceased say that it was Drummond's. On the other hand, there were some evidences on Drummond's part, which Lord Craigie, his uncle, had taken care to collect. He produced the sword which his nephew had worn that night, on which there was neither blood nor blemish, and above all, he insisted on the evidence of a number of surgeons, who declared that both the wounds which the deceased had received had been given behind. One of these was below the left arm, and a slight one, the other was quite through the body, and both evidently inflicted with the same weapon, a two-edged sword, of the same dimensions as that worn by Drummond. Upon the whole, there was a division in the court, but a majority decided it. Drummond was pronounced guilty of the murder, outlawed for not appearing, and a high reward offered for his apprehension. It was with the greatest difficulty that he escaped on board of a small trading vessel, which landed him in Holland, and from thence, flying into Germany, he entered into the service of the Emperor Charles VI. Many regretted that he was not taken, and made to suffer the penalty due for such a crime, and the melancholy incident became a pulpit theme over a great part of Scotland being held up as a proper warning to youth to beware of such haunts of vice and depravity. The nurses of all that is precipitate, immoral, and base among mankind. After the funeral of this promising and excellent young man, his father never more held up his head. Miss Logan, with all her art, could not get him to attend to any worldly thing, or to make any settlement whatsoever of his affairs, save making her over a present of what disposable funds he had about him. As to his estates, when they were mentioned to him, he wished them all in the bottom of the sea, and himself along with them. But whenever she mentioned the circumstance of Thomas Drummond, having been the murderer of his son. He shook his head, and once made the remark that it was all a mistake, a gross and fatal error, but that God, who had permitted such a flagrant deed, would bring it to light in his own time and way. In a few weeks he followed his son to the grave, and the notorious Robert Ringham took possession of his estates as the lawful son of the late Laird, born in wedlock and under his father's roof. The investiture was celebrated by prayer, singing and psalms, and religious disputation. The late guardian and adopted father and the mother of the new Laird presided on the grand occasion, making a conspicuous figure in all the work of the day. And though the youth himself indulged rather more freely in the bottle than he had ever been seen to do before, it was agreed by all present that there had never been a festivity so sanctified within the great hall of Dahl Castle. Then, after due thanks returned, they parted rejoicing in spirit, which thanks, by the by, consisted wholly in telling the Almighty what he was, and informing 
with very particular precision, what they were who addressed him. For Ringham's whole system of popular declamation consisted, it seems, in this, to denounce all men and women to destruction, and then hold out hopes to his adherents that they were the chosen few, included in the promises, and who could never fall away. It would appear that this pharisaical doctrine is a very delicious one, and the most grateful of all others to the worst characters. But the ways of heaven are altogether inscrutable, and soar as far above and beyond the works and the comprehensions of man as the sun. Flaming in majesty is above the tiny boy's evening rocket. It is the controller of nature alone that can bring light out of darkness and order out of confusion. Who is he that causeth the mole from his secret path of darkness to throw up the gem, the gold, and the precious ore? The same that from the mouths of babes and sucklings can extract the perfection of praise, and who can make the most abject of his creatures instrumental in bringing the most hidden truths to light? End of section 7 Section 8 The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by himself by James Hogg this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Logan had never lost the thought of her late master's prediction that heaven would bring to light the truth concerning the untimely death of his son. She perceived that some strange conviction too horrible for expression, preyed on his mind from the moment that the fatal news reached him to the last of his existence. And in his last ravings, he uttered some incoherent words about justification by faith alone, an absolute and eternal predestination having been the ruin of his house. These, to be sure, were the words of superannuation and of the last and severest kind of it. But for all that, they sunk deep into Miss Logan's soul, and at last she began to think with herself. Is it possible the Ringhams, and the sophisticating wretch who is in conjunction with them, the mother of my late beautiful and amiable young master, can have effected his destruction? If so, I will spend my days and my little patrimony in endeavors to rake up and expose the unnatural deed. In all her outgoings and incomings, Mrs. Logan, as she was now styled, never lost sight of this one object. Every new disappointment only whetted her desire to fish up some particulars concerning it for she thought so long and so ardently upon it that by degrees it became settled in her mind as a sealed truth. And as a woman is always most jealous of her own sex in such matters, her suspicions were fixed on her greatest enemy, Mrs. Colwain, now the Lady Dalweger of Dal Castle. All was wrapped in a chaos of confusion and darkness, but at last, by dint of a thousand sly and secret inquiries, Mrs. Logan found out where Lady Dalcastle had been on the night that the murder happened, and likewise what company she had kept, as well as some of the comers and goers. And she had hopes of having discovered a clue, which, if she could keep hold of the thread, would lead her through darkness to the light of truth. Returning very late one evening from a convocation of family servants, which she had drawn together in order to fish something out of them, her maid having been in attendance on her all the evening, they found, on going home, 
that the house had been broken and a number of valuable articles stolen therefrom. Mrs. Logan had grown quite heartless before this stroke, having been altogether unsuccessful in her inquiries, and now she began to entertain some resolutions of giving up the fruitless search. In a few days thereafter, she received intelligence that her clothes and plate were mostly recovered, and that she for one was bound over to prosecute the depredator, provided the articles turned out to be hers, as libeled in the indictment, and as a king's evidence had given out. She was likewise summoned, or requested, I know not which, being ignorant of these matters to go as far as the town of Peebles in Tweedside, in order to survey these articles on such a day and make affidavit to their identity before the sheriff. She went accordingly, but on entering the town by the north gate, she was accosted by a poor girl in tattered apparel, who with great earnestness inquired if her name was not Mrs. Logan. On being answered in the affirmative, she said that the unfortunate prisoner in the toll booth requested her, as she valued all that was dear to her in life, to go and see her before she appeared in court at the hour of cause, as she, the prisoner, had something of the greatest moment to impart to her. Mrs. Logan's curiosity was excited, and she followed the girl straight to the toll booth who by the way said to her that she would find in the prisoner a woman of superior mind, who had gone through all the vicissitudes of life. She has been very unfortunate, and I fear very wicked, added the poor thing. But she is my mother, and God knows, with all her faults and failings, she has never been unkind to me. You, madam, have it in your power to save her. But she has wronged you, and therefore, if you will not do it for her sake, do it for mine, and the God of the fatherless will reward you. Mrs. Logan answered her with a cast of the head and a hem, and only remarked that, The guilty must not always be suffered to escape, or what a world must we be doomed to live in. She was admitted to the prison and found a tall, emaciated figure, who appeared to have once possessed a sort of masculine beauty in no ordinary degree, but was now considerably advanced in years. She viewed Mrs. Logan with a stern, steady gaze, as if reading her features as a margin to her intellect, and when she addressed her, it was not with that humility and agonized fervor which are natural for one in such circumstances to address to another who has the power of her life and death in her hands. I am deeply indebted to you for this timely visit, Mrs. Logan, said she. It is not that I value life, or because I fear death, that I have sent for you so expressly. But the manner of the death that awaits me has something peculiarly revolting in it to a female mind. Good God, when I think of being hung up, a spectacle to a gazing, gaping multitude, with numbers of which I have had intimacies and connections, that would render the moment of parting so hideous, that, believe me, it rends to flinders a soul born for another sphere than that in which it has moved had not the vile selfishness of a lordy fiend ruined all my prospects and all my hopes. Hear me, then, for I do not ask your pity. I only ask of you to look to yourself and behave with womanly prudence. If you deny this day that these goods are yours, there is no other evidence whatever against my life, and it is safe for the present. For, as for the word of the wretch who has betrayed me, it is of no avail. He has prevaricated so notoriously to save himself. If you deny them, you shall have them all again to the value of a mite, 
and more to the bargain. If you swear to the identity of them, the process will, one way and another, cost you the half of what they are worth. And what security have I for that? said Mrs. Logan. You have none but my word, said the other proudly, and that never yet was violated. If you cannot take that, I know the worst you can do. But I had forgot. I have a poor, helpless child without, waiting and starving about the prison door. Surely it was of her that I wished to speak. This shameful death of mine will leave her in a deplorable state. The girl seems to have candor and strong affections, said Mrs. Logan. I grievously mistake if such a child would not be a thousand times better without such a guardian and director. Then will you be so kind as to come to the grass market and see me put down, said the prisoner. I thought a woman would estimate a woman's and a mother's feelings when such a dreadful throw was at stake, at least in part. But you are callous and have never known any feelings but those of subordination to your old unnatural master. Alas, I have no cause of offense. I have wronged you, and justice must take its course. Will you forgive me before we part? Mrs. Logan hesitated, for her mind ran on something else, on which the other subjoined. No, you will not forgive me, I see. But you will pray to God to forgive me. I know you will do that. Mrs. Logan heard not this jeer, but looking at the prisoner with an absent and stupid stare, she said, Did you know my late master? Aye, that I did, and never for any good, said she. I knew the old and the young spark both, and was by when the latter was slain. This careless sentence affected Mrs. Logan in a most peculiar manner. A shower of tears burst from her eyes ere it was done, and when it was, she appeared like one bereaved of her mind. She first turned one way and then another, as if looking for something she had dropped. She seemed to think she had lost her eyes instead of her tears, and at length, as by instinct, she tottered close up to the prisoner's face, and looking wistfully and joyfully in it, said, with breathless earnestness, Pray, mistress, what is your name? My name is Arabella Calvert, said the other. Miss, mistress, or widow, as you choose, for I have been all the three, and that not once nor twice only. A, and something beyond all these. But as for you, you have never been anything. Aye, aye, and so you are Belle Calvert. Well, I thought so, I thought so, said Mrs. Logan, and helping herself to a seat, she came and sat down close by the prisoner's knee. So you are indeed Belle Calvert, so called once. Well, of all the world you are the woman whom I have longed and travailed the most to see. But you were invisible, a being to be heard of, not seen. There have been days, madam, returned she, when I was to be seen, and when there were few to be seen like me. But since that time, there have indeed been days on which I was not to be seen. My crimes have been great, but my sufferings have been greater so great that neither you nor the world can ever either know or conceive them. I hope they will be taken into account by the Most High. Mine have been crimes of utter desperation. But whom am I speaking to? You had better leave me to myself, mistress. Leave you to yourself? That I will be loath to do till you tell me where you were that night my young master was murdered. Where the devil would I was? Will that suffice you? Ah, it was a vile action, a night to be remembered that was. Won't you be going? I want to trust my daughter with a commission. 
No, Mrs. Calvert, you and I part not till you have divulged that mystery to me. You must accompany me to the other world, then, for you shall not have it in this. If you refuse to answer me, I can have you before a tribunal, where you shall be sifted to the soul. Such miserable inanity! What care I for your threatenings of a tribunal? I, who must soon stand before my last earthly one, what could the word of such a culprit avail? Or if it could, where is the judge that could enforce it? Did you not say that there was some mode of accommodating matters on that score? Yes, I prayed you to grant me my life, which is in your power. The saving of it would not have cost you a plaque, yet you refused to do it. The taking of it will cost you a great deal, and yet to that purpose you adhere. I can have no parley with such a spirit. I would not have my life in a present from its motions, nor would I exchange courtesies with its possessor. Indeed, Mrs. Calvert, since ever we met, I have been so busy thinking about who you might be that I know not what you have been proposing. I believe I meant to do what I could to save you, but once for all, Tell me everything that you know concerning that amiable young gentleman's death, and here is my hand. There shall be nothing wanting that I can effect for you. No, I despise all barter with such mean and selfish curiosity, and as I believe that passion is stronger with you than fear with me, we part on equal terms. Do your worst, and my secret shall go to the gallows and the grave with me. Mrs. Logan was now greatly confounded, and after proffering in vain to concede everything she could ask in exchange, for the particulars relating to the murder, she became the suppliant in her turn. But the unaccountable culprit, exulting in her advantage, laughed her to scorn, and finally, in a paroxysm of pride and impatience, called in the jailer and had her expelled ordering him in her hearing not to grant her admittance a second time on any pretense. Mrs. Logan was now hard put to it, and again driven almost to despair. She might have succeeded in the attainment of that she thirsted for most in life, so easily had she known the character with which she had to deal. Had she known to have soothed her high and afflicted spirit, but that opportunity was past, and the hour of examination at hand. She once thought of going and claiming her articles, as she at first intended, but then, when she thought again of the Ringham swaying it at Dahl Castle, where she had been wont to hear them held in such contempt, if not abhorrence, and perhaps of holding it by the most diabolical means, she was withheld from marring the only chance that remained of having a glimpse into that mysterious affair. Finally, she resolved not to answer to her name in the court, rather than to appear and assert a falsehood, which she might be called on to certify by oath. She did so, and heard the sheriff give orders to the officers to make inquiry for Miss Logan from Edinburgh, at the various places of entertainment in town, and to expedite her arrival in court, as things of great value were in dependence. She also heard the man who had turned King's evidence against the prisoner examined for the second time, and sifted most cunningly. His answers gave anything but satisfaction to the sheriff though Mrs. Logan believed them to be mainly truth. But there were a few questions and answers that struck her above all others. How long is it since Mrs. Calvert and you became acquainted? About a year and a half. State the precise time, if you please, the day or night, according to your remembrance. It was on the morning of the 28th of February, 1705. What time of the morning? 
Perhaps about one? So early as that? At what place did you meet then? It, it was at the foot of one of the north winds of Edinburgh. Was it by appointment that you met? No, it was not. For what purpose was it then? For no purpose. How is it that you chanced to remember the day and hour so minutely? If you met that woman whom you have accused merely by chance and for no manner of purpose, as you must have met others that night, perhaps to the amount of hundreds in the same way. I have good cause to remember it, my lord. What was that cause? No answer? You don't choose to say what that cause was? I, I am not at liberty to tell. The sheriff then descended to other particulars, all of which tended to prove that the fellow was an accomplished villain, and that the principal share of the atrocities had been committed by him. Indeed, the sheriff hinted that he suspected the only share Mrs. Calvert had in them was in being too much in his company, and too true to him. The case was remitted to the court of justiciary, but Mrs. Logan had heard enough to convince her that the culprits first met at the very spot and the very hour on which George Calwain was slain, and she had no doubt that they were incendiary set on by his mother, to forward her own and her darling son's way to opulence. Mrs. Logan was wrong, as will appear in the sequel, but her antipathy to Mrs. Calwain made her watch the event with all care. She never quitted Peebles as long as Belle Calvert remained there, and when she was removed to Edinburgh, the other followed. When the trial came on, Mrs. Logan and her maid were again summoned as witnesses before the jury, and compelled by the prosecutor for the crown to appear. The maid was first called, and when she came into the witness box, the anxious and hopeless looks of the prisoner were manifest to all. But the girl, whose name she said was Bessie Giles, answered in so flippant and fearless a way that the auditors were much amused. After a number of routine questions, the deputy advocate asked her if she was at home on the morning of the 5th of September last, when her mistress's house was robbed. Was I at home, say ye? Na, faith ye, lad. And I had been at home. There had been mare to dee. I would a hay ray sick a hellock. Where were you that morning? Where was I, say you? I was in the house where my mistress was, sitting, dozing, and half sleeping in the kitchen. I thought, eh, she would be setting out every minute, for two hours. And when you went home, what did you find? What found we? Be my sooth. We found a broken lock and tomb kits. Relate some of the particulars, if you please. Sir, the thieves did not stand upon particulars. They were hail-sale dealers in our best wares. I mean, what passed between your mistress and you on the occasion? What passed, say ye? Oh, there was not a muckle. I was in a great passion, but she was dung deutschified a wee. When she gave to put the key eye the door, up it flew to the fair wa. Bless ye, Jod, what's the meaning of this? quo she. The near o that I did, quo I, or may my shackle bane never turn another key. When we got the candle lighted, ah, uh, the house was in a hoed road. Bessie, my woman, quo she, we are baith ruined and undone creatures. The deal a bit, quo I that I deny positively. Hmm, to speak o less o my age being ruined and undone. I never had muckle except what was within a good jerkin, and let the thief ruin me there let we can. Do you remember aught else that your mistress said on the occasion? Did you hear her blame any person? 
Uh, she made a great deal of grumping and a groaning about the misfortune as she cat it. And I think she said, it was a part of the ruin, wrought by the riggins or some sick name. They'll hate ya, they'll hate ya, cried she, wringing her hands. Ay, hey, they'll hate in a hell wit, and they'll get them baith, a weel. That's I some satisfaction, quo I. Whom did she mean by the riggins? Do you know? I fancy they are some creatures that she has dreamt about, for I think there cannot be ill folks living as she calls them. Did you never hear say that the prisoner at the bar there, Mrs. Calvert, or Bell Calvert, was the robber of her house, or that she was one of the ringins? Never. Somebody told her lately that Bell Calvert robbed her house, but she did not believe it. Neither do I. What reasons have you for doubting it? Because it was nay woman's fingers that broke up the bolts and the locks that were torn open that night. Very pertinent, Bessie. Come then within the bar and look at these articles on the table. Did you ever see these silver spoons before? I hae seen some very like them, and we ever has seen silver spoons has done the same. Can you swear you never saw them before? Nah, nah, I wouldn't have swear to only silver spoons that ever wore made, unless I had put a private mark on them, we my ain hand, and that's what I never did to ain. See, they are marked with a C. Say, are all the spoons in Argyle? And the half of them in Edinburgh, I think. Hey, C is a very common letter, and so are the names that begin with. Lay them by, lay them by, and angie the poor woman her spoons again. They are marked with her a name, and I had little doubt that they are hers, and that she has seen better days. Ah, oh, God bless her heart, sighed the prisoner, and that blessing was echoed in the breathings of many a feeling breast. Did you ever see this gown before? Thank you. I had seen and very like it. Could you not swear that gown was your mistress's one? No, unless I saw her at it, and Kanji had paid for it. I am very scrupulous about an oath, like is an ill mark. Say I'll indeed that I would hardly swear to anything. But you say that gown is very like one your mistress used to wear. I never said sick a thing. It is like one I had seen her hay airing out on the hay rape, I the back green. It is very like, and I had seen Mrs. Butler in the grass market wearing too. I rather think it is the same. Bless you, sir. I wouldn't have swear to my ain forefinger if it had been as I laid out of my sight and brought in and laid out on that table. Perhaps you are not aware, girl that this scrupulousness of yours is likely to thwart the purposes of justice and bereave your mistress of property to the amount of a thousand mercs from the judge. I cannot help that, my lord. That's her lookout. For my part, I am resolved to keep a clear conscience till I be married at any rate. Look over these things and see if there is any one article among them which you can fix on as the property of your mistress. No, ain't no them, sir, no ain't them. An oath is an awful thing, especially when it is for life or death. Gee, the poor woman her things again, and let my mistress pick up the next she finds. That's my advice. When Mrs. Logan came into the box, the prisoner groaned and laid down her head but how she was astonished when she heard her deliver herself something to the following purport. That, whatever penalty she was doomed to abide, she was determined she would not bear witness against a woman's life, from a certain conviction that it could not be a woman who broke her house. I have no doubt that I may find some of my own things there, added she, but if they were found in her possession, she has been made a tool, or the dupe, of an infernal set, 
who shall be nameless here. I believe she did not rob me, and for that reason I will have no hand in her condemnation. The Judge This is the most singular perversion I have ever witnessed. Mrs. Logan, I entertain strong suspicions that the prisoner or her agents have made some agreement with you on this matter to prevent the course of justice. So far from that, my lord, I went into the jail at Peebles to this woman, whom I had never seen before, and proffered to withdraw my part in the prosecution, as well as my evidence, provided she would tell me a few simple facts. But she spurned at my offer, and had me turned insolently out of the prison, with orders to the jailer never to admit me again on any pretense. The prisoner's counsel, taking hold of this evidence, addressed the jury with great fluency, and finally the prosecution was withdrawn, and the prisoner dismissed from the bar with a severe reprimand for her past conduct and an exhortation to keep better company. End of Section 8 Section 9 the Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by himself, by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was not many days till a caddy came with a large parcel to Mrs. Logan's house which parcel he delivered into her hands, accompanied with a sealed note, containing an inventory of the articles, and a request to know if the unfortunate Arabella Calvert would be admitted to converse with Mrs. Logan. Never was there a woman so much overjoyed as Mrs. Logan was at this message. She returned compliments would be most happy to see her, and no article of the parcel should be looked at or touched till her arrival. It was not long till she made her appearance, dressed in somewhat better style than she had yet seen her, delivered her over the greater part of the stolen property, besides many things that either never had belonged to Mrs. Logan or that she thought proper to deny in order that the other might retain them. The tale that she told of her misfortunes was of the most distressing nature, and was enough to stir up all the tender as well as abhorrent feelings in the bosom of humanity. She had suffered every depredation in fame, fortune, and person. She had been imprisoned, she had been scourged and branded as an impostor, and all on account of her resolute and unmoving fidelity and truth to several of the very worst of men, every one of whom had abandoned her to utter destitution and shame. But this story we cannot enter on at present, as it would perhaps mar the thread of our story, as much as it did the anxious anticipations of Mrs. Logan who sat pining and longing for the relation that follows. Now, I know, Mrs. Logan, that you are expecting a detail of the circumstances relating to the death of Mr. George Cowain, and in gratitude for your unbounded generosity and disinterestedness, I will tell you all that I know, although, for causes that will appear obvious to you, I had determined never in life to divulge one circumstance of it. I can tell you, however, that you will be disappointed, for it was not the gentleman who was accused, found guilty, and would have suffered the utmost penalty of the law had he not made his escape. It was not he, I say, who slew your young master, nor had he any hand in it. I never thought he had. But pray, how do you come to know this? You shall hear. 
I had been abandoned in York by an artful and consummate fiend, and found guilty of being art and part concerned in the most heinous atrocities, and in his place suffered what I yet shudder to think of, I was banished the county, begged my way with my poor outcast child up to Edinburgh, and was there obliged, for the second time in my life, to betake myself to the most degrading of all means to support two wretched lives. I hired a dress and betook me, shivering to the high street, too well aware that my form and appearance would soon draw me suitors in now at that throng and intemperate time of the Parliament. On my very first stepping out to the street, a party of young gentlemen was passing. I heard by the noise they made, and the tenor of their speech, that they were more than mellow, and so I resolved to keep near them, in order, if possible, to make some of them my prey. But, just as one of them began to eye me, I was rudely thrust into a narrow close by one of the guardsmen. I had heard to what house the party was bound, for the men were talking exceedingly loud and making no secret of it. So I hasted down the close and round below to the one where their rendezvous was to be. But I was too late. They were all housed and the door bolted. I resolved to wait, thinking they could not all stay long. But I was perishing with famine and was like to fall down. The moon shone as bright as day, and I perceived, by a sign at the bottom of the close, that there was a small tavern of a certain description up two stairs there. I went up and called, telling the mistress of the house my plan. She approved of it mainly, and offered me her best apartment, provided I could get one of these noble mates to accompany me. She abused Lucky Suds, as she called her, at the inn where the party was, envying her huge profits, no doubt, and giving me afterwards something to drink for which I really felt exceedingly grateful in my need. I stepped downstairs in order to be on the alert. The moment that I reached the ground, the door of Lucky Sud's house opened and shut, and down came the Honorable Thomas Drummond, with hasty and impassioned strides his sword rattling at his heel. I accosted him in a soft and soothing tone. He was taken with my address, for he instantly stood still and gazed intently at me, then at the place, and then at me again. I beckoned him to follow me, which he did without further ceremony, and we soon found ourselves together in the best room of the house where everything was wretched, he still looked about him and at me, but all this while he had never spoken a word. At length, I asked if he would take any refreshments. If you please, said he. I asked what he would have, but he only answered, Whatever you choose, madam. If he was a taken with my address, I was much more taken with his, for he was a complete gentleman, and a gentleman will ever act as one. At length, he began as follows. I am utterly at a loss to account for this adventure, madam. It seems to me like enchantment, and I can hardly believe my senses. An English lady, I judge, and one who from her manner and address should belong to the first class of society, in such a place as this, is indeed a matter of wonder to me. At the foot of a close in Edinburgh, and at this time of the night. Surely it must have been no common reverse of fortune that reduced you to this. I wept, or pretended to do so, on which he added, Pray, madam, take heart. Tell me what has befallen you. And if I can do anything for you, in restoring you to your country or your friends, you shall command my interest. I had great need of a friend then, and I thought now was the time to secure one. 
So I began and told him the moving tale I have told you. But I soon perceived that I had kept by the naked truth too unvarnishedly, and thereby quite overshot my mark. When he learned that he was sitting in a wretched corner of an irregular house with a felon, who had so lately been scourged and banished as a swindler and impostor, his modest nature took the alarm, and he was shocked instead of being moved with pity. His eye fixed on some of the casual stripes on my arm, and from that moment he became restless and impatient to be gone. I tried some gentle arts to retain him, but in vain. So after paying both the landlady and me for pleasures he had neither tasted nor asked, he took his leave. I showed him downstairs, and just as he turned the corner of the next land, a man came rushing violently by him, exchanged looks with him, and came running up to me. He appeared in great agitation and was quite out of breath, and taking my hand in his, we ran upstairs together without speaking, and were instantly in the apartment I had left, where a stope of wine still stood untasted. Ah, this is fortunate, said my new spark, and helped himself. In the meanwhile, as our apartment was a corner one, and looked both east and north, I ran to the eastern casement to look after Drummond. Now, note me well. I saw him going eastward in his tartans and bonnet, and the gilded hilt of his claymore glittering in the moon. And at the very same time, I saw two men, the one in black and the other likewise in tartans, coming towards the steps from the opposite bank, by the foot of the lock and I saw Drummond and they eyeing each other as they passed. I kept view of him till he vanished towards Leith Wind, and by that time the two strangers had come close up under our window. This is what I wish you to pay particular attention to. I had only lost sight of Drummond, who had given me his name and address, for the short space of time that we took in running up one pair of short stairs. And during that space he had halted a moment, for, when I got my eye on him again, he had not crossed the mouth of the next entry, nor proceeded above ten or twelve paces, and at the same time I saw the two men coming down the bank on the opposite side of the lock, at about three hundred paces distance. Both he and they were distinctly in my view, and never within speech of each other, until he vanished into one of the winds leading towards the bottom of the high street, at which precise time the two strangers came below my window, so that it was quite clear he neither could be one of them nor have any communication with them. Yet mark me again, for... Of all things I have ever seen, this was the most singular. When I looked down at the two strangers, one of them was extremely like Drummond. So like was he that there was not one item in dress, form, feature, nor voice by which I could distinguish the one from the other. I was certain it was not he because I had seen the one going and the other approaching at the same time, and my impression at the moment was that I looked upon some spirit or demon in his likeness. I felt a chillness creep all around my heart. My knees tottered, and withdrawing my head from the open casement that lay in the dark shade, I said to the man who was with me, Good God, what is this? What is it, my dear? said he, as much alarmed as I was. As I live, there stands an apparition, said I. He was not so much afraid when he heard me say so, and peeping cautiously out, he looked and listened a while, and then, drawing back, he said in a whisper, They are both living men, and one of them is he I passed at the corner. 
That he is not, said I emphatically. To that I will make oath. He smiled and shook his head, and then added, I never then saw a man before whom I could not know again, particularly if he was the very last I had seen. But what matters it whether it be or not, as it is no concern of ours? Let us sit down and enjoy ourselves. But it does matter a very great deal with me, sir, said I. Bless me, my head is giddy, my breath quite gone, and I feel as if I were surrounded with fiends. Who are you, sir? You shall know that ere we two part, my love, said he. I cannot conceive why the return of this young gentleman to the spot he so lately left should decompose you. I suppose he got a glance of you as he passed, and has returned to look after you, and that is the whole secret of the matter. If you will be so civil as to walk out and join him then, it will oblige me hugely, said I, for I never in my life experienced such boding apprehensions of evil company. I cannot conceive how you should come up here without asking my permission. Will it please you to be gone, sir? I was within an ace of prevailing. He took out his purse. I need not say more. I was bribed to let him remain. Ah, had I kept my frail resolution of dismissing him at that moment, what a world of shame and misery had been invited. But that, though uppermost still in my mind, has nothing to do here. When I peeped over again, the two men were disputing in a whisper, the one of them in violent agitation and terror, and the other upbraiding him and urging him on to some desperate act. At length I heard the young man in the highland garb say indignantly, Hush, recreant! It is God's work which you are commissioned to execute, and it must be done! But if you positively decline it, I will do it myself, and do you beware of the consequences. Oh, I will, I will, cried the other in black clothes, in a wretched, beseeching tone. You shall instruct me in this, as in all things else. I thought all this while I was closely concealed from them, and wondered not a little when he and Tartans gave me a sly nod, as much as to say, what do you think of this? or take note of what you see, or something to that effect, from which I perceive that, whatever he was about, he did not wish it to be kept a secret. For all that, I was impressed with a terror and anxiety that I could not overcome. But it only made me mark every event with the more intense curiosity. The Highlander whom I still could not help regarding as the evil genius of Thomas Drummond, performed every action as with the quickness of thought. He concealed the youth in black in a narrow entry, a little to the westward of my windows, and as he was leading him across the moonlit green by the shoulder, I perceived for the first time that both of them were armed with rapiers. He pushed him without resistance into the dark shaded close, made another signal to me, and hasted up the close to Lucky Sutter's door. The city and the morning were so still that I heard every word that was uttered on putting my head out a little. He knocked at the door sharply, and after waiting a considerable space, the bolt was drawn, and the door, as I conceived, edged up as far as the massy chain would let it. Is young Dull Castle still in the house? said he sharply. I did not hear the answer, but I heard him say shortly after, If he is, pray tell him to speak with me for a few minutes. He then withdrew from the door and came slowly down the close, in a lingering manner, looking oft behind him. Dull Castle came out, advanced a few steps after him, and then stood still, as if hesitating whether or not he should call out a friend to accompany him. 
And that instant, the door behind him was closed, chained, and the iron bolt drawn. On hearing of which, he followed his adversary without further hesitation. As he passed below my window, I heard him say, I beseech you, Tom, let us do nothing in this matter rashly. But I could not hear the answer of the other, who had turned the corner. I roused up my drowsy companion, who was leaning on the bed, and we both looked together from the north window. We were in the shade, but the moon shone full on the two young gentlemen. Young Doll Castle was visibly the worse of liquor, and his back being turned towards us, he said something to the other which I could not make out, although he spoke a considerable time, and from his tones and gestures appeared to be reasoning. When he had done, the tall young man in the tartans drew his sword, and his face being straight to us, we heard him say distinctly, No more words about it, George, if you please. But if you be a man, as I take you to be, draw your sword, and let us settle it here. Dull Castle drew his sword, without changing his attitude. But he spoke with more warmth, for we heard his words. Think you that I fear you, Tom? Be assured, sir, I would not fear ten of the best of your name at each other's backs. All that I want is to have friends with us to see fair play. For if you close with me, you are a dead man. The other stormed at these words. You are a braggart, sir, cried he. A wretch! A blot on the cheek of nature! A blight on the Christian world! A reprobate! I'll have your soul, sir! You must play at tennis and put down elect brethren in another world tomorrow. As he said this, he brandished his rapier, exciting Dull Castle to offense. He gained his point. The latter, who had previously drawn, advanced upon his vaporing and licentious antagonist, and a fierce combat ensued. My companion was delighted beyond measure, and I could not keep him from exclaiming, loud enough to have been heard. That's grand! That's excellent! For me, my heart quaked like an aspen. Young Doll Castle either had a decided advantage over his adversary, or else the other thought proper to let him have it, for he shifted and swore and flitted from Doll Castle's thrust like a shadow, uttering oftentimes our sarcastic laugh that seemed to provoke the other beyond all bearing. At one time, he would spring away to a great distance, then advance again on young Doll Castle with the swiftness of lightning. But that young hero always stood his ground and repelled the attack. He never gave way, although they fought nearly twice round the bleaching green, which you know is not a very small one. At length, they fought close up to the mouth of the dark entry where the fellow in black stood all this while concealed. And then the combatant in tartans closed with his antagonist, or pretended to do so. But the moment they began to grapple, he wheeled about, turning Colwain's back towards the entry, and then cried out, Ha! Hell has it, my friend! My friend! That moment, the fellow in black rushed from his cover with his drawn rapier and gave the brave young doll castle two deadly wounds in the back as quick as arm could thrust, both of which I thought pierced through his body. He fell, and rolling himself on his back, he perceived who it was that had slain him thus foully and said with a dying emphasis, which I never heard equaled, Oh. Dog of hell, it is you who has done this. He articulated some more, which I could not hear from other sounds, for the moment that the man in black inflicted the deadly wound, my companion called out, That's unfair, you rip! That's damnable! To strike a brave fellow behind! One at a time, you cowards! Etc. 
To all which the unnatural fiend in the tartans answered with a loud exulting laugh. And then, taking the poor paralyzed murderer by the bow of the arm, he hurried him in the dark entry once more, where I lost sight of them forever. End of Section 9 Section 10 The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Before this time, Mrs. Logan had risen up and when the narrator had finished, she was standing with her arms stretched upwards at their full length, and her visage turned down, on which were portrayed the lines of the most absolute horror. The dark suspicions of my late benefactor have been just, and his last prediction is fulfilled, cried she. The murderer of the accomplished George Calwain has been his own brother, Set on, there is little doubt, by her who bear them both, and her directing angel, the self-justified bigot. Aye, and yonder they sit, enjoying the luxury so dearly purchased, with perfect impunity. If the Almighty do not hurl them down, blasted with shame and confusion, there is no hope of retribution in this life. And by his might, I will be the agent to accomplish it. Why did the man not pursue the foul murderers? Why did he not raise the alarm and call the watch? He, the wretch, he durst not move from the shelter he had obtained. No, not for the soul of him. He was pursued for his life, at the moment when he first flew into my arms. But I did not know it. No, I did not then know him. May the curse of heaven and the blight of hell settle on the detestable wretch. He pursued for the sake of justice? No. His efforts have all been for evil, but never for good. But I raised the alarm. Miserable and degraded as I was, I pursued and raised the watch myself. Have you not heard the name of Bell Calvert coupled with that hideous and mysterious affair? Yes, I have. In secret, often I have heard it. But how came it that you could never be found? How came it that you never appeared in defense of the Honorable Thomas Drummond? You! the only person who could have justified him. I could not, for I then fell under the power and guidance of a wretch who durst not for the soul of him be brought forward in the affair. And what was worse, his evidence would have overborne mine, for he would have sworn that the man who called out and fought Colwain was the same he met leaving my apartment, and there was an end of it. And moreover, it is well known that this same man, this wretch of whom I speak, never mistook one man for another in his life, which makes the mystery of the likeness between this incendiary and Drummond the more extraordinary. If it was Drummond, after all that you have asserted, then are my surmises still wrong? There is nothing of which I can be more certain than that it was not Drummond. We have nothing on earth but our senses to depend upon. If these deceive us, what are we to do? I own I cannot account for it, nor ever shall be able to account for it as long as I live. Could you know the man in black, if you saw him again? I think I could, if I saw him walk or run. His gait was very particular. He walked as if he had been flat-soled, and his legs made of steel, without any joints in his feet or ankles. 
The very same. The very same. The very same. Pray, will you take a few days' journey into the country with me to look at such a man? You have preserved my life, and for you I will do anything. I will accompany you with pleasure, and I think I can say that I will know him, for his form left an impression on my heart not soon to be effaced. But of this I am sure, that my unworthy companion will recognize him, and that he will be able to swear to his identity every day as long as he lives. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, Mrs. Calvert, where is he? Where is he? He is the wretch whom you heard giving me up to the death, who, after experiencing every mark of affection that a poor, ruined being could confer, and after committing a thousand atrocities of which she was ignorant, became an informer to save his diabolical life, and attempted to offer up mine as a sacrifice for all. We will go by ourselves first, and I will tell you if it is necessary to send any farther. The two dames, the very next morning, dressed themselves like country goodwives, and hiring two stout ponies furnished with pillions, they took their journey westward, and the second evening after leaving Edinburgh, they arrived at the village about two miles below Dahl Castle, where they alighted. But Mrs. Logan, being anxious to have Mrs. Calvert's judgment, without either hint or preparation, took care not to mention that they were so near to the end of their journey. In conformity with this plan, she said, after they had sat a while, Hey ho, but I am weary. What, suppose we should rest a day here before we proceed farther on our journey? Mrs. Calvert was leaning on the casement and looking out when her companion addressed these words to her, and by far too much engaged to return any answer, for her eyes were riveted on two young men who approached from the farther end of the village, and at length, turning round her head, she said, with the most intense interest, Proceed farther on our journey, did you say? That we need not do, for as I live, here comes the very man. Mrs. Logan ran to the window, and behold, there was indeed Robert Ringham Colwain, now the laird of Dahl Castle, coming forward almost below their window, walking arm in arm with another young man, and as the two passed, the latter looked up and made a sly signal to the two dames, biting his lip, winking with his left eye, and nodding his head. Mrs. Calvert was astonished at the recognizance, the young man's former companion having made exactly such another signal on the night of the duel by the light of the moon. And it struck her, moreover, that she had somewhere seen this young man's face before. She looked after him, and he winked over his shoulder to her. But she was prevented from returning his salute by her companion, who uttered a loud cry, between a groan and shriek, and fell down on the floor with a rumble, like a wall that had suddenly been undermined. She had fainted quite away, and required all her companion's attention during the remainder of the evening for she had scarcely ever well recovered out of one fit before she fell into another, and in the short intervals she raved like one distracted or in a dream. After falling into a sound sleep by night, she recovered her equanimity, and the two began to converse seriously on what they had seen. Mrs. Calvert averred that the young man who passed next to the window was the very man who stabbed George Cowain in the back, and she said she was willing to take her oath on it at any time when required, and was certain, if the wretch Ridsley saw him, that he would make oath to the same purport, for that his walk was so peculiar 
no one of common discernment could mistake it. Mrs. Logan was in great agitation and said, It is what I have suspected all along, and what I am sure my late master and benefactor was persuaded of, and the horror of such an idea cut short his days. That wretch, Mrs. Calvert, is the born brother of him he murdered, sons of the same mother they were, whether or not of the same father, the Lord only knows. But, oh, Mrs. Calvert, that is not the main thing that has discomposed me and shaken my nerves to pieces at this time. Who do you think the young man was who walked in his company tonight? I cannot for my life recollect, but I am convinced I have seen the same fine form and face before. And did not he seem to know us, Mrs. Calvert? You, who are able to recollect things as they happened, did he not seem to recollect us and make signs to that effect? He did indeed, and apparently with great good humor. Oh, Mrs. Calvert, hold me, else I shall fall into hysterics again. Who is he? Who is he? Tell me who you suppose he is, for I cannot say my own thought. On my life, I cannot remember. Did you note the appearance of the young gentleman you saw slain that night? Do you recollect aught of the appearance of my young master, George Calwain? Mrs. Calvert sat silent and stared the other mildly in the face. Their looks encountered, and there was an unearthly amazement that gleamed from each, which, meeting together, caught real fire, and returned the flame to their heated imaginations, till the two associates became like two statues, with their hands spread, their eyes fixed, and their chops fallen down upon their bosoms. An old woman who kept the lodging house, having been called in before when Mrs. Logan was faintish, chanced to enter at this crisis with some cordial and seeing the state of her lodgers, she caught the infection and fell into the same rigid and statue-like appearance. No scene more striking was ever exhibited, and if Mrs. Calvert had not resumed strength of mind to speak and break the spell, it is impossible to say how long it might have continued. It is he, I believe, said she, uttering the words as it were inwardly. It can be none other but he. But no, it is impossible. I saw him stabbed through and through the heart. I saw him roll backward on the green in his own blood, utter his last words, and groan away his soul. Yet, if it is not he, who can it be? It is he, cried Mrs. Logan hysterically. Yes, yes, it is he, cried the landlady in unison. It is who, said Mrs. Calvert. Whom do you mean, mistress? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. I was affrighted. Hold your peace till you recover your senses, and tell me, if you can, who that young gentleman is who keeps company with the new laird of Dahl Castle. Oh, it is he, it is he screamed Mrs. Logan, wringing her hands. Oh, it is he! It is he! cried the landlady, wringing hers. Mrs. Calvert turned the ladder gently and civilly out of the apartment, observing that there seemed to be some infection in the air of the room, and she would be wise for herself to keep out of it. The two dames had a restless and hideous night. Sleep came not to their relief, for their conversation was wholly about the dead, who seemed to be alive, and their minds were wandering and groping in a chaos of mystery. Did you attend to his corpse, and know that he positively died and was buried? said Mrs. Calvert. Oh, yes, from the moment that his fair but mangled corpse was brought home, I attended it 
till that when it was screwed in the coffin. I washed the long strips of blood from his lifeless form on both sides of the body. I bathed the livid wound that passed through his generous and gentle heart. There was one through the flesh of his left side, too, which had bled mostly outward of them all. I bathed them and bandaged them up with wax and perfumed ointment, but still the blood oozed through all, so that when he was laid in the coffin, he was like one newly murdered. My brave, my generous young master, he was always as a son to me, and no son was ever more kind or more respectful to a mother. But he was butchered. He was cut off from the earth, ere he had well reached to manhood, most barbarously and unfairly slain. And how is it, how can it be, that we again see him here, walking arm in arm with his murderer? The thing cannot be, Mrs. Logan. It is a fantasy of our disturbed imaginations. Therefore, let us compose ourselves till we investigate this matter farther. It cannot be in nature. That is quite clear, said Mrs. Logan. Yet, how it should be that I should think so? I, who knew and nursed him from his infancy. There lies the paradox. As you said once before, we have nothing but our senses to depend on. And if you and I believe that we see a person, why, we do see him. Whose word or whose reasoning can convince us against our own senses? We will disguise ourselves as poor women selling a few country wares, and we will go up to the hall and see what is to see, and hear what we can hear, for this is a weighty business in which we are engaged, namely to turn the vengeance of the law upon an unnatural monster, and we will further learn if we can, who this is that accompanies him. Mrs. Calvert acquiesced, and the two dames took their way to Doll Castle, with baskets well furnished with trifles. They did not take the common path from the village, but went about, and approached the mansion by a different way. But it seemed as if some overruling power ordered it that they should miss no chance of attaining the information they wanted. For er, ever they came within a half mile of Doll Castle, they perceived the two ewes coming as to meet them, on the same path. The road leading from Doll Castle towards the northeast, is all the country knows, goes along a dark bank of brushwood called the Boggle Hooch. It was by this track that the two women were going, and when they perceived the two gentlemen meeting them, they turned back, and the moment they were out of their sight, they concealed themselves in a thicket close by the road. They did this because Mrs. Logan was terrified for being discovered, and because they wished to reconnoiter without being seen. Mrs. Calvert now charged her whatever she saw or whatever she heard, to put on a resolution and support it. For if she fainted there and was discovered, what was to become of her? The two young men came on in earnest and vehement conversation. But the subject they were on was a terrible one and hardly fit to be repeated in the face of a Christian community. Ringham was disputing the boundlessness of the true Christian's freedom and expressing doubts that, chosen as he knew he was from all eternity, still it might be possible for him to commit acts that would exclude him from the limits of the covenant. The other argued, with mighty fluency, that the thing was utterly impossible and altogether inconsistent with eternal predestination. The arguments of the latter prevailed, and the laird was driven to sullen silence. But to the women's utter surprise, 
as the conquering disputant passed, he made a signal of recognizance through the brambles to them, as formerly, and that he might expose his associate fully. And in his true colors, he led him backwards and forwards by the women more than twenty times, making him to confess both the crimes that he had done and those he had in contemplation. At length he said to him, Assuredly, I saw some strolling vagrant women on this walk, my dear friend. I wish we could find them, for there is little doubt that they are concealed here in your woods. I wish we could find them, answered Ringham. We would have fine sport maltreating and abusing them. That we should, that we should. Now tell me, Robert, if you found a malevolent woman, the latent enemy of your prosperity, lurking in these woods to betray you, what would you inflict on her? I would tear her to pieces with my dogs and feed them with her flesh. Oh, my dear friend, there is an old strumpet who lived with my unnatural father, whom I hold in such utter detestation that I stand constantly in dread of her and would sacrifice the half of my estate to shed her blood. What will you give me if I will put her in your power? and give you a fair and genuine excuse for making away with her, one for which you shall answer at the bar, here or hereafter. I should like to see the vile hag put down. She is in possession of the family plate. That is mine by right, as well as a thousand valuable relics, and great riches besides, all of which the old profligate gifted shamefully away, and it is said, besides all these, that she has sworn my destruction. She has, she has, but I see not how she can accomplish that, seeing the deed was done so suddenly, and in the silence of the night. It was said there were some onlookers, but where shall we find that disgraceful Miss Logan? I will show you her by and by, but will you then consent to the other meritorious deed? Come, be a man, and throw away scruples. If you can convince me that the promise is binding, I will. Then step this way, till I give you a piece of information. They walked a little way out of hearing, but went not out of sight, therefore. Though the women were in a terrible quandary, they durst not stir for they had some hopes that this extraordinary person was on a mission of the same sort with themselves, knew of them, and was going to make use of their testimony. Mrs. Logan was several times on the point of falling into a swoon. So much did the appearance of the young man impress her, until her associate covered her face that she might listen without embarrassment. But this latter dialogue roused different feelings within them, namely, those arising from eminent personal danger. They saw his waggish associate point out the place of their concealment to Ringham, who came towards them, out of curiosity, to see what his friend meant by what he believed to be a joke, manifestly without crediting it in the least degree. When he came running away, the other called after him. If she is too hard for you, call to me. As he said this, he hasted out of sight, in the contrary direction, apparently much delighted with the joke. Ringham came rushing through the thicket impetuously, to the very spot where Mrs. Logan lay squatted. She held the wrapping close about her head, but he tore it off and discovered her. The curse of God be on thee, said he. What fiend has brought thee here? And for what purpose art thou come? But whatever has brought thee, I have thee. And with that, he seized her by the throat. The two women, when they heard what jeopardy they were in from such a wretch, 
had squatted among the underwood at a small distance from each other, so that he had never observed Mrs. Calvert. But no sooner had he seized her benefactor than, like a wildcat, she sprung out of the thicket and had both hands fixed at his throat. One of them twisted in his stock in a twinkling, she brought him back over among the brushwood, and the two, fixing on him like two harpies, mastered him with ease. Then, indeed, was he woefully beset. He deemed for a while that his friend was at his back, and turning his bloodshot eyes towards the path, he attempted to call. But there was no friend there and the women cut short his cries by another twist of his stalk. Now, gallant and rightful laird of Dahl Castle, said Mrs. Logan, what hast thou to say for thyself? Lay thy account to dree the weird thou hast so well earned. Now shalt thou suffer due to penance for murdering thy brave and only brother. Thou liest, thou hag of the pit! I touch not my brother's life. I saw thee do it with these eyes that now look thee in the face. Ay, eh, when his back was to thee too, and while he was hotly engaged with thy friend, said Mrs. Calvert. I heard thee confess it again and again this same hour, said Mrs. Logan. Ay, eh, and so did I said her companion. Murder will out, though the Almighty should lend hearing to the ears of the willow and speech to the seven tongues of the woodruff. You are liars and witches, said he, foaming with rage, and creatures fitted from the beginning for eternal destruction. I'll have your bones and your blood sacrificed on your cursed altars. Oh, Gilmartin, Gilmartin, where art thou now? Here, here is the proper food for blessed vengeance. Hello, ah! There was no friend, no Gil Martin there to hear or assist him. He was in the two women's mercy, but they used it with moderation. They mocked, they tormented, and they threatened him. But finally, after putting him in great terror, they bound his hands behind his back, and his feet fast with long straps of garters, which they chanced to have in their baskets, to prevent him from pursuing them till they were out of his reach. As they left him, which they did in the middle of the path, Mrs. Calvert said, We could easily put an end to thy sinful life, but our hands shall be free of thy blood. Nevertheless, thou art still in our power, and the vengeance of thy country shall overtake thee, thou mean and cowardly murderer. Ay, and that more suddenly than thou art aware. End of section 10section 11 the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner written by himself by james hogg this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the women posted to edinburgh and as they put themselves under the protection of an English merchant, who was journeying thither with twenty horses laden and armed servants, so they had scarcely any conversation on the road. When they arrived at Mrs. Logan's house, then they spoke of what they had seen and heard, and agreed that they had sufficient proof to condemn young Ringham who they thought richly deserved the severest doom of the law. I never in my life saw any human being, said Mrs. Calvert, whom I thought so like a fiend. 
If a demon could inherit flesh and blood, that youth is precisely such a being as I could conceive that demon to be. The depth and the malignity of his eyes is hideous. His breath is like the airs from a charnel house, and his flesh seems fading from his bones, as if the worm that never dies were gnawing it away already. He was always repulsive, in every way repulsive, said the other. But he is now indeed altered greatly to the worse. While we were hand-fasting him, I felt his body to be feeble and emaciated. But yet I know him to be so puffed up with spiritual pride that I believe he weans every one of his actions justified before God. And instead of having stings of conscience for these, he takes great merit to himself in having affected them. Still. My thoughts are less about him than the extraordinary being who accompanies him. He does everything with so much ease and indifference, so much velocity and effect, that all bespeak him an adept in wickedness. The likeness to my late, hapless young master is so striking that I can hardly believe it to be a chance model and I think he imitates him in everything for some purpose or some effect on his sinful associate. Do you know that he is so like in every liniment, look, and gesture that against the clearest light of reason I cannot in my mind separate the one from the other and have a certain indefinable expression on my mind that they are one and the same being? or that the one was a prototype of the other. If there is an earthly crime, said Mrs. Calvert, for the due punishment of which the Almighty may be supposed to subvert the order of nature, it is fratricide. But tell me, dear friend, did you remark to what the subtle and hellish villain was endeavoring to prompt the assassin? No. I could not comprehend it. My senses were altogether so bewildered that I thought they had combined to deceive me, and I gave them no credit. Then hear me. I am almost certain he was using every persuasion to induce him to make away with his mother, and I likewise conceive that I heard the incendiary give his consent. This is dreadful. Let us speak and think no more about it, till we see the issue. In the meantime, let us do that which is our bounden duty. Go and divulge all that we know relating to this foul murder. Accordingly, the two women went to Sir Thomas Wallace of Craigie, the Lord Justice Clerk, who was, I think, either uncle or grandfather to young Drummond, who was outlawed, and obliged to fly his country on account of Colwain's death. And to that gentleman they related every circumstance of what they had seen and heard. He examined Calvert very minutely, and seemed deeply interested in her evidence. Said he knew she was relating the truth, and in testimony of it, brought a letter of young Drummond's from his desk wherein that young gentleman, after protesting his innocence in the most forcible terms, confessed having been with such a woman in such a house after leaving the company of his friends, and that, on going home, Sir Thomas's servant had let him in, in the dark, and from these circumstances he found it impossible to prove an alibi. He begged of his relative, if ever an opportunity offered, to do his endeavor to clear up that mystery and remove the horrid stigma from his name in his country and among his kin of having stabbed a friend behind his back. Lord Craigie, therefore, directed the two women to the proper authorities. 
and after hearing their evidence there, it was judged proper to apprehend the present laird of Dull Castle and bring him to his trial. But before that, they sent the prisoner in the toll booth, he who had seen the whole transaction along with Mrs. Calvert, to take a view of Ringham privately. And his discrimination being so well known as to be proverbial all over the land, they determined secretly to be ruled by his report. They accordingly sent him on a pretended mission of legality to Dull Castle, with orders to see and speak with the proprietor, without giving him a hint what was wanted. On his return, they examined him, and he told them that he found all things at the place in utter confusion and dismay. That the lady of the place was missing, and could not be found dead or alive. On being asked if he had ever seen the proprietor before, he looked astounded and unwilling to answer. But it came out that he had, and that he had once seen him kill a man on such a spot at such an hour. Officers were then dispatched without delay to apprehend the monster and bring him to justice. On these going to the mansion and inquiring for him, they were told he was at home, on which they stationed guards and searched all the premises, but he was not to be found. It was in vain that they overturned beds, raised floors, and broke open closets. Robert Ringham Colwain was lost once and forever. His mother was also lost, and strong suspicions attached to some of the farmers and house servants to whom she was obnoxious, relating to her disappearance. The Honorable Thomas Drummond became a distinguished officer in the Austrian service, and died in the memorable year for Scotland, 1715. And this is all with which history Justiciary records and tradition furnish me relating to these matters. I have now the pleasure of presenting my readers with an original document of a most singular nature, and preserved for their perusal in a still more singular manner. I offer no remarks on it, and make as few additions to it, leaving everyone to judge for himself. We have heard much of the rage of fanaticism in former days, but nothing to this. End of Part 1 The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Audiobook Recording by Claude Stewart Section 12 Part 2 the Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Sinner Written by himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My life has been a life of trouble and turmoil, of change and vicissitude of anger and exaltation, of sorrow and of vengeance. My sorrows have all been for a slighted gospel, and my vengeance has been wreaked on its adversaries. Therefore, in the might of heaven, I will sit down and write. I will let the wicked of this world know what I have done in the faith of the promises, and justification by grace, that they may read and tremble and bless their gods of silver and gold, that the minister of heaven was removed from their sphere before their blood was mingled with their sacrifices. I was born an outcast in the world, in which I was destined to act so conspicuous a part. 
My mother was a burning and a shining light in the community of Scottish worthies, and in the days of her virginity had suffered much in the persecution of the saints. But it so pleased heaven that, as a trial of her faith, she was married to one of the wicked, a man all over spotted with the leprosy of sin. As well might they have conjoined fire and water together, in hopes that they would consort and amalgamate as purity and corruption. She fled from his embraces the first night after their marriage, and from that time forth his inequities so galled her upright heart that she quitted his society altogether, keeping her own apartments in the same house with him. I was the second son of this unhappy marriage, and ere ever I was born, my father, according to the flesh, disclaimed all relation or connection with me, and all interest in me, save what the law compelled him to take, which was to grant me a scanty maintenance. And had it not been for a faithful minister of the gospel, my mother's early instructor, I should have remained an outcast from the church visible. He took pity on me, admitting me not only into that, but into the bosom of his own household and ministry also. And to him I am indebted under heaven for the high conceptions and glorious discernment between good and evil, right and wrong, which I attained even at an early age. It was he who directed my studies aright, both in the learning of the ancient fathers and the doctrines of the Reformed Church, and designed me for his assistant and successor in the Holy Office. I missed no opportunity of perfecting myself particularly in all the minute points of theology in which my reverend father and mother took a great delight. But at length, I acquired so much skill that I astonished my teachers and made them gaze at one another. I remember that it was the custom in my patron's house to ask questions of the singular catechism round every Sabbath night. He asked the first, my mother the second, and so on, everyone saying the question asked, and then asking the next. It fell to my mother to ask effectual calling at me. I said the answer with propriety and emphasis. Now, madam, added I, my question to you is, what is ineffectual calling? Ineffectual calling? There is no such thing, Robert, said she. But there is, madam, said I. And that answer proves how much you say these fundamental precepts by rote and without any consideration. Ineffectual calling is the outward call of the gospel without any effect on the hearts of unregenerated and impenitent sinners. Have not all these the same calls, warnings, doctrines, and reproofs that we have? And is not this ineffectual calling? Has not Arden Ferry the same? Has not Patrick McClure the same? Has not the laird of Dal Castle and his reprobate heir the same? And will any tell me that this is not ineffectual calling? What a wonderful boy he is, said my mother. I'm feared he turned out to be a conceited gawk, said old Barnett, the minister's man. No, said my pastor and father as I shall henceforth denominate him. No, Barnett, he is a wonderful boy, and no marvel, for I have prayed for these talents to be bestowed on him from his infancy. And do you think that heaven would refuse a prayer so disinterested? 
No, it is impossible. But my dread is, madam, continued he, turning to my mother, that he is yet in the bond of inequity. God forbid, said my mother. I have struggled with the Almighty long and hard, continued he, but have as yet no certain token of acceptance in his behalf. I have indeed fought a hard fight, but have been repulsed by him who hath seldom refused my request. Although I cited his own words against him, and endeavored to hold him at his promise, he hath so many turnings in the supremacy of his power that I have been rejected. How dreadful is it to think of our darling being still without the pale of the covenant! But I have vowed a vow, and in that there is hope. My heart quaked with terror when I thought of being still living in a state of reprobation, subjected to the awful issues of death, judgment, and eternal misery by the slightest accident or casualty. And I set about the duty of prayer myself with the utmost earnestness. I prayed three times every day and seven times on the Sabbath. But the more frequently and fervently that I prayed, I sinned still the more. About this time, and for a long period afterwards, amounting to several years, I lived in a hopeless and deplorable state of mind. For I said to myself, If my name is not written in the book of life from all eternity, it is in vain for me to presume that either vows or prayers of mine, or those of all mankind combined, can ever procure its insertion now. I had come under many vows, most solemnly taken, every one of which I had broken, and I saw with the intensity of juvenile grief that there was no hope for me. I went on sinning every hour, and all the while, most strenuously warring against sin, and repenting of every one transgression as soon after the commission of it, as I got leisure to think. But oh, what a wretched state this unregenerated state is, in which every effort after righteousness only aggravates our offenses. I found it vanity to contend. For after communing with my heart, the conclusion was as follows. If I could repent me of all my sins, and shed tears of blood for them, still have I not a load of original transgression pressing on me that is enough to crush me to the lowest hell? I may be angry with my first parents for having sinned, but how I shall repent me of their sin is beyond what I am able to comprehend. Still, in those days of depravity and corruption, I had some of those principles implanted in my mind which were afterwards to spring up with such amazing fertility among the heroes of the faith and the promises. In particular, I felt great indignation against all the wicked of this world, and often wished for the means of ridding it of such a noxious burden. I liked John Barnett, my reverend father serving man, extremely ill, but, from a supposition that he might be one of the justified, I refrained from doing him any injury. He gave always his word against me, and when we were by ourselves, in the barn or the fields, he rated me with such severity for my faults that my heart could brook it no longer. He discovered some notorious lies that I had framed, and taxed me with them in such a manner that I could in no wise get off. My cheek burnt with offense rather than shame, and he, thinking he had got the mastery of me, exalted over me most unmercifully, telling me 
I was a selfish and conceited blackguard who made great pretenses towards religious devotion to cloak a deposition tainted with deceit, and that it would not much astonish him if I brought myself to the gallows. I gathered some courage from his over-severity and answered him as follows. Who made thee a judge of the actions or dispositions of the Almighty's creatures? Thou who art a worm and no man in his sight. How it befits thee to deal out judgments and anathemas. Hath he not made one vessel to honor and another to dishonor, as in the case with myself and thee? Hath he not builded his stories in the heavens and laid the foundations thereof in the earth? And how can a being like thee judge between good and evil? that are both subjected to the workings of his hand, or of the opposing principles in the soul of man, correcting, modifying, and refining one another. I said this with that strong display of fervor for which I was remarkable at my years, and expected old Barnett to be utterly confounded. But he only shook his head, and with the most provoking grin said, There he goes, sick and sublime and ridiculous sophistry. I never heard come out of another mouth but ain. There needs nay eighths to be sworn afore the session. Why is your father, young good man? I near for my part, saw a son sacked like a dad, sin my een first opened. With that he went away, saying with an ill-natured wince, You made to honor and me to dishonor? Dirty bow cow thing that thou beest. I will have the old rascal on the hip for this, if I live, thought I. So I went and asked my mother if John was a righteous man. She could not tell, but supposed he was and therefore I got no encouragement from her. I went next to my reverend father and inquired his opinion, expecting as little from that quarter. He knew the elect as it were by instinct, and could have told you of all those in his own, and some neighboring parishes who were born within the boundaries of the covenant of promise and who were not. I keep a good deal in company with your servant, old Barnett, father, said I. You do, boy? You do? I see, said he. I wish I may not keep too much in his company, said I, not knowing what kind of society I am in. Is John a good man, father? Why, boy, he is but so-so. A morally good man John is but very little of the leaven of true righteousness, which is faith within. I am afraid old Barnett, with all his stock of morality, will be a castaway. My heart was greatly cheered by this remark, and I sighed very deeply, and hung my head to one side. The worthy father observed me, and inquired the cause, when I answered as follows. How dreadful the thought that I have been going daily in company and fellowship with one whose name is written on the red letter side of the book of life, whose body and soul have been, from all eternity, consigned over to everlasting destruction, and to whom the blood of the anointment can never, never reach. Father, this is an awful thing and beyond my comprehension. While we are in the world, we must mix with the inhabitants thereof, said he. And the stains which adhere to us by reason of this mixture, which is unavoidable, shall all be washed away. It is our duty, however, to shun the society of wicked men as much as possible, lest we partake of their sins and become sharers with them in punishment. 
John, however, is a morally good man and may yet get a cast of grace. I always thought him to be a good man till today, said I, when he threw out some reflections on your character, so horrible that I quake to think of the wickedness and malevolence of his heart. He was rating me very impertinently for some supposed fault, which had no being save in his own jealous brain. When I attempted to reason him out of his belief in the spirit of calm Christian argument, but how do you think he answered me? He did so, sir, by twisting his mouth at me and remarking that such sublime and ridiculous sophistry never came out of another mouth but one, meaning yours, and that no oath before a Kirk session was necessary to prove who was my dad for that he had never seen a son so like a father as I was like mine. He durst not for his soul salvation, and for his daily bread, which he values much more. Say such a word, boy. Therefore, take care of what you assert, said my reverend father. He said these very words, and will not deny them, sir, said I. My reverend father turned about in great wrath and indignation and went away in search of John. But I kept out of the way and listened at a back window, for John was dressing the plot of ground behind the house. And I hope it was no sin in me that I did rejoice in the dialogue which took place, it being the victory of righteousness over error. Well, John, this is a fine day for your delving work. Hey, it's a tolerable day, sir. Are you thankful in heart, John, for such temporal mercies as these? Ah, uh, doubt we're over a little thankful, sir, both for temporal and spiritual mercies. But is not a the maced thankful heart that masks the greatest phrase, we the tongue? I hope there is nothing personal under that remark, John. Gin the bannet fits son and body's head, they're uncle welcome to it, sir, for me. John, I do not approve of these innuendos. You have an arch malicious manner of vending your aphorisms, which the men of the world are too apt to read the wrong way, for your dark hints are sure to have one very bad meaning. How's not I, sir? It's only bad folks that think sack. They find my bits of gibbs come hame to their hearts. We a kind of yerk, and that gars them wince. That saying is ten times worse than the other, John. It is a manifest insult. It is just telling me to my face that you think me a bad man. A body cannot help his thoughts, sir. No. But a man's thoughts are generally formed from observation. Now, I should like to know, even from the mouth of a misbeliever, what part of my conduct warrants such a conclusion. Nay, particular part, sir. I draw my conclusions fray the hail old man's character, and I'm no that effin' far wrong. Well, John, and what sort of general character do you suppose mine to be? Yours is a scripture character, sir, and I'll prove it. I hope so, John. Well, which of the scripture characters do you think approximates nearest to my own? Guess, sir, guess. I wish to lead a proof. Why, if it be an Old Testament character, I hope it is Melchizedek. For at all events, you cannot deny there is one point of resemblance. I, like him, am a preacher of righteousness. If it be a New Testament character, I suppose you mean the Apostle of the Gentiles, of whom I am an unworthy representative. Nah, nah, sir. Better nor that still, and fair closer is the resemblance. When ye bring me to the point, I am on speak. Ye are the just Pharisee, sir. 
that gate up we the poor publican to pray in the temple. And ye are acting the very same part at this time, and saying I your heart. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, and in nay way like this poor, misbelieving, unregenerate sinner, John Barnett. I hope I may say so indeed. There now, I told you how it was. But do you hear, maester? Here stands the poor sinner, John Barnett, your beetle and servant man. We want to chain chances we you in the weast world, nor conscious in this, for ten times of that you possess, your justification by faith and altogether. You are extremely audacious and impertinent, John, but the language of reprobation cannot affect me. I came only to ask you one question, which I desire you to answer candidly. Did you ever say to anyone that I was the boy Robert's natural father? Hout, na, sir. Ha, ha, ha. Hi, fee, na, sir. I durst na say that for my life. I doubt the black stool and the sack gown or maybe the jugs when hey been my portion had I said sick a thing as that. Hout, hout, fee, fee. Uncle like doings they for a Melchizedek or a St. Paul. John, you are a profane old man, and I desire that you will not presume to break your jest on me. Tell me, dare you say, or dare you think, that I am the natural father of that boy? Ye cannot hinder me to think whatever I like, sir, nor can I hinder myself. But did you ever say to anyone that he resembled me, and fathered himself well enough? I hey said money a time that he resembled you, sir. Nay, body can mistake that. But, John, there are many natural reasons for such likenesses, besides that of consanguinity. They depend much on the thoughts and affections of the mother, and it is probable that the mother of this boy being deserted by her worthless husband, having turned her thoughts on me, as likely to be her protector, may have caused this striking resemblance. Aye, it might be, sir, I could not say. I have known a lady, John, who was delivered of a blackamoor child, merely from the circumstance of having got a start by the sudden entrance of her negro servant and not being able to forget him for several hours. It may be, sir, but I can this, and I had been the laird. I won na hay taken that story in. So then, John, you positively think, from a casual likeness, that this boy is my son? Man's thoughts are vanity, sir. They come unasked, and gang away without a dismissal and he cannot help them. I'm neither going to say that I think he's your son, nor that I think he's no your son. Say ye needn't oppose me nay mare about it. Hear then my determination, John. If you do not promise to me, in faith and honor, that you never will say or insinuate such a thing again in your life as that that boy is my natural son, I will take the keys of the church from you and dismiss you from my service. John pulled out the keys and dashed them on the gravel at the reverend minister's feet. There are the keys of your kirk, sir. I hae never made muckle mence of them since he entered the door out. I hae carried them this three and thirty year, but they hae ye been like a burn a hole in my pouch sin. Every day were turned for your admittance. Take them again, and gee them to your will. And muckle gud may he gotto them. Old John may dee a beggar in a hay barn, or that to the back of a dyke. But he saw A be master of his own thoughts, and gee them vent or no as he likes. He left the manse that day, and I rejoiced in the riddance for I disdained to be kept so much under by one who was in bond of inequity, 
and of whom there seemed no hope, as he rejoiced in his frowardness and refused to submit to that faithful teacher, his master. End of section 12. Section 13. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Sinner. Written by himself, by James Hogg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was about this time that my reverend father preached a sermon, one sentence of which affected me most disagreeably. It was to the purport that every unrepented sin was productive of a new sin with each breath that a man drew. And every one of these new sins added to the catalog in the same manner. I was utterly confounded at the multitude of my transgressions, for I was sensible that there were great numbers of sins of which I had never been able thoroughly to repent. And these momentary ones, by moderate calculation, had, I saw long ago, amounted to a hundred and fifty thousand in a minute. And I saw no end to the series of repentances to which I had subjected myself. A lifetime was nothing to enable me to accomplish the sum, and then being, for anything, I was certain of in my state of nature, and the grace of repentance withheld from me. What was I to do, or what was to become of me? In the meantime, I went on sinning without measure, but I was still more troubled about the multitude than the magnitude of my transgressions, and the small minute ones puzzled me more than those that were more heinous, as the latter had generally some good effects in the way of punishing wicked men, forward boys, and deceitful women. And I rejoiced, even then in my early youth, at being used as a scourge in the hand of the Lord. Another Jehu, a Cyrus, or a Nebuchadnezzar. On the whole, I remember that I got into great confusion relating to my sins and repentances, and knew neither where to begin nor how to proceed, and often had great fears that I was wholly without Christ and that I would find God a consuming fire to me. I could not help running into new sins continually, but then I was mercifully dealt with, for I was often made to repent of them most heartily, by reason of bodily chastisements received on these delinquencies being discovered. I was particularly prone to lying and I cannot but admire the mercy that has freely forgiven me all these juvenile sins. Now that I know them all to be blotted out, and that I am an accepted person, I may the more freely confess them. The truth is, that one lie always paved the way for another. From hour to hour, from day to day, and from year to year so that I found myself constantly involved in a labyrinth of deceit, from which it was impossible to extricate myself. If I knew a person to be a godly one, I could almost have kissed his feet. But, against the carnal portion of mankind, I set my face continually. I esteemed the true ministers of the gospel, but the prelatic party, and the preachers up of good works I abhorred, and to this hour I account them the worst and most heinous of all transgressors. There was only one boy at Mr. Witch's class who kept always the upper hand of me in every part of education. I strove against him from year to year, but it was all in vain, for he was a very wicked boy 
and I was convinced he had dealings with the devil. Indeed, it was believed all over the country that his mother was a witch, and I was at length convinced that it was no human ingenuity that beat me with so much ease in the Latin. After, I had often sat up a whole night with my reverend father, studying my lesson in all its bearings. I often read as well and sometimes better than he. But the moment Mr. Wilson began to examine us, my opponent popped up above me. I determined, as I knew him for a wicked person and one of the devil's hand-fasted children, to be revenged on him and to humble him by some means or other. Accordingly, I lost no opportunity of setting the master against him, and succeeded several times in getting him severely beaten for faults of which he was innocent. I can hardly describe the joy that it gave to my heart to see a wicked creature suffering, for though he deserved it not for one thing, he richly deserved it for others. This may be by some people accounted a great sin in me, but I deny it, for I did it as a duty, and what a man or boy does for the right will never be put into the sum of his transgressions. This boy, whose name was McGill, was, at all his leisure hours, engaged in drawing profane pictures of beasts, men, women, houses and trees, and in short, of all things that his eye encountered. These profane things the master often smiled at and admired. Therefore, I began privately to try my hand likewise. I had scarcely tried above once to draw the figure of a man, ere I conceived that I had hit the very features of Mr. Wilson. They were so particular that they could not be easily mistaken, and I was so tickled and pleased with the droll likeness that I had drawn that I laughed immoderately at it. I tried no other figure but this, and I tried it in every situation in which a man and a schoolmaster could be placed. I often wrought for hours together at this likeness. Nor was it long before I made myself so much master of the outline that I could have drawn it in any situation whatever, almost offhand. I then took McGill's account book of algebra home with me, and at my leisure put down a number of gross caricatures of Mr. Wilson here and there, several of them in situations notoriously ludicrous. I waited the discovery of this treasure with great impatience, but the book, chancing to be one that McGill was not using, I saw it might be long enough before I enjoyed the consummation of my grand scheme. Therefore, with all the ingenuity I was master of, I brought it before our domine's eye. But never shall I forget the rage that gleamed in the tyrant's fizz. I was actually terrified to look at him, and trembled at his voice. McGill was called upon, and examined relating to the obnoxious figures. He denied flatly that any of them were of his doing. But the master, inquiring at him whose they were, he could not tell but affirmed it to be some trick. Mr. Wilson at one time began, as I thought, to hesitate, but the evidence was so strong against McGill that at length his solemn asseverations of innocence only proved an aggravation of his crime. There was not one in the school who had ever been known to draw a figure but himself, and on him fell the whole weight of the tyrant's vengeance. It was dreadful, and I was once in hopes that he would not leave life in the culprit. He, however, left the school for several months, 
refusing to return to be subjected to punishment for the faults of others. And I stood king of the class. Matters were at last made up between McGill's parents and the schoolmaster. But by that time, I had got the start of him. And never in my life did I exert myself so much as to keep the mastery. It was in vain. The powers of enchantment prevailed, and I was again turned down with a tear in my eye. I could think of no amends but one, and of being driven to desperation, I put it in practice. I told a lie of him. I came boldly up to the master and told him that McGill had in my hearing cursed him in a most shocking manner and called him vile names. He called McGill and charged him with the crime, and the proud young coxcomb was so stunned at the atrocity of the charge that his face grew as red as crimson, and the words stuck in his throat as he feebly denied it. His guilt was manifest, and he was again flogged most nobly and dismissed the school forever in disgrace as a most incorrigible vagabond. This was a great victory gained, and I rejoiced and exulted exceedingly in it. It had, however, very nigh cost me my life, for not long thereafter I encountered McGill in the fields, on which he came up and challenged me for a liar, daring me to fight him. I refused, and said that I looked on him as quite below my notice. But he would not quit me, and finally told me that he should either lick me or I should lick him, as he had no other means of being revenged on such a scoundrel. I tried to intimidate him, but it would not do, and I believe I would have given all that I had in the world to be quit of him. He at length went so far as first to kick me, and then strike me on the face and being both older and stronger than he, I thought it scarcely became me to take such insults patiently. I was nevertheless well aware that the devilish powers of his mother would finally prevail, and either the dread of this or the inward consciousness of having wronged him certainly unnerved my arm, for I fought wretchedly and was soon wholly overcome. I was so sore defeated that I kneeled and was going to beg his pardon. But another thought struck me momentarily, and I threw myself on my face and inwardly begged aid from heaven. At the same time, I felt as if assured that my prayer was heard and would be answered. While I was in this humble attitude, the villain kicked me with his foot and cursed me. And I, being newly encouraged, arose and encountered him once more. We had not fought long at this second turn before I saw a man hastening towards us, on which I uttered a shout of joy and laid on valiantly. But my very next look assured me that the man was old John Barnett, whom I had likewise wronged all that was in my power. And between these two wicked persons, I expected anything but justice. My arm was again enfeebled, and that of my adversary prevailed. I was knocked down and mauled most grievously, and while the ruffian was kicking and cuffing me at his will and pleasure, up came old John Barnett, breathless with running, and at one blow with his open hand, leveled my opponent with the earth. Take ye that, maester, said John, to learn ye better breeding. How to wa, man, and ye will fight, fight fair. God suff us, er ye a gentleman's brood, that ye will kick and cuff a lad when he's down. When I heard this kind and unexpected interference, I began once more to value myself on my courage, 
and springing up, I made at my adversary. But John, without saying a word, bit his lip, and seizing me by the neck, threw me down. McGill begged of him to stand and see fair play, and suffer us to finish the battle. For, added he, he is a liar and a scoundrel, and deserves ten times more than I can give him. I ken he's a that ye say, and mare, young man, quoth John. But am I sure that ye're not so bad, and war? It says nay a muckle for ony a ye, to be ten like tykes at one a neither here. John cocked his cudgel and stood between us, threatening to knock the one dead who first offered to lift his hand against the other. But perceiving no disposition in any of us to separate, he drove me home before him like a bullock, and keeping close guard behind me, lest McGill had followed. I felt greatly indebted to John, yet I complained of his interference to my mother, and the old officious sinner got no thanks for his pains. As I am writing only from recollection, so I remember of nothing farther in these early days, and the least worthy of being recorded. That I was a great and transcendent sinner, I confess, but still I had hopes of forgiveness, because I never sinned from principle but accident. And then I always tried to repent of these sins by the slump, for individually it was impossible. And though not always successful in my endeavors, I could not help that, the grace of repentance being withheld from me, I regarded myself as in no degree accountable for the failure. Moreover, there were many of the most deadly sins into which I never fell, for I dreaded those mentioned in the Revelations as excluding sins, so that I guarded against them continually. In particular, I brought myself to despise, if not to abhor, the beauty of women, looking on it as the greatest snare to which mankind was subjected. And though young men and maidens, and even old women, my mother among the rest, taxed me with being an unnatural wretch, I gloried in my acquisition, and to this day am thankful for having escaped the most dangerous of all snares. I kept myself also free of the sins of idolatry and misbelief, both of a deadly nature, and upon the whole, I think I had not then broken, that is, absolutely broken, above four out of the ten commandments. But for all that, I had more sense than to regard either my good works or my evil deeds, as in the smallest degree influencing the eternal decrees of God concerning me, either with regard to my acceptance or reprobation. I depended entirely on the bounty of free grace, holding all the righteousness of man as filthy rags, and believing in the momentous and magnificent truth that, the more heavenly loaded with transgressions, the more welcome was the believer at the throne of grace. And I have reason to believe that it was this dependence and this belief that at last ensured my acceptance there. I come now to the most important period of my existence, the period that has modeled my character and influenced every action of my life, without which this detail of my actions would have been as a tale that hath been told, a monotonous farrago, an uninteresting harangue, in short, a thing of nothing. Whereas, lo! It must now be a relation of great and terrible actions, done in the might and by the commission of heaven. Amen. Like the sinful king of Israel, I had been walking softly before the Lord for a season. 
I had been humbled for my transgressions, and as far as I recollect, sorry on account of their numbers and heinousness. My reverend father had been, moreover, examining me every day regarding the state of my soul, and my answers sometimes appeared to give him satisfaction, and sometimes not. As for my mother, she would harp on the subject of my faith forever. Yet, though I knew her to be a Christian, I confess that I always despised her motley instructions, nor had I any great regard for her person. If this was a crime in me, I never could help it. I confess it freely, and believe it was a judgment from heaven inflicted on her for some sin of former days, and that I had no power to have acted otherwise towards her than I did. In this frame of mind was I when my reverend father one morning arose from his seat, and meeting me as I entered the room, he embraced me and welcomed me into the community of the just upon earth. I was struck speechless, and could make no answer save by looks of surprise. My mother also came to me, kissed and wept over me, and after showering unnumbered blessings upon my head, she also welcomed me into the society of the just made perfect. Then each of them took me by a hand, and my reverend father explained to me how he had wrestled with God, as the patriarch of old had done, not for a night, but for days and years, and that in bitterness and anguish of spirit on my account, but that he had at last prevailed, and had now gained the long and earnestly desired assurance of my accepted with the Almighty, in and through the merits and sufferings of his Son that I was now a justified person, adopted among the number of God's children, my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that no bypass transgression, nor any future act of my own or of other men, could be instrumental in altering the decree. All the powers of darkness, added he, shall never be able to pluck you again out of your Redeemer's hand. And now, my son, be strong and steadfast in truth. Set your face against sin and sinful men, and resist even to blood, as many of the faithful of this land have done, and your reward shall be double. I am assured of your acceptance by the word and spirit of him who cannot err and your sanctification and repentance unto life will follow in due course. Rejoice and be thankful, for you are plucked as a brand out of the burning, and now your redemption is sealed and sure. I wept for joy to be thus assured of my freedom from all sin, and of the impossibility of my ever again falling away from my new state. I bounded away into the fields and the woods to pour out my spirit in prayer before the Almighty for His kindness to me. My whole frame seemed to be renewed. Every nerve was buoyant with new life. I felt as if I could have flown in the air or leapt over the tops of the trees. An exaltation of spirit lifted me, as it were, far above the earth and the sinful creatures crawling on its surface. And I deemed myself as an eagle among the children of men, soaring on high, and looking down with pity and contempt on the groveling creatures below. End of section 13。section 14 the Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Sinner Written by himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
As I thus wended my way, I beheld a young man of a mysterious appearance coming towards me. I tried to shun him, being bent on my own contemplations. But he cast himself in my way, so that I could not well avoid him, and more than that, I felt a sort of invisible power that drew me towards him, something like the force of enchantment, which I could not resist. As we approached each other, our eyes met, and I can never describe the strange sensations that thrilled through my whole frame at that impressive moment. A moment to me fraught with the most tremendous consequences. The beginning of a series of adventures which has puzzled myself and will puzzle the world when I am no more in it. That time will now soon arrive, sooner than anyone can devise who knows not the tumult of my thoughts and the labor of my spirit. And when it hath come and passed over, when my flesh and my bones are decayed, and my soul has passed to its everlasting home, then shall the sons of men ponder on the events of my life, wonder and tremble, and tremble and wonder how such things should be. That strange youth and I approached each other in silence, and slowly, with our eyes fixed on each other's eyes. We approached till not more than a yard intervened between us, and then stood still and gazed, measuring each other from head to foot. What was my astonishment on perceiving that he was the same being as myself? The clothes were the same to the smallest item. The form was the same, the apparent age, the color of the hair, the eyes, and, as far as recollection could serve me from viewing my own features in a glass, the features, too, were the very same. I conceived at first that I saw a vision, and that my guardian angel had appeared to me at this important error of my life. But this singular being read my thoughts and my looks anticipating the very words that I was going to utter. You think I am your brother, said he, or that I am your second self. I am indeed your brother, not according to the flesh, but in my belief of the same truths, and my assurance in the same mode of redemption, than which I hold nothing so great or so glorious on earth. Then you are an associate well adapted to my present state, said I. For this time is a time of great rejoicing in spirit to me. I am on my way to return thanks to the Most High for my redemption from the bonds of sin and misery. If you will join with me heart and hand in youthful thanksgiving, then shall we two go and worship together. But if not, Go your way, and I shall go mine. Ah, you little know with how much pleasure I will accompany you, and join with you in your elevated devotions, said he fervently. Your state is a state to be envied indeed, but I have been advised of it, and am come to be a humble disciple of yours, to be initiated into the true way of salvation by conversing with you, and perhaps of being assisted by your prayers. My spiritual pride being greatly elevated by this address, I began to assume the preceptor, and questioned this extraordinary youth with regard to his religious principles, telling him plainly, if he was one who expected acceptance with God at all, on account of good works, that I would hold no communion with him. He renounced these at once, with the greatest vehemence, and declared his acquiescence in my faith. 
I asked if he believed in the eternal and irrevocable decrees of God regarding the salvation and condemnation of all mankind. He answered that he did so. A. What would signify all things else that he believed, if he did not believe in that? We then went on to commune about all our points of belief, and in everything that I suggested he acquiesced. And as I thought that day, often carried them to extremes, so that I had a secret dread he was advancing blasphemies. He had such a way with him, and paid such a deference to all my opinions, that I was quite captivated, and at the same time, I stood in a sort of awe of him, which I could not account for, and several times was seized with an involuntary inclination to escape from his presence by making a sudden retreat. But he seemed constantly to anticipate my thoughts and was sure to divert my purpose by some turn in the conversation that particularly interested me. He took care to dwell much on the theme of the impossibility of those ever falling away who were once accepted and received into covenant with God, for he seemed to know that in that confidence and that trust my whole hopes were centered. We moved about from one place to another, until the day was wholly spent. My mind had all the while been kept in a state of agitation resembling the motion of a whirlpool. And when we came to separate, I then discovered that the purpose for which I had sought the fields had been neglected, and that I had been diverted from the worship of God by attending to the quibbles and dogmas of this singular and unaccountable being, who seemed to have more knowledge and information than all the persons I had ever known put together. We parted with expressions of mutual regret, and when I left him I felt a deliverance, but at the same time a certain consciousness that I was not thus to get free of him, but that he was like to be an acquaintance that was to stick to me for good or for evil. I was astonished at his acuteness and knowledge about everything. But, as for his likeness to me, that was quite unaccountable. He was the same person in every respect, but yet he was not always so, for I observed several times when we were speaking of certain divines and their tenets, that his face assumed something of the appearance of theirs. And it struck me that, by setting his features to the mold of other people's, he entered at once into their conceptions and feelings. I had been greatly flattered and greatly interested by his conversation. Whether I had been the better for it or the worse, I could not tell. I had been diverted from returning thanks to my gracious Maker for His great kindness to me, and came home as I went away, but not with the same buoyancy and lightness of heart. Well may I remember the day in which I was first received into the number, and made an heir to all the privileges of the children of God and on which I first met this mysterious associate, who from that day forth contrived to wind himself into all my affairs, both spiritual and temporal, to this day on which I am writing the account of it. It was on the 25th day of March, 1704, when I had just entered the 18th year of my age. Whether it behooves me to bless God for the events of that day, or to deplore them, has been hid from my discernment. Though I have inquired into it with fear and trembling, and I have now lost all hopes of ever discovering the true import of these events until that day when my accounts are to make up and reckon for in another world. When I came home, 
I went straight into the parlor where my mother was sitting by herself. She started to her feet and uttered a smothered scream. What ails you, Robert? cried she. My dear son, what is the matter with you? Do you see anything the matter with me? said I. It appears that the ailment is with yourself and either in your crazed head or your dim eyes, for there is nothing the matter with me. Ah, oh, Robert, you are ill, cried she. You are very ill, my dear boy. You are quite changed. Your very voice and manner are changed. Ah, uh, Jane, haste you up to the study and tell Mr. Ringham to come here on the instant and speak to Robert. I beseech you, woman, to restrain yourself, said I. If you suffer your frenzy to run away with your judgment in this manner, I will leave the house. What do you mean? I tell you, there is nothing ails me. I never was better. She screamed and ran between me and the door to bar my retreat. In the meantime, my reverend father entered, and I have not forgot how he gazed through his glasses, first at my mother and then at me. I imagined that his eyes burnt like candles and was afraid of him, which I supposed made my looks more unstable than they would otherwise have been. What is all this for? said he. Mistress, Robert, what is the matter here? Oh, sir, our boy, cried my mother, our dear boy. Mr. Ringham, look at him and speak to him. He is either dying or translated, sir. He looked at me with a countenance of great alarm, mumbling some sentences to himself and then taking me by the arm. As if to feel my pulse, he said, with a faltering voice. Something has indeed befallen you, either in body or mind, boy, for you are transformed since the morning, that I could not have known you for the same person. Have you met with any accident? No. Have you seen anything out of the ordinary course of nature? No. Then Satan, I fear, has been busy with you, tempting you in no ordinary degree at this momentous crisis of your life. My mind turned on my associate for the day, and the idea that he might be an agent of the devil had such an effect on me that I could make no answer. I see how it is, said he. You are troubled in spirit and I have no doubt that the enemy of our salvation has been busy with you. Tell me this, has he overcome you, or has he not? He has not, my dear father, said I. In the strength of the Lord, I hope I have withstood him. But indeed, if he has been busy with me, I knew it not. I have been conversant this day with one stranger only, whom I took rather for an angel of light. It is one of the devil's most profound wiles to appear like one, said my mother. Woman, hold thy peace, said my reverend father. Thou pretendest to teach what thou knowest not. Tell me this, boy, did this stranger, with whom you met, adhere to the religious principles in which I have educated you? Yes. To every one of them in their fullest latitude, said I. Then he was no agent of the wicked one with whom you held converse, said he. For that is the doctrine that was made to overturn the principalities of powers, the might and dominion of the kingdom of darkness. Let us pray. After spending about a quarter of an hour in solemn and sublime thanksgiving, this saintly man and minister of Christ Jesus gave out that the day following should be kept by the family as a day of solemn thanksgiving, and spent in prayer and praise, on account of the calling and election of one of its members, or rather, for the election of that individual being revealed on earth, as well as confirmed in heaven. 
the next day was with me a day of holy exaltation. It was begun by my reverend father laying his hands upon my head and blessing me, and then dedicating me to the Lord in the most awful and impressive manner. It was in no common way that he exercised this profound rite, for it was done with all the zeal and enthusiasm of a devotee to the true cause and a champion on the side he had espoused. He used these remarkable words, which I have still treasured up in my heart. I give him unto thee only, to thee wholly, and to thee forever. I dedicate him unto thee, soul, body, and spirit. Not as the wicked of this world, or the hirelings of a church profanely called by thy name. Do I dedicate this thy servant to thee? Not in words and form learned by rout, and dictated by the limbs of Antichrist, but, Lord, I give him into thy hand, as a captain putteth a sword into the hand of his sovereign, wherewith to lay waste his enemies. May he be a two-edged weapon in thy hand, and a spear coming out of thy mouth, to destroy and overcome and pass over. And may the enemies of thy church fall down before him, and be as dung to fat the land. From the moment I conceived it decreed, not that I should be a minister of the gospel, but a champion of it, to cut off the enemies of the Lord from the face of the earth. And I rejoiced in the commission finding it more congenial to my nature to be cutting sinners off with the sword than to be haranguing them from the pulpit, striving to produce an effect which God, by his act of absolute predestination, had forever rendered impracticable. The more I pondered on these things, the more I saw of the folly and inconsistency of ministers in spending their lives striving and remonstrating with sinners in order to induce them to do that which they had it not in their power to do. Seeing that God had from all eternity decided the fate of every individual that was to be born of woman, how vain was it in man to endeavor to save those whom their Maker had, by an unchangeable decree, doomed to destruction. I could not disbelieve the doctrine which the best of men had taught me, and towards which he made the whole of the scriptures to bear. And yet it made the economy of the Christian world appear to me as an absolute contradiction. How much more wise would it be, thought I, to begin and cut sinners off with the sword? For till that is effected, The saints can never inherit the earth in peace. Should I be honored as an instrument to begin this great work of purification, I should rejoice in it. But then, where had I the means, or under what direction was I to begin? There was one thing clear. I was now the Lord's and it behooved me to bestir myself in his service. Oh, that I had an host at my command! Then would I be as a devouring fire among the workers of iniquity. Full of these great ideas, I hurried through the city and sought again the private path through the field and wood of Finiston, in which my reverend preceptor had the privilege of walking for study and to which he had a key that was always at my command. Near one of these stiles, I perceived a young man sitting in a devout posture, reading a Bible. He rose, lifted his hat, and made an obeisance to me, which I returned and walked on. I had not well crossed the stile till it struck me I knew the face of the youth and that he was some intimate acquaintance, 
to whom I ought to have spoken. I walked on and returned and walked on again, trying to recollect who he was, but for my life I could not. There was, however, a fascination in his look and manner that drew me back towards him in spite of myself, and I resolved to go to him, if it were merely to speak and see who he was. I came up to him and addressed him, but he was so intent on his book that, though I spoke, he lifted not his eyes. I looked on the book also, and still it seemed a Bible, having columns, chapters, and verses, but it was in a language of which I was wholly ignorant, and all intersected with red lines and verses. A sensation resembling a stroke of electricity came over me, on first casting my eyes on that mysterious book, and I stood motionless. He looked up, smiled, closed his book, and put it in his bosom. You seem strangely affected, dear sir, by looking at my book, said he mildly. In the name of God, what book is that, said I? Is it a Bible? It is my Bible, sir, said he. But I will cease reading it, for I am glad to see you. Pray, is not this a day for holy festivity with you? I stared in his face, but made no answer, for my senses were bewildered. Do you not know me? said he. You appear to be somehow at a loss. Had not you and I some sweet communion and fellowship yesterday? I beg your pardon, sir, said I. But surely, if you are the young gentleman with whom I spent the hours yesterday, you have the chameleon art of changing your appearance. I never could have recognized you. My continence changes with my studies and sensations, said he. It is a natural peculiarity in me, over which I have not full control. If I contemplate a man's features seriously, mine own gradually assume the very same appearance and a character. And what is more, by contemplating a face minutely, I not only attain the same likeness, but, with the likeness, I attain the very same ideas, as well as the same mode of arranging them, so that, you see, by looking at a person attentively, I by degrees assume his likeness, and by assuming his likeness, I attain to the possession of his most secret thoughts. This, I say, is a peculiarity in my nature, a gift of the God that made me. But whether or not given me for a blessing, he knows himself, and so do I. At all events, I have this privilege, I can never be mistaken of a character in whom I am interested. It is a rare qualification, replied I, and I would give worlds to possess it. Then, it appears that it is needless to dissemble with you. Since you can, at any time, extract our most secret thoughts from our bosoms, you already know my natural character. Yes, said he, and it is that which attaches me to you. By assuming your likeness yesterday, I became acquainted with your character and was no less astonished at the profunity and range of your thoughts than at the heroic magnanimity with which these were combined. And now, in addition to these, you are dedicated to the great work of the Lord, for which reasons I have resolved to attach myself as closely to you as possible, and to render you all the service of which my poor abilities are capable. I confess that I was greatly flattered by these compliments paid to my abilities by a youth of such superior qualifications. By one who, with a modesty and affability rare at his age, 
combined a height of genius and knowledge almost above human comprehension. Nevertheless, I began to assume a certain superiority of demeanor towards him, as judging it incumbent on me to do so, in order to keep up his idea of my exalted character. We conversed again till the day was near a close, and the things that he strove most to inculcate on my mind were the infallibility of the elect, and the preordination of all things that come to pass. I pretended to controvert the first of these, for the purpose of showing him the extent of my argumentative powers, and said that, indubitably, there were degrees of sinning which would induce the Almighty to throw off the very elect. But behold, my hitherto humble and modest companion took up the argument with such warmth that he put me not only to silence, but to absolute shame. End of section 14section 15 the private memoirs and confessions of a sinner written by himself by james hogg this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org why sir said he by vending such an insinuation you put discredit on the great atonement in which you trust. Is there not enough of merit in the blood of Jesus to save thousands of worlds, if it was for these worlds that he died? Now, when you know, as you do, and as every one of the elect may know of himself, that this Savior died for you, namely and particularly, Dare you say that there is not enough of merit in his great atonement to annihilate all your sins? Let them be as heinous and atrocious as they may. And moreover, do you not acknowledge that God hath preordained and decreed whatsoever comes to pass? Then how is it that you should deem it in your power to eschew one action of your life? whether good or evil. Depend on it. The advice of the great preacher is genuine. What thine hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For none of us knows what a day may bring forth. That is, none of us knows what is preordained. But whatever it is preordained, we must do. And none of these things will be laid to our charge. I could hardly believe that these sayings were genuine or orthodox. But I soon felt that, instead of being a humble disciple of mine, this new acquaintance was to be my guide and director, and all under the humble guise of one stooping at my feet to learn the right. He said that he saw I was ordained to perform some great action for the cause of Jesus and his church, and he earnestly coveted being a partaker with me. But he besought of me never to think it possible for me to fall from the truth, or the favor of him who had chosen me, else that misbelief would balk every good work to which I set my face. There was something so flattering in all this that I could not resist it. Still, when he took leave of me, I felt it as a great relief, and yet, before the morrow, I wearied and was impatient to see him again. We carried on our fellowship from day to day, and all the while I knew not who he was. And still my mother and reverend father kept insisting that I was an altered youth, changed in my appearance, my manners, and my whole conduct. Yet something always prevented me from telling them more about my new acquaintance than I had done on the first day we met. 
I rejoiced in him, was proud of him, and soon could not live without him. Yet, though resolved every day to disclose the whole story of my connection with him, I had it not in my power. Something always prevented me, till at length I thought no more of it, but resolved to enjoy his fascinating company in private, and by all means to keep my own with him. The resolution was vain. I set a bold face to it, but my powers were inadequate to the task. My adherent, with all the suavity imaginable, was sure to carry his point. I sometimes fumed and sometimes shed tears at being obliged to yield to proposals against which I had at first felt every reasoning power of my soul rise in opposition. But for all that, he never faded in carrying conviction along with him in effect. For he either forced me to acquiesce in his measures and assent to the truth of his positions, or he put me so completely down that I had not a word left to advance against them. After weeks, and I may say months of intimacy, I observed, somewhat to my amazement, that we had never once prayed together, and more than that, that he had constantly led my attentions away from that duty, causing me to neglect it wholly. I thought this a bad mark of a man seemingly so much set on inculcating certain important points of religion, and resolved next day to put him to the test and request him to perform that sacred duty and name of us both. He objected boldly, saying there were very few people indeed with whom he could join in prayer, and he made a point of never doing it, as he was sure they were to ask many things of which he disapproved, and that, if he were to officiate himself, he was as certain to allude to many things that came not within the range of their faith. He disapproved of prayer altogether in the manner it was generally gone about, he said. Man made it merely a selfish concern, and was constantly employed asking, asking for everything. Whereas it became all God's creatures to be content with their lot, and only to kneel before him in order to thank him for such benefits as he saw meet to bestow. In short, he argued with such energy that before we parted, I acquiesced, as usual, in his position, and never mentioned prayer to him any more. Having been so frequently seen in his company, several people happened to mention the circumstance to my mother and reverend father, but at the same time had all described him differently. At length, they began to examine me with respect to the company I kept, as I absented myself from home day after day. I told them I kept company only with one young gentleman, whose whole manner of thinking on religious subjects I found so congenial with my own that I could not live out of his society. My mother began to lay down some of her old hackneyed rules of faith, but I turned from hearing her with disgust. For after the energy of my new friend's reasoning, Hers appeared so tame I could not endure it. And I confess with shame that my reverend preceptor's religious dissertations began, about this time, to lose their relish very much, and by degrees became exceedingly tiresome to my ear. They were so inferior in strength and sublimity to the most common observations of my young friend that in drawing a comparison the former appeared as nothing. He, however, 
examined me about many things related to my companion, in all of which I satisfied him, save in one. I could neither tell him who my friend was, what was his name, nor of whom he was descended. And I wondered at myself how I had never once adverted to such a thing for all the time we had been intimate. I inquired the next day what his name was, as I said I was often at a loss for it when talking with him. He replied that there was no occasion for any one friend ever naming another when their society was held in private, as ours was. For his part, he had never once named me since we first met, and never intended to do so, unless by my own request. But if you cannot converse without naming me, you may call me Gil for the present, added he, and if I think proper to take another name at any future period, it shall be with your approbation. Gil, said I, have you no name but Gil? Or which of your names is it, your Christian or surname? Oh, you must have a surname too, must you? replied he. Very well, you may call me Gil Martin. It is not my Christian name, but it is a name which may serve your turn. This is very strange, said I. Are you ashamed of your parents that you refuse to give your real name? I have no parents save one, whom I do not acknowledge, said he proudly. Therefore, pray drop that subject, for it is a disagreeable one. I am a being of a very peculiar temper, for, though I have servants and subjects more than I can number, Yet to gratify a certain whim, I have left them and retired to this city and for all the society it contains. You see, I have attached myself only to you. This is a secret, and I tell you only in friendship. Therefore pray let it remain one, and say not another word about the matter. I assented and said no more concerning it. For it instantly struck me that this was no other than the Tsar Peter of Russia, having heard that he had been traveling through Europe in disguise. And I cannot say that I had not thenceforward great and mighty hopes of high preferment as a defender and avenger of the oppressed Christian church under the influence of this great potentate. He had hinted as much already, as that it was more honorable and of more avail to put down the wicked with the sword than try to reform them, and I thought myself quite justified in supposing that he intended me for some great employment, that he had thus selected me for his companion out of all the rest in Scotland, and even pretended to learn the great truths of religion from my mouth. From that time, I felt disposed to yield to such a great prince's suggestions without hesitation. Nothing ever astonished me so much as the uncommon powers with which he seemed invested. In our walk one day, we met with a Mr. Blanchard, who was reckoned a worthy, pious divine, but quite of the moral caste, who joined us and we three walked on, and rested together in the fields. My companion did not seem to like him, but nevertheless regarded him frequently with deep attention, and there were several times, while he seemed contemplating him, and trying to find out his thoughts, that his face became so like Mr. Blanchard's, that it was impossible to have distinguished the one from the other. The antipathy between the two was mutual, and discovered itself quite palpably in a short time. When my companion, the prince, was gone, 
Mr. Blanchard asked me anent him, and I told him that he was a stranger in the city, but a very uncommon and great personage. Mr. Blanchard's answer to me was as follows. I never saw anybody I disliked so much in my life, Mr. Robert. And if it be true that he is a stranger here, which I doubt, believe me, he has come for no good. Do you not perceive what mighty powers of mind he is possessed of? said I. And also how clear and unhesitating he is on some of the most interesting points of divinity. It is for his great mental faculties that I dread him, said he. It is uncalculable what evil such a person as he may do, if so disposed. There is a sublimity in his ideas, with which there is to me a mixture of terror, and when he talks of religion, he does it as one that rather dreads its truths than reverences them. He indeed pretends great strictness of orthodoxy regarding some of the points of doctrine embraced by the Reformed Church. But you do not seem to perceive that both you and he are carrying these points to a dangerous extremity. Religion is a sublime and glorious thing. The bonds of society on earth and the connector of humanity with the divine nature. But there is nothing so dangerous to man as the resting of any of its principles or forcing them beyond their due bounds. This is of all others the readiest way to destruction. Neither is there anything so easily done. There is not an error into which a man can fall which he may not press scripture into his service as proof of the probity of, and though your boasted theologian shunned the full discussion of the subject before me, while you pressed it, I can easily see that both you and he are carrying your ideas of absolute predestination and its concomitant appendages to an extent that overthrows all religion and revelation together, or at least jumbles them into a chaos out of which human capacity can never select what is good. Believe me, Mr. Robert, the less you associate with that illustrious stranger, the better. For it appears to me that your creed and his carries damnation on the very front of it. I was rather stunned at this, but pretended to smile with disdain, and said it did not become youth to control age. And as I knew our principles differed fundamentally, it behooved us to drop the subject. He, however, would not drop it, but took both my principles and me fearfully to task. For Blanchard was an eloquent and powerful-minded old man, and before we parted, I believe I promised to drop my new acquaintance, and was all but resolved to do it. As well might I have laid my account with shunning the light of day, he was constant to me as my shadow, and by degrees he acquired such an ascendancy over me that I never was happy out of his company, nor greatly so in it. When I repeated to him all that Mr. Blanchard had said, his countenance kindled with indignation and rage, and then by degrees his eyes sunk inward, his brow lowered, so that I was awed and withdrew my eyes from looking at him. A while afterwards, as I was addressing him, I chanced to look him again in the face, and the sight of him made me start violently. He had made himself so like Mr. Blanchard that I actually believed I had been addressing that gentleman and that I had done so in some absence of mind that I could not account for. Instead of being amused at the quandary I was in, he seemed offended. Indeed, 
he never was truly amused with anything. And he then asked me sullenly, if I conceived such personages as he to have no other endowments than common mortals. I said, I never conceived that princes or potentates had any greater share of endowments than other men, and frequently not so much. He shook his head and bade me think over the subject again, and there was an end of it. I certainly felt every day the more disposed to knowledge such a superiority in him, and from all that I could gather, I had now no doubt that he was Peter of Russia. Everything combined to warrant the supposition, and of course, I resolved to act in conformity with the discovery I had made. For several days, the subject of Mr. Blanchard's doubts and doctrines formed the theme of our discourse. My friend deprecated them most devoutly, and then again he would deplore them, and lament the great evil that such a man might do among the human race. I joined with him in allowing the evil in its fullest latitude, and at length, after he thought he had fully prepared my nature for such a trial of its powers and abilities, he proposed calmly that we too should make away with Mr. Blanchard. I was so shocked that my bosom became as it were a void, and the beatings of my heart sounded loud and hollow in it. My breath cut and my tongue and palate became dry and speechless. He mocked at my cowardice, and began a reasoning on the matter with such powerful eloquence that, before we parted, I felt fully convinced that it was my bounden duty to slay Mr. Blanchard. But my will was far, very far from consenting to the deed. I spent the following night without sleep, or nearly so, and the next morning, by the time the sun arose, I was again abroad, and in the company of my illustrious friend. The same subject was resumed, and again he reasoned to the following purport, that supposing me placed at the head of any army of Christian soldiers, all bent on putting down the enemies of the church. Would I have any hesitation in destroying and rooting out these enemies? None, surely. Well then, when I saw and was convinced that here was an individual who was doing more detriment to the church of Christ on earth than tens of thousands of such warriors were capable of doing, was it not my duty to cut him off and save the elect? He, who would be a champion in the cause of Christ and his church, my brave young friend, added he, must begin early, and no man can calculate to what an illustrious eminence small beginnings may lead. If the man Blanchard is worthy, he is only changing his situation for a better one. And if unworthy, it is better that one fall than that a thousand souls perish. Let us be up and doing in our vocations. For me, my resolution is taken. I have but one great aim in this world, and I never for a moment lose sight of it. I was obliged to admit the force of his reasoning. For though I cannot from memory repeat his words, his eloquence was of that overpowering nature that the subtility of other men sunk before it. And there is also little doubt that the assurance I had that these words were spoken by a great potentate who could raise me to the highest eminence, provided that I entered into his extensive and decisive measures, assisted mightily in dispelling my youthful scruples and qualms of conscience. And I thought, moreover, that, 
having such a powerful back friend to support me. I hardly needed to be afraid of the consequences. I consented, but begged a little time to think of it. He said the less one thought of a duty, the better. And we parted. End of section 15. Section 16. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Sinner. Written by himself by James Ogg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. But the most singular instance of this wonderful man's power over my mind was that he had as complete influence over me by night as by day. All my dreams corresponded exactly with his suggestions. And when he was absent from me, still his arguments sunk deeper in my heart than even when he was present. I dreamed that night of a great triumph obtained, and though the whole scene was but dimly and confusedly defined in my vision, yet the overflow and death of Mr. Blanchard was the first step by which I attained the eminent station I occupied. Thus, by dreaming of the event by night, and discoursing of it by day, it soon became so familiar to my mind that I almost conceived it as done. It was resolved on, which was the first and greatest victory gained, for there was no difficulty in finding opportunities and now of cutting off a man who, every good day, was to be found walking by himself in private grounds. I went and heard him preach for two days, and in fact I held his tenets scarcely short of blasphemy. They were such as I had never heard before, and his congregation, which was numerous, were turning up their ears and drinking in his doctrines with the utmost delight. For, oh, they suited their carnal natures and self-sufficiency to a hair. He was actually holding it forth, as a fact, that it was every man's own blame if he was not saved. What horrible misconstruction! And then he was alleging, and trying to prove from nature and reason, that no man ever was guilty of a sinful action who might not have declined it, had he so chosen. Wretched controvertist, thought I to myself in a hundred times. Shall not the sword of the Lord be moved from its place of peace for such presumptuous, absurd testimonies as these? When I began to tell the prince about these false doctrines, to my astonishment I found that he had been in the church himself, and had every argument that the old divine had used verbatim. And he remarked on them with great concern that these were not the tenets that corresponded with his views in society, and that he had agents in every city and every land exerting their powers to put them down. I asked, with great simplicity, Are all your subjects Christians, Prince? All my European subjects are, or deem themselves so, returned he, and they are the most faithful and true subjects I have. Who could doubt, after this, that he was the Tsar of Russia? I have nevertheless had reasons to doubt of his identity since that period, and which of my conjectures is right I believe the God of heaven only knows, for I do not. I shall go on to write such things as I remember, 
And if anyone shall ever take the trouble to read over these confessions, such a one will judge for himself. It will be observed that, since ever I fell in with this extraordinary person, I have written about him only, and I must continue to do so to the end of this memoir, as I have performed no great or interesting action in which he had not a principal share. He came to me one day and said, We must not linger thus in executing what we have resolved on. We have much before our hands to perform for the benefit of mankind, both civil as well as religious. Let us do what we have to do here, and then we must wend our way to other cities and perhaps to other countries. Mr. Blanchard, is to hold forth in the High Church of Paisley on Sunday next, on some particularly great occasion. This must be defeated. He must not go there. As he will be busy arranging his discourses, we may expect him to be walking by himself in Finiston Dell the greater part of Friday and Saturday. Let us go and cut him off. What is the life of a man more than the life of a lamb, or any guiltless animal? It is not half so much, especially when we consider the immensity of the mischief this old fellow is working among our fellow creatures. Can there be any doubt that it is the duty of one consecrated to God to cut off such a mildew? I fear me, great sovereign, said I, that your ideas of retribution are too sanguine and too arbitrary for the laws of this country. I dispute not that your motives are great and high, but have you debated the consequences and settled the result? I have, returned he, and hold myself amendable for the action to the laws of God and of equity. As to the enactments of men, I despise them. Fain would I see the weapon of the Lord of hosts begin the work of vengeance that awaits it to do. I could not help thinking that I perceived a little derision of continence on his face as he said this. Nevertheless, I sunk dumb before such a man, aroused myself to the task, seeing he would not have it deferred. I approved of it in theory, but my spirit stood aloof from the practice. I saw and was convinced that the elect of God would be happier and purer were the wicked and unbelievers all cut off from troubling and misleading them. But if it had not been the instigations of this illustrious stranger, I should never have presumed to begin so great a work myself. Yet, though he often aroused my zeal to the highest pitch, still my heart at times shrunk from the shedding of life blood, and it was only at the earnest and unceasing instigations of my enlightened and voluntary patron that I at length put my hand to the conclusive work. After I said all that I could say, and all I had been overborne, I remember my actions in words as well as it had been yesterday. I turned round hesitatingly, and looked up to heaven for direction. But there was a dimness come over my eyes that I could not see. The appearance was as if there had been a veil drawn over me so nigh that I put up my hand to feel it. And then Gil Martin, as this great sovereign was pleased to have himself called, frowned and asked me what I was grasping at. I knew not what to say, but answered with fear and shame. I have no weapons, not one. No, I wear any are to be found. The God whom thou servest will provide these, said he, if thou provest worthy of the trust committed to thee. 
I looked again up into the cloudy veil that covered us and thought I beheld golden weapons of every description let down in it, but all with their points towards me. I kneeled and was going to stretch out my hand to take one when my patron seized me, as I thought, by the clothes and dragged me away with as much ease as I had been a lamb, saying, with a joyful and elevated voice, Come, my friend, let us depart. Thou art dreaming, thou art dreaming. Rouse up all the energies of thy exalted mind, for thou art an highly favored one, and doubt thou not that he whom thou servest will be ever at thy right and left hand to direct and assist thee. These words, but particularly the vision I had seen of the golden weapons descending out of heaven, inflamed my zeal to that height that I was as one beside himself, which my parents perceived that night, and made some motions towards confining me to my room. I joined in the family prayers, and then I afterwards sung a psalm and prayed by myself. And I had good reasons for believing that the small oblation of praise and prayer was not turned to sin. But there are strange things and unaccountable agencies in nature. He only who dwells between the cherubim can unriddle them, and to him the honor must redound forever. Amen. I felt greatly strengthened and encouraged that night and the next morning I ran to meet my companion, out of whose eye I had now no life. He rejoiced at seeing me so forward in the great work of reformation by blood, and said many things to raise my hopes of future fame and glory. And then, producing two pistols of pure beaten gold, he held them out and proffered me the choice of one, saying, See what thy master hath provided thee? I took one of them eagerly, for I perceived at once that they were two of the very weapons that were let down from heaven in the cloudy veil, the dim tapestry of the firmament. And I said to myself, Surely this is the will of the Lord. The little splendid and enchanting piece was so perfect so complete, and so ready for executing the will of the donor, that I now longed to use it in his service. I loaded it with my own hand, as Gil Martin did the other, and we took our stations behind a bush of hathorn and bramble on the verge of the wood, and almost close to the walk. My patron was so acute in all his calculations that he never mistook an event. We had not taken our stand above a minute and a half till old Mr. Blanchard appeared, coming slowly on the path. When we saw this, we cowered down and leaned each of us a knee upon the ground, pointing the pistols through the bush, with an aim so steady that it was impossible to miss our victim. He came deliberately on, pausing at times so long that we dreaded he was going to turn. Gil Martin dreaded it, and I said I did, but wished in my heart that he might. He, however, came onward, and I will never forget the manner in which he came. No, I don't believe I ever can forget it either in the narrow bounds of time or the ages of eternity. He was a broadly, ill-shaped man, of a rude exterior, and a little bent with age. His hands were clasped behind his back and below his coat, and he walked with a slow swinging air that was very peculiar. When he paused and looked abroad on nature, the act was highly impressive. He seemed conscious of being all alone, 
and conversant only with God and the elements of his creation. Never was there such a picture of human inadvertency. A man approaching step by step to the one that was to hurl him out of one existence into another, with as much ease and indifference as the ox goeth to the stall. Hideous vision! Wilt thou not be gone from my mental sight? If not, let me bear with thee as I can. When he came straight opposite to the muzzles of our pieces, Gil Martin called out, Hey! with a short, quick sound. The old man, without starting, turned his face and breast towards us and looked into the wood, but looked over our heads. Now! whispered my companion and fired, but my hand refused the office for I was not at that moment sure about becoming an assassin in the cause of Christ and his church. I thought I heard a sweet voice behind me, whispering to me to beware, and I was going to look around when my companion exclaimed, Coward! We are ruined! I had no time for an alternative. Gil Martin's ball had not taken effect, which was altogether wonderful, as the old man's breast was within a few yards of him. Hilloa! cried Blanchard. What was that for, you dog? And with that he came forward to look over the bush. I hesitated, as I said, and attempted to look behind me, but there was no time. The next step discovered two assassins lying in covert, waiting for blood. Coward! We are ruined! cried my indignant friend. And that moment my piece was discharged. The effect was as might have been expected. The old man first stumbled to one side, and then fell on his back. We kept our places, and I perceived my companion's eyes gleaming with an unnatural joy. The wounded man raised himself from the bank to a sitting posture, and I beheld his eyes swimming. He, however, appeared sensible, for we heard him saying in a low and rattling voice, Alas! Alas! Whom have I offended, that they should have been driven to an act like this? Come forth and show yourselves, that I may either forgive you before I die, or curse you in the name of the Lord. He then fell a-groping with both hands on the ground, as if feeling for something he had lost manifestly, in the agonies of death. With a solemn and interrupted prayer for forgiveness, he breathed his last. I had become rigid as a statue, whereas my associate appeared to be elevated above measure. Arise, thou faint-hearted one, and let us be going, said he. Thou hast done well for once. But wherefore hesitate in such a cause? This is but a small beginning of so great a work as that of purging the Christian world. But the first victim is a worthy one, and more of such lights must be extinguished immediately. We touched not our victim nor anything pertaining to him for fear of staining our hands with his blood and the firing having brought three men within view, who were hasting towards the spot. My undaunted companion took both the pistols and went forward as with intent to meet them, bidding me shift for myself. I ran off in a contrary direction, till I came to the foot of the pyramid psyche, and then, 
running up the hollow of that, I appeared on the top of the bank as if I had been another man brought in view by hearing the shots in such a place. I had a full view of a part of what passed, though not of all. I saw my companion going straight to meet the men, apparently with a pistol in every hand, waving in a careless manner. They seemed not quite clear of meeting with him, and so he went straight on and passed between them. They looked after him and came onwards, but when they came to the old man lying stretched in his blood, then they turned and pursued my companion, though not so quickly as they might have done, and I understand that from the first they saw no more of him. Great was the confusion that day in Glasgow. The most popular of all their preachers of morality was what they called murdered in cold blood, and a strict and extensive search was made for the assassin. Neither of the accomplices was found, however, that is certain, nor was either of them so much as suspected. But another man was apprehended under circumstances that warranted suspicion. This was one of the things that I witnessed in my life, which I never understood and it was surely one of my patron's most dexterous tricks. For I must still say, what I have thought from the beginning, that like him, there never was a man created. The young man who was taken up was a preacher, and it was proved that he had purchased firearms in town, and gone out with them that morning. But the far greatest mystery of the whole was that two of the men, out of three who met my companion, swore that that unfortunate preacher was the man whom they met with a pistol in each hand, fresh from the death of the old divine. The poor fellow made a confused speech himself, which there is not the least doubt was quite true. But it was laughed to scorn, and an expression of horror ran through both the hearers and jury. I heard the whole trial, and so did Gil Martin, but we left the journeyman preacher to his fate, and from that time forth I have had no faith in the justice of criminal trials. If once a man is prejudiced on one side, he will swear anything in support of such prejudice. I tried to expostulate with my mysterious friend on the horrid injustice of suffering this young man to die for our act. But the prince exalted in it more than the other, and said the latter was the most dangerous man of the two. End of section 16section 17. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Sinner, written by himself, by James Hogg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The alarm in and about Glasgow was prodigious. The country being divided into two political parties, the court and the country party, the former held meetings, issued proclamations, and offered rewards, ascribing all to the violence of party spirit, and deprecating the infernal measures of their opponents. I did not understand their political differences. But it was easy to see that the true gospel preachers joined all on one side, and the upholders of pure morality and a blameless life on the other, so that this division proved a test to us. And it was forthwith resolved that we too should pick out some of the leading men of this unsaintly and heterodox cabal, and cut them off one by one, as occasion should suit. Now, 
the ice being broke, I felt considerable zeal in our great work, but pretended much more. And we might soon have kidnapped them all through the ingenuity of my patron, had not our next attempt miscarried, by some awkwardness or mistake of mine. The consequence was that he was discovered fairly and very nigh seized. I also was seen, and suspected so far that my reverend father, my mother, and myself were examined privately. I denied all knowledge of the matter, and they held it in such a ridiculous light, and their conviction of the complete groundlessness of the suspicion was so perfect that their testimony prevailed, and the affair was hushed. I was obliged, however, to walk circumspectly and saw my companion the prince very seldom, who was prowling about every day, quite unconcerned about his safety. He was every day a new man, however, and needed not to be alarmed at any danger, for such a facility had he in disguising himself that, if it had not been for a password which we had between us, for the purposes of recognition, I never could have known him myself. It so happened that my reverend father was called to Edinburgh about this time, to assist with his counsel in settling the national affairs. At my earnest request, I was permitted to accompany him, at which both my associate and I rejoiced, as we were now about to move in a new and extensive field. All this time, I never knew where my illustrious friend resided. He never once invited me to call on him at his lodgings, nor did he ever come to our house, which made me sometimes to suspect that, if any of our great efforts in the cause of true religion were discovered, he intended leaving me in the lurch. Consequently, when we met in Edinburgh, for we traveled not in company, I proposed to go with him to look for lodgings, telling him at the same time what a blessed religious family my reverend instructor and I were settled in. He said he rejoiced at it, but he made a rule of never lodging in any particular house, but took these daily or hourly as he found it convenient, and that he never was at a loss in any circumstance. What a mighty trouble you put yourself to, great sovereign, said I, and all, it would appear, for the purpose of seeing and knowing more and more of the human race. I never go but where I have some great purpose to serve, returned he, either in the advancement of my own power and dominion, or in thwarting my enemies. With all due deference to your great comprehension, my illustrious friend, said I, it strikes me that you can accomplish very little, either the one way or the other here in the humble and private capacity you are pleased to occupy. It is your own innate modesty that prompts such a remark, said he. Do you think the gaining of you to my service is not an attainment worthy of being envied by the greatest potentate in Christendom? Before I had missed such a prize as the attainment of your services, I would have traveled over one half of the habitable globe. I bowed with great humility, but at the same time, how could I but feel proud and highly flattered? He continued, Believe me, my dear friend, for such a prize I account no effort too high. For a man who is not only dedicated to the King of Heaven in the most solemn manner, soul, body and spirit, but also chosen of him from the beginning, justified, sanctified, and received into a communion that never shall be broken, and from which no act of his shall ever remove him. The possession of such a man, I tell you, is worth kingdoms. 
because every deed that he performs, he does it with perfect safety to himself and honor to me. I bowed again, lifting my hat, and he went on. I am now going to put his courage in the cause he has espoused to a severe test, to a trial at which common nature would revolt. But he who is dedicated to be the sword of the Lord must raise himself above common humanity. You have a father and a brother according to the flesh. What do you know of them? I am sorry to say I know nothing good, said I. They are reprobates, castaways, beings devoted to the wicked one, and like him, workers of every species of inequity with greediness. They must both fall, said he, with a sigh and melancholy look. It is decreed in the councils above that they must both fall by your hand. The God of heaven forbid it, said I. They are enemies to Christ and his church, that I know and believe. But they shall live and die in their inequity for me, and reap their guerdon when their time cometh. There my hand shall not strike. The feeling is natural and amiable, said he. But you must think again. Whether are the bonds of carnal nature or the bonds and vows of the Lord strongest? I will not reason with you on this head, mighty potentate, said I. For whenever I do so, it is but to be put down. I shall only express my determination not to take vengeance out of the Lord's hand in this instance. It availeth not. These are men that have the mark of the beast in their foreheads and right hands. They are lost beings themselves, but have no influence over others. Let them perish in their sins, for they shall not be meddled with by me. How preposterously you talk, my dear friend, said he. These people are your greatest enemies. They would rejoice to see you annihilated. And now that you have taken up the Lord's cause of being avenged on his enemies, wherefore spare those that are your own as well as his? Besides, you ought to consider what great advantages would be derived to the cause of righteousness and truth were the estate and riches of that opulent house in your possession rather than in that of such as oppose the truth and all manner of holiness. This was a portion of the consequence of following my illustrious advisor's summary mode of procedure that had never entered into my calculation. I disclaimed all idea of being influenced by it. However, I cannot but say that the desire of being enabled to do so much good by the possession of these bad man's riches made some impression on my heart, and I said I would consider of the matter. I did consider it, and that right seriously as well as frequently, and there was scarcely an hour in the day on which my resolves were not animated by my great friend till at length I began to have a longing desire to kill my brother, in particular. Should any man ever read this scroll, he will wonder at this confession and deem it savage and unnatural. So it appeared to me at first, but a constant thinking of an event changes every one of its features. I have done all for the best and as I was prompted by one who knew right and wrong much better than I did, I had a desire to slay him, it is true, and such a desire, too, as a thirsty man has to drink. But at the same time, this longing desire was mingled with a certain terror, as if I had dreaded that the drink for which I longed was mixed with deadly poison. My mind was so much weakened, or rather softened about this time, 
that my faith began a little to give way, and I doubted most presumptuously of the least tangible of all Christian tenets, namely, of the infallibility of the elect. I hardly comprehended the great work I had begun, and doubted of my own infallibility, or that of any created being. But I was brought over again by the unwearied diligence of my friend to repent of my backsliding, and view once more the superiority of the Almighty's counsels in its fullest latitude. Amen. I prayed very much in secret about this time, and that with great fervor of spirit, as well as humility, and my satisfaction at finding all my requests granted is not to be expressed. My illustrious friend still continuing to sound in my ears the imperious duty to which I was called, of making away with my sinful relations, and quoting many parallel actions out of the scriptures, and the writings of the Holy Fathers, of the pleasure the Lord took in such as executed his vengeance on the wicked. I was obliged to acquiesce in his measures, though with certain limitations. It was not easy to answer his arguments, and yet I was afraid that he soon perceived a leaning to his will on my part. If the acts of Jua, in rooting out the whole house of his master, were ordered and approved of by the Lord, said he, would it not have been more praiseworthy if one of Ahab's own sons had stood up for the cause of the God of Israel, and rooted out the sinners and their idols out of the land? It would certainly, said I. To our duty to God, all other duties must yield. Go thou then, and do likewise, said he. Thou art called to a high vocation, to cleanse the sanctuary of thy God in this thy native land by the shedding of blood. Go thou then, like a ruling energy, a master spirit of desolation in the dwellings of the wicked and high shall be your reward both here and hereafter. My heart now panted with eagerness to look my brother in the face, on which my companion, who was never out of the way, conducted me to a small square in the suburbs of the city, where there were a number of young noblemen and gentlemen playing at a vain, idle, and sinful game at which there was much of the language of the accursed going on. And among these blasphemers he instantly pointed out my brother to me. I was fired with indignation at seeing him in such company, and so employed. And I placed myself close beside him to watch all his motions, listen to his words, and draw inferences from what I saw and heard. In what a sink of sin was he wallowing! I resolved to take him to task, and if he refused to be admonished, to inflict on him some caught in punishment. And knowing that my illustrious friend and director was looking on, I resolved to show some spirit. Accordingly, I waited until I heard him profane his Maker's name three times. And then, my spiritual indignation being aroused above all restraint, I went up and kicked him. Yes, I went boldly up and struck him with my foot, and meant to have given him a more severe blow than it was my fortune to inflict. It had, however, the effect of rousing up his corrupt nature to quarreling and strife instead of taking the chastisement of the Lord in humility and meekness. He ran furiously against me in the choler that was always inspired by the wicked one. But I overthrew him, by reason of impeding the natural and rapid progress of his unholy feet running to destruction. I also fell slightly, but his fall proved a severe one. He arose in wrath, 
and struck me with the maul which he held in his hand until my blood flowed copiously. And from that moment, I vowed his destruction in my heart. But I chanced to have no weapon at that time, nor any means of inflicting due punishment on the caddif, which would not have been returned double on my head by him and his graceless associates. I mixed among them at the suggestion of my friend, and following them to their den of voluptuousness and sin, I strove to be admitted among them in hopes of finding some means of accomplishing my great purpose, while I found myself moved by the spirit within me so to do. But I was not only debarred, but by the machinations of my wicked brother and his associates, cast into prison. I was not sorry at being thus honored to suffer in the cause of righteousness, and at the hands of sinful men. And as soon as I was alone, I betook myself to prayer, deprecating the long-suffering of God toward such horrid sinners. My jailer came to me and insulted me. He was a rude, unprincipled fellow, partaking of those loose and carnal manners of the age. But I remembered of having read, in the cloud of witnesses, of such men formerly having been converted by the imprisoned saints. So I set myself, with all my heart, to bring about this man's repentance and reformation. Fatidel are ye yulin and praying that gate for man, said he, coming angrily in. I thought the days of praying prisoners had been o'er. Ye hath roweth in them ain'ts and they were the poorest and the blackest bargains that ever poor jailer saw. Gee up your crooning, or I'll pit you to an inn by place, where ye shall get plenty o' it. Friend, said I, I am making my appeal at the bar, where all human actions are seen and judged, and where you shall not be forgot, sinful as you are. Go in peace and let me be. Hey ye nay buddy near hand aim, to make your appeal to man, said he. Because, and ye hey nay, I dread you and me, may be unco weel acquainted by and by. I then opened up the mysteries of religion to him in a clear and perspicuous manner, but particularly the great doctrine of the election of grace. And then I added, Now, friend, you must tell me if you pertain to this chosen number. It is in every man's power to ascertain this, and it is every man's duty to do it. And fat the better why ye be for the kinning of this man, said he. Because if you are one of my brethren, I will take you into sweet communion and fellowship, returned I. But if you belong to the unregenerated, I have a commission to slay you. The dale you hay, Kellant, said he, gaping and laughing. And pray now, fa was it, that gay you sicon a braw commission. My commission is sealed by the signet above, said I and that I will let you and all sinners know I am dedicated to it by the most solemn vows and engagements. I am the sword of the Lord, and famine and pestilence are my sisters. Woe then to the wicked of this land, for they must fall down dead together, that the church may be purified. Oh, fool, fool! I see how it is, said he. Yours is a very broad commission, but you will have the small opportunity of carrying it through here. Take my advising, and write a bit of a letter to your friends, and I will send it, for this is no place for such a great man. If you cannot steady your hand to write, as I see you have been at your great work, a word of a mouth may do. For I do assure you this is not the place at all of any in the world 
for your operations. The man apparently thought I was deranged in my intellect. He could not swallow such great truths at the first morsel. So I took his advice and sent a line to my reverend father, who was not long in coming, and great was the jailer's wonderment when he saw all the great Christian noblemen of the land sign my bond of freedom. My reverend father took this matter greatly to heart and bestirred himself in the good cause till the transgressors were ashamed to show their faces. My illustrious companion was not idle. I wondered that he came not to me in prison, nor at my release. But he was better employed in stirring up the just to the execution of God's decrees. And he succeeded so well that my brother and all his associates had nearly fallen victims to their wrath. But many were wounded, bruised and imprisoned, and much commotion prevailed in the city. For my part, I was greatly strengthened in my resolution by the anthemus of my reverend father, who privately, that is, in a family capacity, in his prayers, gave up my father and brother according to the flesh, to Satan, making it plain to all my senses of perception that they were being given up of God to be devoured by fiends of men at their will and pleasure, and that whosoever should slay them would do God good service. End of section 17section 18 the private memoirs and confessions of a sinner written by himself by james hogg this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the next morning my illustrious friend met me at an early hour and he was greatly overjoyed at hearing my sentiments now chime so much in unison with his own. I said, I longed for the day and the hour that I might look my brother in the face at Gilgal and visit on him the inequity of his father and himself. For that I was now strengthened and prepared for the deed. I have been watching the steps and movements of the profligate one, said he, and lo, I will take you straight to his presence. Let your heart be as the heart of the lion, and your arms strong as the shekels of brass, and swift to avenge as the bolt that descendeth from heaven. For the blood of the just and the good hath long flowed in Scotland. But already is the day of their avengement begun. The hero is at length arisen who shall send all such as bear enmity to the true church, or trust in works of their own. To Tophet! Thus encouraged, I followed my friend, who led me directly to the same court in which I had chastised the miscreant on the foregoing day. And behold, there was the same group again assembled. They eyed me with terror in their looks as I walked among them and eyed them with looks of disappropriation and rebuke. And I saw that the very eye of a chosen one lifted on these children of Bilal was sufficient to dismay and put them to flight. I walked aside to my friend, who stood at a distance looking on, and he said to me, What thinkest thou now? And I answered in the words of the venial prophet, Lo now, if I had a sword into mine hand, I would even kill him. Wherefore lackest thou it? said he. Dost thou not see that they tremble at thy presence? knowing that the avenger of blood is among them. My heart 
was lifted up on hearing this. And again I strode into the midst of them, and eyeing them with threatening looks. They were so much confounded that they abandoned their sinful pastime and fled every one to his house. This was a palpable victory gained over the wicked, and I thereby knew that the hand of the Lord was with me. My companion also exulted and said, Did not I tell thee? Behold, thou dost not know one half of thy might, or of the great things thou art destined to do. Come with me, and I will show thee more than this. For these young men cannot subsist without the exercises of sin. I listened to their counsels, and I know where they will meet again. Accordingly, he led me a little farther to the south, and we walked aside till by degrees we saw some people begin to assemble. And in a short time we perceived the same group stripping off their clothes to make them more expert in the practice of madness and folly. Their game was begun before we approached, and so also were the oaths and cursing. I put my hands in my pockets and walked with dignity and energy into the midst of them. It was enough. Terror! and astonishment seized them. A few of them cried out against me, but their voices were soon hushed amid the murmurs of fear. One of them, in the name of the rest, then came and besought of me to grant them liberty to amuse themselves, but I refused peremptorily, dared the whole multitude so much as to touch me with one of their fingers and dismiss them in the name of the Lord. Again, they all fled and dispersed at my eye, and I went home in triumph, escorted by my friend and some well-meaning young Christians, who, however, had not learned to deport themselves with soberness and humility. But my ascendancy over my enemies was great indeed. For wherever I appeared I was hailed with approbation, and wherever my guilty brother made his appearance, he was hooted and held in derision, till he was forced to hide his disgraceful head and appear no more in public. Immediately after this I was seized with a strange distemper, which neither my friends nor physicians could comprehend and it confined me to my chamber for many days. But I knew myself that I was bewitched, and suspected my father's reputed concubine of the deed. I told my fears to my reverend protector, who hesitated concerning them, but I knew by his words and looks that he was conscious I was right. I generally conceived myself to be two people, when I lay in bed, I deemed there were two of us in it. When I sat up, I always beheld another person, and always in the same position from the place where I sat or stood, which was about three paces off me towards my left side. It mattered not how many or how few were present. This, my second self, was sure to be present in his place. And this occasioned a confusion in all my words and ideas that utterly astounded my friends, who all declared that, instead of being deranged in my intellect, they had never heard my conversation manifest so much energy or sublimity of conception. But for all that, over the singular delusion that I was two persons my reasoning faculties had no power. The most perverse part of it was that I rarely conceived myself to be any of the two persons. I thought, for the most part, that my companion was one of them, and my brother the other, and I found that, to be obliged to speak and answer in the character of another man, 
was a most awkward business at the long run. Who can doubt from this statement that I was bewitched and that my relatives were at the ground of it? The constant and unnatural persuasion that I was my brother proved it to my own satisfaction, and must, I think, do so to every unprejudiced person. This victory of the wicked one over me kept me confined in my chamber at Mr. Miller's house for nearly a month, until the prayers of the faithful prevailed, and I was restored. I knew it was a chastisement for my pride, because my heart was lifted up at my superiority over the enemies of the church. Nevertheless, I determined to make short work with the aggressor, that the righteous might not be subjected to the effect of his diabolical arts again. I say I was confined a month. I beg he that readeth to take note of this that he may estimate how much the word, or even the oath, of a wicked man is to depend on. For a month I saw no one but such as came into my room, and for all that it will be seen that there were plenty of the same set to attest upon oath that I saw my brother every day during this period, that I persecuted him with my presence day and night, while all the time I never saw his face save in a delusive dream. I cannot comprehend what maneuvers my illustrious friend was playing off with them about this time, for he, having the art of personating whom he chose, had peradventure deceived them, else many of them had never all attested the same thing. I never saw any man so steady in his friendships and attentions as he, but as he made a rule of never calling at private houses, for fear of some discovery being made of his person, so I never saw him while my malady lasted. But as soon as I grew better, I knew I had nothing ado but to attend at some of our places of meeting to see him again. He was punctual, as usual, and I had not to wait. My reception was precisely as I apprehended. There was no flaring, no flummery, nor bombastical pretensions, but a dignified return to my obeisance, and an immediate recurrence, in converse, to the important duties incumbent on us, in our stations as reformers and purifiers of the Church. I have marked out a number of most dangerous characters in this city, said he, all of whom must be cut off from cumbering the true vineyard before we leave this land. And, if you bestir not yourself in the work to which you are called, I must raise up others who shall have the honor of it. I am, most illustrious prince, wholly at your service, said I. Show but what ought to be done, and here is the heart to dare and the hand to execute. You pointed out my relations, according to the flesh, as brands fitted to be thrown into the burning. I approve peremptorily of the award. Nay, I thirst to accomplish it, for I myself have suffered severely from their diabolical arts. When once that trial of my devotion to the faith is accomplished, then be your future operations disclosed. You are free of your words and promises, said he. So will I be of my deeds in the service of my master, and that shalt thou see, said I. I lack not the spirit nor the will, but I lack experience woefully and because of that shortcoming, must bow to your suggestions. Meet me here tomorrow bedtimes, said he, and perhaps you may hear of some opportunity of displaying your zeal in the cause of righteousness. 
I met him as he desired me, and he addressed me with a hurried and joyful expression, telling me that my brother was astir, and that a few minutes ago he had seen him pass on his way to the mountain. The hill is wrapped in a cloud, added he, and never was there such an opportunity of executing divine justice on a guilty sinner. You may trace him in the dew, and shall infallibly find him on the top of some precipice, for it is only in secret that he dares show his debased head to the sun. I have no arms, else assuredly I would pursue him and discomfit him, said I. Here is a small dagger, said he. I have nothing of weapon kind about me save that, but it is a potent one, and should you require it, there is nothing more ready or sure. Will you not accompany me? said I. Sure you will. I will be with you or near you, said he. Go you on before. I hurried away as he directed me and imprudently asked some of Queensberry's guards if such and such a young man passed by them going out from the city. I was answered in the affirmative, and till then had doubted of my friend's intelligence. It was so inconsistent with a profligate's life to be so early astir. When I got the certain intelligence that my brother was before me, I fell a-running scarcely knowing what I did, and looking several times behind me, I perceived nothing of my zealous and arbitrary friend. The consequence of this was that, by the time I reached St. Anthony's Well, my resolution began to give way. It was not my courage, for now that I had once shed blood in the cause of the true faith, I was exceedingly bold and ardent. But whenever I was left to myself, I was subject to sinful doubtings. These always hankered on one point. I doubted if the elect were infallible, and if the scripture promises to them were binding in all situations and relations, I confess this and that it was a sinful and shameful weakness in me. But my nature was subject to it, and I could not eschew it. I never doubted that I was one of the elect myself. For besides the strong inward and spiritual conviction that I possessed, I had my kind father's assurance, and these had been revealed to him in that way and measure that they could not be doubted. In this desponding state, I sat myself down on a stone and bethought me of the rashness of my undertaking. I tried to ascertain, to my own satisfaction, whether or not I really had been commissioned of God to perpetrate these crimes in His behalf. For in the eyes and by the laws of men, they were great and crying transgressions. While I sat pondering on these things, I was involved in a veil of white misty vapor, and looking up to heaven, I was just about to ask direction from above, when I heard as it were a still small voice close by me, which uttered some words of derision and chiding. I looked intensely in the direction whence it seemed to come, and perceived a lady robed in white, who hastened towards me. She regarded me with a severity of look and gesture that appalled me so much I could not address her. But she waited not for that, but coming close to my side, said, without stopping, Preposterous wretch! How dare you lift your eyes to heaven with such purposes in your heart? Escape homewards and save your soul, or farewell forever. These were all the words that she uttered, as far as I could ever recollect. 
but my spirits were kept in such a tumult that morning that something might have escaped me. I followed her eagerly with my eyes, but in a moment she glided over the rocks above the holy well and vanished. I persuaded myself that I had seen a vision and that the radiant being that had addressed me was one of the good angels or guardian spirits commissioned by the Almighty to watch over the steps of the just. My first impulse was to follow her advice and make my escape home, for I thought to myself, How is this interested and mysterious foreigner a proper judge of the actions of a free Christian? The thought was hardly framed, nor had I moved in a retrograde direction six steps when I saw my illustrious friend and great advisor descending the ridge towards me with hasty and impassioned strides. My heart fainted within me, and when he came up and addressed me, I looked as one caught in a trespass. What hath detained thee, thou desponding trifler? said he. Verily now shall the golden opportunity be lost, which may never be recalled. I have traced the reprobate to his sanctuary in the cloud, and lo, he is perched on the pinnacle of a precipice an hundred fathoms high. One catch with thy foot, or toss with thy finger, shall throw him from the sight into the foldings of the cloud, and he shall be no more seen till found at the bottom of the cliff, dashed to pieces. Make haste, therefore, thou loiterer, if thou wouldest ever prosper and rise to eminence in the work of the Lord and Master. I go no farther in this work, said I, for I have seen a vision that has reprimanded the deed. A vision, said he. Was it that wench who descended from the hill? The being that spake to me and warned me of my danger was indeed in the form of a lady, said I. She also approached me and said a few words, returned he, and I thought there was something mysterious in her manner. Pray, what did she say? For the words of such a singular message, and from such a messenger, ought to be attended to. If I understood her all right, she was chiding us for our misbelief and preposterous delay. I recited her words but he answered that I had been in a state of sinful doubting at the time, and it was to these doubtings she had adverted. In short, this wonderful and clear-sighted stranger soon banished all my doubts and despondency, making me utterly ashamed of them, and again I set out with him in the pursuit of my brother. He showed me the traces of his footsteps in the dew, and pointed out the spot where I should find him. You have nothing more to do than go softly down behind him, said he, which you can do to within an ell of him without being seen. Then rush upon him and throw him from his seat, where there is neither footing nor hold. I will go, meanwhile, and amuse his sight by some exhibition in the contrary direction, and he shall neither know nor perceive who had done him this kind office. For exclusive or more weighty concerns, be assured of this that, the sooner he falls, the fewer crimes will he have to answer for, and his estate in the other world will be proportionately more tolerable than if he spent a long, unregenerated life steeped in inequity to the loathing of the soul. Nothing could be more plain or more pertinent, said I. Therefore I fly to perform that which is both a duty towards God and towards man. You shall yet rise to great honor and preferment, said he. I value it not, provided I do honor and justice to the cause of my master here, said I. You shall be lord of your father's riches and demisness, added he. 
I disclaim and deride every selfish motive thereto relating, said I, further than as it enables me to do good. Aye, but that is a great and heavenly consideration, that longing for ability to do good, said he. And as he said so, I could not help remarking a certain derisive exaltation of expression which I could not comprehend. And indeed, I have noted this very often in my illustrious friend, and sometimes mentioned it civilly to him, but he has never failed to disclaim it. On this occasion I said nothing, but concealing his ponaird in my clothes, I hastened up the mountain, determined to execute my purpose before any misgivings should again visit me. And I never had more ado than in keeping firm my resolution. I could not help my thoughts, and there are certain trains and classes of thoughts that have great power in enervating the mind. I thought of the awful thing of plunging a fellow creature from the top of a cliff into the dark and misty void below, of his being dashed to pieces on the protruding rocks, and of hearing his shrieks as he descended the cloud, and beheld the shagged points on which he was to alight. Then I thought of plunging a soul so abruptly into hell, or, at the best, sending it to hover on the confines of that burning abyss, of its appearance at the bar of the Almighty to receive its sentence. And then I thought, will there not be a sentence pronounced against me there, by a jury of the just made perfect, and written down in the registers of heaven? End of section 18 Section 19 The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Sinner Written by himself by James Hogg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org These thoughts, I say, came upon me unmasked, and instead of being able to dispel them, they mustered upon the summit of my imagination in thicker and stronger array. And there was another that impressed me in a very particular manner, though I have reason to believe not so strongly as those above written. It was this. What if I should fail in my first effort? Will the consequence not be that I am tumbled from the top of the rock myself? And then all the feelings anticipated, with regard to both body and soul, must happen to me. This was a spine-breaking reflection, and yet, though the probability was rather on that side, my zeal in the cause of godliness was such that it carried me on, maugre all danger and dismay. I soon came close upon my brother, sitting on the dizzy pinnacle, with his eyes fixed steadfastly in the direction opposite to me. I descended the little green ravine behind him with my feet foremost, and every now and then raised my head and watched his motions. His posture continued the same, until at last I came so near him I could have heard him breathe if his face had been towards me. I laid my cap aside and made me ready to spring upon him and push him over. I could not for my life accomplish it. I do not think it was that I durst not. I have always felt my courage equal to anything in a good cause. 
but I had not the heart or something that I ought to have had. In short, it was not done in time, as it easily might have been. These thoughts are hard enemies wherewith to combat. And I was so grieved that I could not effect my righteous purpose that I laid me down on my face and shed tears. Then again, I thought of what my great enlightened friend and patron would say to me, and again my resolution rose, indignant and indissoluble save by blood. I rose on my right knee and left foot, and had just begun to advance the ladder forward. The next step, my great purpose had been accomplished, and the culprit had suffered the punishment due to his crimes. But what moved him I knew not. In the critical moment he sprung to his feet, and dashing himself furiously against me, he overthrew me at the eminent peril of my life. I disencumbered myself by main force and fled, but he overhied me, knocked me down, and threatened, with dreadful oaths, to throw me from the cliff. After I was a little recovered from the stunning blow, I aroused myself to the combat, and though I do not recollect the circumstances of that deadly scuffle very minutely, I know that I vanquished him so far as to force him to ask my pardon and crave a reconciliation. I spurned at both and left him to the chastisements of his own wicked and corrupt heart. My friend met me again on the hill and derided me in a haughty and stern manner for my imbecility and want of decision. I told him, how nearly I had affected my purpose, and excused myself as well as I was able. On this, seeing me bleeding, he advised me to swear the peace against my brother, and have him punished in the meantime, he being the first aggressor. I promised compliance and we parted, for I was somewhat ashamed of my failure and was glad to be quit for the present of one of whom I stood so much in awe. When my reverend father beheld me bleeding a second time by the hand of a brother, he was moved to the highest point of displeasure, and relying on his high interest in the justice of his cause, he brought the matter at once before the courts. My brother and I were first examined face to face. His declaration was a mere romance. Mine was not the truth, but as it was by the advice of my reverend father and that of my illustrious friend, both of whom I knew to be sincere Christians and true believers, that I gave it. I conceived myself completely justified on that score. I said I had gone up into the mountain early on the morning to pray, and had withdrawn myself for entire privacy into a little sequestered dell, had laid aside my cap, and was in the act of kneeling when I was rudely attacked by my brother, knocked over and nearly slain. They asked my brother if this was true. He acknowledged that it was, that I was bareheaded and in the act of kneeling when he ran foul of me without any intent of doing so. But the judge took him to task on the improbability of this and put the profligate sore out of countenance. The rest of his tale told still worse, insomuch that he was laughed at by all present. For the judge remarked to him that, granting it was true that he had first run against me on an open mountain and overthrown me by accident, how was it that, 
after I had extricated myself and fled, that he had pursued, overtaken, and knocked me down a second time. Would he pretend that all that was likewise by chance? The culprit had nothing to say for himself on this head, and I shall never forget my exaltation and that of my reverend father when the sentence of the judge was delivered. It was that my wicked brother should be thrown into prison and tried on a criminal charge of assault and battery, with the intent of committing murder. This was a just and righteous judge, and saw things in their proper bearings, that is, he could discern between a righteous and a wicked man. And then there could be no doubt as to which of the two were acting right and which wrong. Had I not been sensible that a justified person could do nothing wrong, I should not have been at my ease concerning the statement I had been induced to give on this occasion. I could easily perceive that, by rooting out the weeds from the garden of the church, I heightened the growth of righteousness. But, as to the tardy way of giving false evidence on matters of such doubtful issue, I confess I saw no great propriety in it from the beginning. But I now only moved by the will and mandate of my illustrious friend. I had no peace or comfort when out of his sight, nor have I ever been able to boast of much in his presence. So true is it that a Christian's life is one of suffering. My time was now much occupied, along with my reverend preceptor, in making ready for the approaching trial as the prosecutors. Our counsel assured us of a complete victory, and that banishment would be the mildest award of the law on the offender. Mark how different was the result! From the shifts and ambiguities of a wicked bench, who had a fellow feeling of inequity with the defenders. My suit was lost, the graceless libertine was absolved, and I was incarcerated, and bound over to keep the peace with heavy penalties before I was set at liberty. I was exceedingly disgusted at this issue, and blamed the counsel of my friend to his face. He expressed great grief, and expatiated on the wickedness of our justitories, adding, I see I cannot depend on you for quick and summary measures, but for your sake I shall be revenged on that wicked judge, and that you shall see in a few days. The Lord Justice Clerk died that same week, but he died in his own house and his own bed, and by what means my friend effected it I do not know. He would not tell me a single word of the matter. But the judge's sudden death made a great noise, and I made so many curious inquiries regarding the particulars of it that some suspicions were like to attach to our family of some unfair means used. For my part, I know nothing, and rather think he died by the visitation of heaven and that my friend had foreseen it by symptoms and soothed me by promises of complete revenge. It was some days before he mentioned my brother's meditated death to me again. And certainly he then found me exasperated against him personally to the highest degree. But I told him that I could not now think any more of it owing to the late judgment of the court, by which, if my brother were missing or found dead, I would not only forfeit my life, but my friends would be ruined by the penalties. 
I suppose you know and believe in the perfect safety of your soul, said he, and that that is a matter settled from the beginning of time and now sealed and ratified both in heaven and earth. I believe in it thoroughly and perfectly, said I, and whenever I entertain doubts of it, I am sensible of sin and weakness. Very well, so then am I, said he. I think I can now divine, with all manner of certainty, what will be the high and merited guerdon of your immortal part. Hear me then further. I give you my solemn assurance and bond of blood that no human hand shall ever henceforth be able to injure your life or shed one drop of your precious blood. But it is on the condition that you walk always by my directions. I will do so with cheerfulness, said I, for without your enlightened counsel, I feel that I can do nothing. But as to your power of protecting my life, you must excuse me for doubting of it. Nay, were we in your proper dominions, you could not ensure that. In whatever dominion or land I am, my power accompanies me, said he. And it is only against human might and human weapon that I ensure your life. On that will I keep an eye, and on that you may depend. I have never broken word or promise with you. Do you credit me? Yes, I do, said I, for I see you are in earnest. I believe, though I do not comprehend you. Then why do you not at once challenge your brother to the field of honor? Seeing you now act without danger, cannot you also act without fear? It is not fear, returned I. Believe me, I hardly know what fear is. It is a doubt that, on all these emergencies, constantly haunts my mind that, in performing such and such actions, I may fall from my upright state. This makes fratricide a fearful task. This is imbecility itself, said he. We have settled and agreed on that point an hundred times. I would therefore advise that you challenge your brother to single combat. I shall ensure your safety, and he cannot refuse giving you satisfaction. Uh, but then the penalties, said I. We will try to evade these, said he. And supposing you should be caught, if once you are Laird of Dal Castle and Belgrenin, what are the penalties to you? Might we not rather pop him off in private and quietness? As we did the diastical divine, said I. The deed would be alike meritorious either way, said he. But may we not wait for years before we find an opportunity? My advice is to challenge him, as privately as you will, and there, cut him off. So be it then, said I. When the moon is at the full, I will send for him forth to speak with one. And there will I smite him and slay him, and he shall trouble the righteous no more. Then this is the very night, said he. The moon is nigh to the full, and this night your brother and his sinful mates hold carousel. For there is an intended journey tomorrow. The exalting profligate leaves town, where we must remain till the time of my departure hence. And then is he safe, and must live to dishonor God, and not only destroy his own soul, but those of many others. Alack, and woe is me! The sins that he and his friends will commit this very night will cry to heaven against us for our shameful delay. 
When shall our great work of cleansing the sanctuary be finished, if we proceed at this puny rate? I see the deed must be done then, said I. And since it is so, it shall be done. I will arm myself forthwith, and from the midst of his wine and debauchery, you shall call him forth to me. And there will I smite him with the edge of the sword, that our great work be not retarded. If thy execution were equal to thy intent, how great a man you soon might be, said he. We shall make the attempt once more. And if it fail again, why, I must use other means to bring about my high purposes relating to mankind. Home and make ready. I will go and procure what information I can regarding their motions, and will meet you in disguise twenty minutes hence, at the first turn of Huey's Lane beyond the lock. I have nothing to make ready, said I, for I do not choose to go home. Bring me a sword, and we may consecrate it with prayer and vows. And if I use it not to the bringing down of the wicked and profane, then may the Lord do so to me, and more also. We parted, and there was I left again to the municipality of my own thoughts for the space of twenty minutes. A thing my friend never failed in subjecting me to. And these were worse to contend with than hosts of sinful men. I prayed inwardly that these deeds of mine might never be brought to the knowledge of men who were incapable of appreciating the high motives that led to them. And then I sung part of the tenth psalm, likewise in spirit. But for all these efforts, my sinful doubts returned, so that when my illustrious friend joined me, and proffered me the choice of two gilded rapiers. I declined accepting any of them, and began, in a very bold and energetic manner, to express my doubts regarding the justification of all the deeds of perfect men. He chided me severely, and branded me with cowardice, a thing that my nature never was subject to. And then he branded me with falsehood and breach of the most solemn engagements, both to God and man. I was compelled to take the rapier much against my inclination. But for all the arguments, threats, and promises that he could use, I would not consent to send a challenge to my brother by his mouth. There was one argument only that he made use of, which had some weight with me, but yet it would not preponderate. He told me my brother was gone to a notorious and scandalous habitation of women, and that, if I'd left him to himself for ever so short a space longer, it might embitter his state through ages to come. This was a trying concern to me, but I resisted it, and reverted to my doubts. On this, he said that he had meant to do me honor, but since I put it out of his power, he would do the deed, and take the responsibility on himself. I have, with sore travail, procured a guardship of your life, added he. For my own I have not, but, be that as it will, I shall not be baffled in my attempts to benefit my friends without a trial. You will at all events accompany me and see that I get justice. Certus I will do thus much, said I, and woe be to him if his arm prevail against my friend and patron. His lip curled with a smile of contempt, which I could hardly brook. And I began to be afraid that the eminence to which I had been destined by him was already fading from my view. And I thought, 
what I should then do to ingratiate myself again with him. For without his continence, I had no life. I will be a man in act, thought I, but in sentiment I will not yield. And for this, he must surely admire me the more. End of section 19